Chapter 21 The Homespun Cloth Saturday, April 23rd The boy rode forward, way up in the air. He had the great Ostergutland plain under him, and sat and counted the many white churches which towered above the small leafy groves around them. It wasn't long before he counted fifty. After that he became confused and couldn't keep track of the counting. Nearly all the farms were built up with large, whitewashed, two-storey houses, which looked so imposing that the boy couldn't help admiring them. "'There can't be any peasants in this land,' he said to himself, "'since I do not see any peasant farms.' Immediately all the wild geese shrieked, "'Here the peasants live like gentlemen! Here the peasants live like gentlemen!' On the plains the ice and snow had disappeared, and the spring work had begun. "'What kind of long crabs are those that creep over the fields?' asked the boy after a bit. "'Plows and oxen! Plows and oxen!' answered the wild geese. The oxen moved so slowly down on the fields that one could scarcely perceive they were in motion, and the geese shouted to them, "'You won't get there before next year! You won't get there before next year!' But the oxen were equal to the occasion. They raised their muzzles in the air and bellowed, "'We do more good in an hour than such as you do in a whole lifetime.' In a few places the ploughs were drawn by horses. They went along with much more eagerness and haste than the oxen, but the geese couldn't help from teasing these either. "'Aren't you ashamed to be doing ox duty?' cried the wild geese. Mm, "'Aren't you ashamed yourselves to be mm, doing lazy man's duty?' The horses neighed back at them. But while horses and oxen were at work in the fields, the stable ram walked about in the barnyard. He was newly clipped and touchy, knocked over the small boys, chased the shepherd dog into his kennel, and then strutted about as though he alone were lord of the whole place. "'Rammy, rammy, what have you done with your wool?' asked the wild geese who rode by up in the air. "'That I have sent to drag's woolen mills in nor coping replied the ram with a long, drawn-out bleat. "'Rammy, rammy, what have you done with your horns?' asked the geese. But any horns the rammy had never possessed to his sorrow, and one couldn't offer him a greater insult than to ask after them. He ran around a long time and butted at the air. So furious was he. On the country road came a man who drove a flock of skein pigs that were not more than a few weeks old and were going to be sold up-country. They trotted along bravely, as little as they were, and kept close together, as if they sought protection. Nuff, 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 nuff. We come way too soon from father and mother. Nuff, nuff, nuff. How will it go with us, poor children? said the pigs. The wild geese didn't have the heart to tease such poor little creatures. It will be better for you than you can ever believe, they cried as they flew past them. The wild geese were never so merry as when they flew over a flat country. Then they did not hurry themselves, but flew from farm to farm and joked with the tame animals. As the boy rode over the plain, he happened to think of a legend which he had heard a long time ago. He didn't remember it exactly, but it was something about a petticoat, half of which was made of gold-woven velvet and half of grey homespun cloth. But the one who owned the petticoat adorned the homespun cloth with such a lot of pearls and precious stones that it looked richer and more gorgeous than the gold cloth. He remembered this about the homespun cloth as he looked down on Ostergotland, because it was made up of a large plain, which lay wedged in between two mountainous forest tracts, one to the north, the other to the south. The two forest heights lay there, a lovely blue, and shimmered in the morning light as if they were decked with golden veils, and the plain, which simply spread out, one winter naked field after another, was in and of itself prettier to look upon than grey homespun. But the people must have been contented on the plain, because it was generous and kind, and they had tried to decorate it in the best way possible. High up, where the boy rode by, he thought that cities and farms, churches and factories, castles and railway stations were scattered over it like large and small trinkets. It shone on the roofs, and the window panes glittered like jewels. Yellow country roads, shining railway tracks, and blue canals ran along between the districts like embroidered loops. Lynn Coping lay around its cathedral like a pearl setting around a precious stone, and the gardens in the country were like little brooches and buttons. There was not much regulation in the pattern, but it was a display of grandeur which one could never tire of looking at. 
The geese had left Oberg district and travelled toward the east along Gotha Canal. This was also getting itself ready for the summer. Workmen laid canal banks and tarred the huge lock gates. They were working everywhere to receive spring fittingly, even in the cities. There, masons and painters stood on scaffoldings and made fine the exteriors of the houses, while maids were cleaning the windows. Down at the harbour, sailboats and steamers were being washed and dressed up. At Norcoping, the wild geese left the plain and flew up toward Colmarden. For a time, they had followed an old hilly country road which wound around cliffs and ran forward under wild mountain walls. When the boy suddenly let out a shriek, he had been sitting and swinging his foot back and forth, and one of his wooden shoes had slipped off. Goosey gander, goosey gander, I've dropped my shoe! cried the boy. The goosey gander turned about and sank toward the ground. Then the boy saw that two children. Who were walking along the road had picked up his shoe.、Uh, goosey, goosey gander, go, goosey gander! Screamed the boy excitedly. Fly up it again! It's too late. I cannot get my shoe back again. Down on the road stood Oxa, the goose girl, and her brother, little Mats, looking at a tiny wooden shoe that had fallen from the skies. Oxa, the goose girl, stood silent a long while and pondered over the find. At last, she said slowly and thoughtfully, "Do you remember, little Mats?" That when we went past Ovid Cloister, we heard that the folk in a farmyard had seen an elf, who was dressed in leather breeches and had wooden shoes on his feet, like any other working man. And do you recollect when we came to Vidskol, a girl told us that she had seen Goanis with wooden shoes,、uh, who flew away on the back of a goose. And when we ourselves came home to our cabin, little Mats, we saw a goblin who was dressed in the same way, and who also straddled the back of a goose. And flew away. Maybe it was the same one who rode along on his goose up here in the air and dropped his wooden shoe. Yes, it must have been," said Little Max. They turned the wooden shoe about and examined it carefully, for it isn't every day that one happens across a goanisser's wooden shoe on the highway. Wait, wait, Little Max," said Osa the goose girl. "There's something written on one side of it. Why? So there is." But they are such tiny letters.、Uh, let me see. It says it, it says Nils Holgersen from West Vemminghog. That's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard," said Little Mats. Chapter Twenty Two: The Story of Car and Grayskin, Part One: Car. About twelve years before Nils Holgersen started on his travels with the wild geese, there was a manufacturer at Kolmarden who wanted to be rid of one of his dogs. He sent for his gamekeeper and said to him that it was impossible to keep the dog because he could not be broken of the habit of chasing all the sheep and fowl he set his eyes on, and he asked the man to take the dog into the forest and shoot him. The gamekeeper slipped the leash on the dog to lead him to a spot in the forest where all the superannuated dogs from the manor were shot and buried. He was not a cruel man, but he was very glad to shoot the dog, for he knew that sheep and chickens were not the only creatures he hunted. Times without number, he had gone into the forest and helped himself to a hare or a grouse chick. The dog was a little black and tan setter. His name was Car, and he was so wise he understood all that was said. As the gamekeeper was leading him through the thickets, Car knew only too well what was in store for him. But this no one could have guessed by his behaviour, for he neither hung his head nor dragged his tail, but seemed as unconcerned as ever. It was because they were in the forest that the dog was so careful not to appear the least bit anxious. There were great stretches of woodland on every side of the factory, and this forest was famed both among animals and human beings because, for many, many years, the owners had been so careful of it that they had begrudged themselves even the trees needed for firewood. Nor had they had the heart to thin or train them. The trees had been allowed to grow as they pleased. Naturally, a forest thus protected was a beloved refuge for wild animals, which were to be found there in great numbers. Among themselves, they called it Liberty Forest, and regarded it as the best retreat in the whole country. As the dog was being led through the woods, he thought of what a bugaboo he had been to all the small animals and birds that lived there. Now, Car, 
Wouldn't they be happy in their lairs if they only knew what was awaiting you, he thought. But at the same time, he wagged his tail and barked cheerfully, so that no one should think that he was worried or depressed. What fun would there have been in living had I not hunted occasionally, he reasoned. Let him who will regret. It's not going to be car. But the instant the dog said this, a singular change came over him. He stretched his neck as though he had a mind to howl. He no longer trotted alongside the gamekeeper, but walked behind him. It was plain that he had begun to think of something unpleasant. It was early summer. The elk cows had just given birth to their young, and the night before, the dog had succeeded in parting from its mother an elk calf not more than five days old, and had driven it down into the marsh. There he had chased it back and forth over the knolls, not with the idea of capturing it, but merely for the sport of seeing how he could scare it. The elk cow knew that the marsh was bottomless so soon after the thaw, and that it could not as yet hold up so large an animal as herself, so she stood on the solid earth for the longest time, watching. But when Carr kept chasing the calf farther and farther away, she rushed out on the marsh, drove the dog off, and took the calf with her, and turned back toward firm land. Elk are more skilled than other animals in traversing dangerous, marshy ground, and it seemed as if she would reach solid land in safety. But when she was almost there, a knoll which she had stepped upon sank into the mire, and she went down with it. She tried to rise, but could not get a secure foothold, so she sank and sank. Carr stood and looked on, not daring to move. When he saw that the elk could not save herself. He ran away as fast as he could, for he had begun to think of the beating he would get if it were discovered that he had brought a mother elk to grief. He was so terrified that he dared not pause for breath until he reached home. It was this that the dog recalled, and it troubled him in a way very different from the recollection of all his other misdeeds. This was doubtless because he had not really meant to kill either the elf cow or her calf, but to deprive them of life without wishing to do so. But maybe they, they're they alive yet, thought the dog. They were not dead when I ran away. Perhaps they saved themselves. He was seized with an irresistible longing to know for a certainty, while yet there was time for him to find out. He noticed that the gamekeeper did not have a firm hold on the leash, so he made a sudden spring broke loose and dashed through the woods down to the marsh with such speed that he was out of sight before the gamekeeper had time to level his gun. There was nothing for the gamekeeper to do but to rush after him. When he got to the marsh, he found the dog standing upon a knoll, howling with all his might. The man thought he'd better find out the meaning of this, so he dropped his gun and crawled out over the marsh on hands and knees. He had not gone far when he saw an elk cow lying dead. In the quagmire. Close beside her lay a little calf. It was still alive, but so much exhausted that it could not move. Carr was standing beside the calf, and now bending down and licking it, now howling shrilly for help. The gamekeeper raised the calf and began to drag it toward land. When the dog understood that the calf would be saved, he was wild with joy. He jumped round and round the gamekeeper, licking his hands and barking with delight. The man carried the baby elk home and shut it up in a calf stall in the cowshed. Then he got help to drag the mother elk from the marsh. Only after this had been done did he remember that he was to shoot Carr. He called the dog to him and again took him into the forest. The gamekeeper walked straight on toward the dog's grave, but all the while he seemed to be thinking deeply. Suddenly he turned and walked toward the manor. Carr had been trotting along quietly, but when the gamekeeper turned and started for home, he became anxious. The man must have discovered that it was he that had caused the death of the elk, and now he was going back to the manor to be thrashed before he was shot. To be beaten was worse than all else. With that prospect, Carr could no longer keep up his spirits, but hung his head. When he came to the manor, he did not look up, but pretended that he knew no one there. The master was standing on the stairs, leading to the hall, when the gamekeeper came forward. "'Where on earth did that dog come from?' he exclaimed. "'Surely it can't be Carr. He must be dead this long time.' 
Then the man began to tell his master all about the mother elk, while Carr made himself as little as he could and crouched behind the gamekeeper's legs. Much to his surprise, the man had only praise for him. He said it was plain the dog knew that the elk were in distress and wished to save them. "'You may do as you like, but I can't shoot that dog,' declared the gamekeeper. Carr raised himself and pricked up his ears. He could hardly believe that he heard right. Although he did not want to show how anxious he had been, he couldn't help whining a little. Could it be possible that his life was to be spared simply because he had felt uneasy about the elk? The master thought that Carr had conducted himself well, but as he did not want the dog, he could not decide at once what should be done with him. If you will take charge of him and answer for his good behaviour in the future, he may as well live, he said finally. This the gamekeeper was only too glad to do, and that was how Carr came to move to the gamekeeper's lodge. Part 2. Grayskin's Flight From the day that Carr went to live with the gamekeeper, he abandoned entirely his forbidden chase in the forest. This was due not only to his having been thoroughly frightened, but also to the fact that he did not wish to make the gamekeeper angry at him. Ever since his new master saved his life, the dog loved him above everything else. He thought only of following him and watching over him, if he left the house, Carr would run ahead to make sure that the way was clear, and if he sat at home, Carr would lie before the door and keep a close watch on everyone who came and went. When all was quiet at the lodge, when no footsteps were heard on the road and the gamekeeper was working in his garden, Carr would amuse himself playing with the baby elk. At first, the dog had no desire to leave his master, even for a moment. Since he accompanied him everywhere, he went with him to the cowshed. When he gave the elk calf its milk, the dog would sit outside the stall and gaze at it. The gamekeeper called the calf Grayskin, because he thought it did not merit a prettier name, and Carr agreed with him on that point. Every time the dog looked at it, he thought that he had never seen anything so ugly and misshapen as the baby elk, with its long, shambly legs which hung down from the body like loose stilts. The head was large, old and wrinkled, and it always drooped to one side. The skin lay in tucks and folds, as if the animal had put on a coat that had not been made for him. Always doleful and discontented, curiously enough, he jumped up every time Carr appeared, as if glad to see him. The elk became less hopeful from day to day, did not grow any, and at last he could not even rise when he saw Carr. Then the dog jumped up into the crib to greet him, and thereupon a light kindled in the eyes of the poor creature, as if a cherished longing were fulfilled. After that, Carr visited the elk every day, and spent many hours with him, licking his coat, playing and racing with him, till he taught him a little of everything a forest animal should know. It was remarkable that from the time Carr began to visit the elk calf in his stall, the latter seemed more contented and began to grow. After he was fairly started, he grew so rapidly that in a couple of weeks the stall could no longer hold him, and he had to be moved into a grove. When he'd been in the grove two months, his legs were so long that he could step over the fence whenever he wished. And then the lord of the manor gave the gamekeeper permission to put up a higher fence and to allow him more space. Here the elk lived for several years and grew up into a strong and handsome animal. Carr kept him company as often as he could, but now it was no longer through pity, for a great friendship had sprung up between the two. The elk was always inclined to be melancholy, listless and indifferent, but Carr knew how to make him playful and happy. Grayskin had lived for five summers on the gamekeeper's place when his owner received a letter from a zoological garden abroad asking if the elk might be purchased. The master was pleased with the proposal. The gamekeeper was distressed, but had not the power to say no, so it was decided that the elk should be sold. Carr soon discovered what was in the air and ran over to the elk to have a chat with him. The dog was very much distressed at the thought of losing his friend, but the elk took the matter calmly and seemed neither glad nor sorry. 
Do you think of letting them send you away without offering you resistance? said Carr. What good would it do to resist? asked Grayskin. I should prefer to remain where I am, naturally, but I've been sold. I shall have to go, of course. Carr looked at Grayskin and measured him with his eyes. It was apparent that the elk was not yet full grown. He did not have the broad antlers, high hump, and long mane of the mature elk, but he certainly had strength enough to fight for his freedom. Or oh, oh, one can see that he's been in captivity all his life, thought Carr, but said nothing. Carr left and did not return to the grove till long past midnight. By that time he knew Grayskin would be awake and eating his breakfast. Of course, you're doing right, Grayskin, in letting them take you away, remarked Carr, who appeared now to be calm and satisfied. You will be a prisoner in a large pa park and, and will have no responsibilities. It seems a pity that you must leave here without having seen the forest. You know your ancestors have a saying that the elk are one with the forest, but you haven't even been in the forest. Grayskin glanced up from the clover, which he stood munching. Indeed, I should love to see the forest, but how am I going to get over the fence? he said, with his usual apathy. Oh, that is difficult for one who has such short legs, said Carr. The elk glanced slyly at the dog, who jumped the fence many times a day, little as he was. He walked over to the fence with one spring. He was on the other side, without knowing how it happened. Then Carr and Grayskin went into the forest. It was a beautiful moonlit night in late summer, but in among the trees it was dark, and the elk walked along slowly. "'Perhaps we'd better turn back,' said Carr. "'You who've never before tramped the wild forest might easily break your legs.' Grayskin moved more rapidly and with more courage. Carr conducted the elk to a part of the forest where the pines grew so thickly that no wind could penetrate them. "'It is here that your kind are in the habit of seeking shelter from cold and storm,' said Carr. "'Here they stand under the open skies all winter, but you will fare much better where you, you are going, for you will stand in a shed with a roof over your head like an ox.' Grayskin made no comment, but stood quietly and drank in the strong, piney air. "'Have you anything more to show me, or have I now seen the whole forest?' he asked. Then Carr went with him to a big marsh and showed him clods and quagmire. "'Over this marsh the elf take flight when they are in peril,' said Carr. "'I don't know how they manage it, but large and heavy as they are, they can walk here without sinking. Of course, you couldn't hold your, yourself up on such dangerous ground, but then there's no occasion for you to do so, for you will never be hounded by hunters.' Grayskin made no retort, but with a leap he was out on the marsh, and happy when he felt how the clods rocked under him. He dashed across the marsh and came back again to Carr without having stepped into a mud hole. "'Have we seen the whole forest now?' he asked. "'No, not yet,' said Carr. He next conducted the elk to the skirt of the forest, where fine oaks, lindens and aspens grew. "'Here your kind eat leaves and bark, which they consider the choicest of food. But you'll probably get better fare abroad.' Grayskin was astonished when he saw the enormous leaf-trees spreading like a great canopy above him. He ate both oak leaves and aspen bark. "'They taste delicious, bitter and good,' he remarked. "'Better than clover.' "'Then wasn't it well that you, you should taste them once?' said the dog. Thereupon he took the elk down to a little forest lake. The water was as smooth as a mirror, and reflected the shores, which were veiled in thin, light mists. When Grayskin saw the lake, he stood entranced. "'What's this, Carr?' he asked. It was the first time that he had seen a lake. "'It's a large body of water, a lake,' said Carr. "'Your people swim across it from shore to shore. One could hardly expect you to be familiar with this. But at least you should go in and take a swim.' Carr himself plunged into the water for a swim, Grayskin stayed back on the shore for some little time, but finally followed. He grew breathless with delight as the cool water stole soothingly around his body. He wanted it over his back too, so went farther out. Then he felt that the water could hold him up and began to swim. 
He swam all around Carr, ducking and snorting, perfectly at home in the water. When they were on shore again, the dog asked if they had not better go home now. "'It's a long time till morning,' observed Greyskin, "'so we can tramp around in the forest a little longer.' They went again into the pine wood. Presently they came to an open glade illuminated by the moonlight, where grass and flowers shimmered beneath the dew. Some large animals were grazing on this forest meadow, an elk bull, several elk cows, and a number of elk calves. When Greyskin caught sight of them, he stopped short. He hardly glanced at the cows or the young ones, but stared at the old bull, which had broad antlers with many taglets, a high hump, and a long-haired fur piece hanging down from his throat. "'What kind of an animal is that?' asked Greyskin in wonderment. "'He is called Antler Crown,' said Carr, "'and he is your kinsman. One of these days you too will have broad antlers like those, and just such a mane.' And if you were to remain in the forest, very likely you also would have a herd to lead. If he is my kinsman, I must go closer and have a look at him, said Greyskin. I never dreamed that an animal could be so stately. Greyskin walked over to the elk, but almost immediately he came back to Carr, who had remained at the edge of the clearing. You were not well received, were you? said Carr. I told him that this was the first time I'd run across any of my kinsmen and asked if I might walk with them on their meadows. But they drove me back, threatening me with their antlers. You did right to retreat, said Carr. A young elk bull with only a taglet crown must be careful about fighting with an old elk. Another would have disgraced his name in the whole forest by retreating without resistance. But such things needn't worry you, who are going to move to a foreign land." Carr had barely finished speaking when Greyskin turned and walked down to the meadow. The old elk came toward him, and instantly they began to fight. Their antlers met and clashed, and Greyskin was driven backward over the whole meadow. Apparently he did not know how to make use of his strength. But when he came to the edge of the forest, he planted his feet on the ground, pushed hard with his antlers, and began to force Antler Crown back. Greyskin fought quietly, while Antler Crown puffed and snorted. The old elk, in his turn, was now being forced backward over the meadow. Suddenly a loud crash was heard. A taglet in the old elk's antlers had snapped. He tore himself loose and dashed into the forest. Carr was still standing in the forest border when Grayskin came along. "'Now that you've seen what there is in the forest,' said Carr, "'will you come home with me?' "'Yes, it's about time,' observed the elk." Both were silent on the way home. Carr sighed several times, as if he was disappointed about something. But Greyskin stepped along, his head in the air, and seemed delighted over the adventure. He walked ahead, unhesitatingly, until they came to the enclosure. There he paused. He looked in at the narrow pen where he had lived up till now, saw the beaten ground, the stale fodder, the little trough where he had drunk water, and the dark shed in which he had slept. "'The elk are one with the forest!' he cried. Then he threw back his head so that his neck rested against his back and rushed wildly into the woods. Part 3. Helpless, the Water Snake In a pine thicket in the heart of Liberty Forest, every year, in the month of August, there appeared a few greyish-white moths of the kind, which are called nun moths. They were small and few in number, and scarcely anyone noticed them. When they had fluttered about in the depth of the forest a couple of nights, they laid a few thousand eggs on the branches of trees and shortly afterward dropped lifeless to the ground. When spring came, little prickly caterpillars crawled out from the eggs and began to eat the pine needles. They had good appetites, but they never seemed to do the trees any serious harm, because they were hotly pursued by birds. It was seldom that more than a few hundred caterpillars escaped the pursuers. The poor things that lived to be full-grown crawled up on the branches, spun white webs around themselves, and sat for a couple of weeks as motionless pupae. During this period, as a rule, more than half of them were abducted. If a hundred nun-moths came forth in August, winged and perfect, it was reckoned a good year for them. This sort of uncertain and obscure existence did the moths lead for many years in Liberty Forest. 
there were no insect folk in the whole country that were so scarce, and they would have remained quite harmless and powerless had they not, most unexpectedly, received a helper. This fact has some connection with Greyskin's flight from the gamekeeper's paddock. Greyskin roamed the forest that he might become more familiar with the place. Late in the afternoon, he happens to squeeze through some thickets behind a clearing where the soil was muddy and slimy, and in the centre of it was a murky pool. This open space was encircled by tall pines, almost bare from age and miasmic air. Grayskin was displeased with the place, and would have left it at once had he not caught sight of some bright green calla leaves which grew near the pool. As he bent his head toward the calla stalks, he happened to disturb a big black snake, which lay sleeping under them. Grayskin had heard Carr speak of the poisonous adders that were to be found in the forest, so when the snake raised its head, shot out its tongue and hissed at him, he thought he'd encountered an awfully dangerous reptile. He was terrified, and, raising his foot, he struck so hard with his hoof that he crushed the snake's head. Then away he ran in hot haste. As soon as Grayskin had gone, another snake, just as long and as black as the first, came up from the pool. It crawled over to the dead one and licked the poor, crushed in head. Can it be true that you are dead, old harmless? hissed the snake. We two have lived together for so many years. We two have been so happy with each other and have fed so well here in the swamp that we have lived to be older than all the other water snakes in the forest. This is the worst sorrow that could have befallen me. The snake was so broken-hearted that his long body writhed as if it had been wounded. Even the frogs, who lived in constant fear of him, was sorry for him. What a wicked creature he must be to murder a poor water snake that cannot defend itself, hissed the snake. He certainly deserves a severe punishment. As sure as my name is Helpless and I am the oldest water snake in the whole forest, I shall be avenged. I shall not rest till that elk lies as dead on the ground as my poor old snake wife. When the snake had made this vow, he curled up into a hoop and began to ponder. One can hardly imagine anything that would be more difficult for a poor water snake than to wreak vengeance upon a big, strong elk, and old helpless pondered day and night without finding any solution. One night, as he lay there with his vengeance thoughts, he heard a slight rustle over his head. He glanced up and saw a few light nun-moths playing in among the trees. He followed them with his eyes a long while, and then began to hiss loudly to himself, apparently pleased with the thought that had occurred to him. And then he fell asleep. The next morning the water-snake went over to see Crawley the adder, who lived in a stony and hilly part of Liberty Forest. He told him all about the death of the old water-snake, and begged that he who could deal such deadly thrusts would undertake the work of vengeance. But Crawley was not exactly disposed to go to war with an elk. "'If I were to attack an elk,' said the adder, "'he would instantly kill me. Old Harmless is dead and gone, and we can't bring her back to life. So why should I rush into danger on her account?' When the water-snake got this reply, he raised his head a whole foot from the ground and hissed furiously. Fish, fash, he said. It's a pity that you who have been blessed with such weapons of defence should be so cowardly when you don't dare use them. When the adder heard this, he too got angry. Crawl away, old helpless, he hissed. The poison is in my fangs, but I would rather spare one who is said to be my kinsman. But the water snake did not move from the spot, and for a long time the snakes lay there hissing abusive epithets at each other. When Crawley was so angry that he couldn't hiss but could only dart his tongue out, the water snake changed the subject and began to talk in a very different tone. "'I had still another errand, Crawley,' he said, lowering his voice to a mild whisper. "'But now I suppose you are so angry that you wouldn't care to help me?' 
If you don't ask anything foolish of me, I shall certainly be at your service. In the pine trees down by the swamp live a moth folk that fly around all night. I know all about them, remarked Crawley. What's up with them now? They are the smallest insect family in the forest, said Helpless, and the most harmless since the caterpillars content themselves with gnawing only pine needles. Yes, I know, said Crawley. I'm afraid those moths will soon be exterminated, sighed the water snake. There are so many who pick off the caterpillars in the spring. Now Crawley began to understand that the water snake wanted the caterpillars for his own purpose, and he answered pleasantly, "'Do you wish me to say to the owls that they are to leave those pine-tree worms in peace? Yes, it would be well if you who have some authority in the forest should do this,' said Helpless." "'I might also drop a good word for the pine-needle pickers among the thrushes,' volunteered the adder. "'I will gladly serve you when you do not demand anything unreasonable.' "'Now you have given me a good promise, Crawley,' said Helpless, "'and I'm glad that I came to you.'" Part 4 The Nun Moths One morning... Several years later, Carl lay asleep on the porch. It was in the early summer, the season of light nights, and it was as bright as day, although the sun was not yet up. Carl was awakened by someone calling his name. Is, is, is it you, Grayskin? he asked, for he was accustomed to the elk's nightly visits. Again he heard the call, then he recognised Grayskin's voice and hastened in the direction of the sound. Carr heard the elk's footfalls in the distance as he dashed into the thickest pine wood and straight through the brush, following no trodden path. Carr could not catch up with him, and he had great difficulty in even following the trail. Caw, came the cry, and the voice was certainly Grayskin's, although it had a ring now, which the dog had never heard before. I'm coming, I'm coming, the dog responded. Where are you? "'Caw, caw, don't you see how it falls and falls?' said Grayskin. Then Carr noticed that the pine needles kept dropping, and dropping from the trees like a steady fall of rain. "'Yes, I see how it falls,' he cried, and ran far into the forest in search of the elk. Grayskin kept running through the thickets, while Carr was about to lose the trail again. "'Caw, caw,' said Grayskin. "'Can't you send that peculiar odour in the forest?' Carr stopped and sniffed. He had not thought of it before, but now he remarked that the pine sent forth a much stronger odour than usual. Yes, I catch the scent, he said. He did not stop long enough to find out the cause of it, but hurried on after Grayskin. The elk ran ahead with such speed that the dog could not catch up with him. Car, car, he called. Can't you hear the crunching on the pines? Now his tone was so plaintive it would have melted a stone. Car paused to listen. He heard a faint but distinct tap, tap on the trees. It sounded like the ticking of a watch. Yes, I hear how it ticks, cried Car, and ran no further. He understood that the elk did not want him to follow, but to take notice of something that was happening in the forest. Carr was standing beneath the drooping branches of a great pine. He looked carefully at it. The needles moved. He went closer and saw a mass of greyish-white caterpillars creeping along the branches, gnawing off the needles. Every branch was covered with them. The crunch, crunch in the trees came from the working of their busy little jaws. Gnawed-off needles fell to the ground in a continuous shower, and from the poor pines there came such a strong odour that the dog suffered from it. "'What can be the meaning of this?' wondered Carr. "'It's too bad about the pretty trees. Soon they'll have no beauty left.' He walked from tree to tree, trying with his poor eyesight to see if all was well with them. "'There's a pine there they haven't touched,' he thought. Uh, but they had taken possession of it too. "'And here's a birch. No, this also. The gamekeeper will not be pleased with this,' observed Carr. He ran deeper into the thickets to learn how far the destruction had spread. 
Wherever he went, he heard the same ticking, scented the same odour, saw the same needle rain. There was no need of his pausing to investigate. He understood it all by these signs. The little caterpillars were everywhere. The whole forest was being ravaged by them. All of a sudden he came to a tract where there was no odour and where all was still. Here's the end of their domain, thought the dog as he paused and glanced about. But here it was even worse, for the caterpillars had already done their work and the trees were needleless. They were like the dead. The only thing that covered them was a network of ragged threads which the caterpillars had spun to use as roads and bridges. In there, among the dying trees, Grayskin stood waiting for Carr. He was not alone. With him were four old elk, the most respected in the forest. Carr knew them. They were Crooked Back, who was a small elk but had a larger hump than the others, Antler Crown, who was the most dignified of the elk, Rough Mane, with the thick coat, and an old, long-legged one who, up till the autumn before, when he got a bullet in his thigh, had been terribly hot-tempered and quarrelsome. "'What in the world is happening to the forest?' Carr asked when he came up to the elk. They stood with lowered heads, far protruding upper lips, and looked puzzled. "'No one can tell,' answered Grayskin. "'This insect family used to be the least hurtful of any in the forest, and never before have they done any damage. But these last few years they've been multiplying so fast that now it appears as if the entire forest would be destroyed.' "'Yes, it looks bad,' Carr agreed. "'But I see that the wisest animals in the forest have come together to hold a consultation. Perhaps you have already found some remedy.' When the dog said this, Crooked Back solemnly raised his heavy head, pricked up his long ears, and spoke. "'We have summoned you hither, Carr, that we may learn if the humans know of this desolation.' "'No,' said Carr. "'No human being ever comes this far into the forest. When it's not hunting time, they know nothing of this misfortune.' Then Antler Crown said, "We." who have lived long in the forest, do not think that we can fight this insect pest all by ourselves. After this there will be no peace in the forest, put in Roughmane. But we can't let the whole Liberty Forest go to rack and ruin, protested Big and Strong. We'll have to consult the humans. There's no alternative. Carr understood that the elk had difficulty in expressing what they wished to say, and he tried to help them. Perhaps you want me to let the people know the conditions here, he suggested. All the old elk nodded their heads. It's most unfortunate that we are obliged to ask help of human beings, but we have no choice. A moment later, Carr was on his way home. As he ran ahead, deeply distressed over all that he'd heard and seen, a big black water snake approached him. "'Well met in the forest,' hissed the water snake. "'Well met again,' snarled Carr, and rushed by without stopping. The snake turned and tried to catch up to him. "'Perhaps that creature also is worried about the forest,' thought Carr, and waited. Immediately the snake began to talk about the great disaster. "'There will be an end of peace and quiet in the forest when human beings are called hither,' said the snake. "'I'm afraid there will.' The dog agreed. But the old forest dwellers know what they're about, he added. I think I know a better plan, said the snake. If I can get the reward, I wish. Are you not the one whom everyone round here calls old helpless, said the dog, sneeringly. I'm an old inhabitant of the forest, said the snake, and I know how to get rid of such plagues. If you clear the forest of that pest... I feel sure you can have anything you ask for, said Carr. The snake did not respond to this until he had crawled under a tree stump, where he was well protected. And then he said, Tell Greyskin that if he will leave Liberty Forest forever, and go far north where no oak tree grows, I will send sickness and death to all the creeping things that gnaw the pines and spruces. "'What's that you say?' asked Carr, bristling up. "'What harm has Grayskin ever done you?' "'He has slain the one 
whom I loved best, the snake declared, and I want to be avenged. Before the snake had finished speaking, Carr made a dash for him, but the reptile lay safely hidden under the tree stump. Stay where you are, Carr concluded. We'll manage to drive out the caterpillars without your help. Part 5. The Big War of the Moths The following spring, as Carr was dashing through the forest one morning, he heard someone behind him calling, Carr! Carr! He turned and saw an old fox standing outside his lair. You must tell me if the humans are doing anything for the forest, said the fox. Yes, you may be sure they are, said Carr. They're working as hard as they can. They have killed off all my kinsfolk, and they'll be killing me next, protested the fox. But they shall be pardoned for that if they only shall save the forest. That year, Carr never ran into the woods without some animals asking if the humans could save the forest. It was not easy for the dog to answer. The people themselves were not certain that they could conquer the moths. But, considering how feared and hated old Colmarden had always been, it was remarkable that every day more than a hundred men went there to work. They cleared away the underbrush. They felled dead trees, lopped off branches from the live ones, so that the caterpillars could not easily crawl from tree to tree. They also dug wide trenches around the ravaged parts and put up lime-washed fences to keep them out of new territory. Then they painted rings of lime around the trunks of trees to prevent the caterpillars leaving those they'd already stripped. The idea was to force them to remain where they were until they starved to death. The people worked with the forest until far into the spring. They were hopeful and could hardly wait for the caterpillars to come out from their eggs, feeling certain that they had shut them in so effectually that most of them would die of starvation. But in the early summer, the caterpillars came out more numerous than ever. They were everywhere. They crawled on the country roads, on fences, on the walls of the cabins. They wandered outside the confines of Liberty Forest to other parts of Colmarden. They won't stop till all our forests are destroyed, sighed the people who were in great despair and could not enter the forest without weeping. Carr was so sick of the sight of all these creeping, gnawing things that he could hardly ever bear to step outside the door. But one day he felt that he must go and find out how Greyskin was getting on. He took the shortest cut to the elk's horns and hurried along, his nose close to the earth. When he came to the tree stump where he had met Helpless the year before, the snake was still there and called to him, "'Have you told Greyskin what I said to you when we last met?' asked the water snake. Carr only growled and tried to get at him. "'If you haven't told him, by all means do so,' insisted the snake. "'You must see that the humans know of no cure for this plague.' <laughs> "'Neither do you,' retorted the dog and ran on. Carr found Greyskin, but the elk was so low-spirited that he scarcely greeted the dog. He began at once to talk of the forest. "'I don't know what I wouldn't give if this misery were only at an end,' he said. "'Now I shall tell you that is said you could save the forest.' Then Carr delivered the water snake's message. "'If anyone but helpless had promised this, I should immediately go into exile,' declared the elk. "'But how can a poor water snake have the power to work such a miracle?' "'Of course, it's only a bluff,' said Carr. "'Water snakes always like to pretend they know more than other creatures.' When Carr was ready to go home, Greyskin accompanied him part of the way. Presently, Carr heard a thrush perched on a pine-top cry. "'There goes Greyskin, who has destroyed the forest! "'There goes Greyskin, who has destroyed the forest!' Carr thought that he'd not heard correctly, but the next moment a hare came darting across the path. When the hare saw them, he stopped, flapped his ears, and screamed. Here comes Greyskin, who has destroyed the forest. Then he ran as fast as he could. What do you mean by that? asked Carr. I really don't know, said Greyskin. I think that the small forest animals are displeased with me because I was the one who proposed we should ask help of human beings. When the underbrush was cut down, all their lairs and hiding places were destroyed. They walked on together a while longer, and Carr heard the same cry coming from all directions. There goes Greyskin, who's destroyed the forest. Greyskin pretended not to hear it, 
But Carr understood why the elk was so downhearted. I say, Grayskin, what does the water snake mean by saying you killed the one he, he loved best? How can I tell? said Grayskin. You know very well that I never kill anything. Shortly after that, they met the four old elk, Crooked Back, Antler Crown, Rough Mane, and Big and Strong, who were coming along slowly, one after the other. Well met in the forest, called Grayskin. Well met in turn, answered the elk. We were just looking for you, Grayskin, to consult with you about the forest. The fact is, began Crooked Back, we've been informed that a crime has been committed here, and that the whole forest is being destroyed because the criminal has not been punished. What kind of crime was it? Someone killed a harmless creature that he couldn't eat. Such an act is accounted a crime in Liberty Forest. Oh, who could have done such a cowardly thing? wondered Grayskin. They say that an elk did it, and we're just going to ask if you knew who it was. No, said Grayskin. I've never heard of an elk killing a harmless creature. Grayskin parted from the four old elk and went on with Carr. He was silent and walked with lowered head. They happened to pass Crawley, the adder, who lay on his shelf of rock. There goes Grayskin, who has destroyed the whole forest, hissed Crawley, like all the rest. And by that time, Grayskin's patience was exhausted. He walked up to the snake and raised a forefoot. Do you think of crushing me as you crushed the old water snake, hissed Crawley. Did I kill a water snake? asked Grayskin, astonished. The first day you were in the forest, you killed the wife of poor old Helpless, said Crawley. Grayskin turned quickly from the adder and continued his walk with Carr. Suddenly he stopped. Carr, it was I who committed that crime. I killed a harmless creature. Therefore, it is on my account that the forest is being destroyed. What do you say? Carr interrupted. You may tell the water snake, helpless, that Grayskin goes into exile tonight. That I shall never tell him, protested Carr. The far north is a dangerous country for elk. Do you think that I wish to remain here when I have caused a disaster like this? protested Grayskin. Don't be rash. Sleep over it before you do anything. It was you who taught me that the elk are one with the forest, said Grayskin. And so saying, he parted from Carr. The dog went home alone, but this talk with Grayskin troubled him, and the next morning he returned to the forest to seek him. But Grayskin was not to be found, and the dog did not search long for him. He realised that the elk had taken the snake at his word and had gone into exile. On his walk home, Carr was too unhappy for words. He could not understand why Grayskin should allow that wretch of a water snake to trick him away. He'd never heard of such folly. What power can that old helpless have? As Carr walked along, his mind full of these thoughts, he happened to see the gamekeeper who stood pointing up at a tree. What are you looking at? asked a man who stood beside him. Cygnus has come among the caterpillars, observed the gamekeeper. Carr was astonished, but he was even more angered at the snakes having the power to keep his word. Grayskin would have to stay away a long, long time, for, of course, that water snake would never die. At the very height of his grief, a thought came to Carr which comforted him a little. Perhaps the water snake won't live so long. After all, he thought, surely he cannot always lie protected under a tree root. As soon as he's cleaned out the caterpillars, I know someone who's going to bite his head off. It was true that an illness had made its appearance among the caterpillars. The first summer, it did not spread much. It had only just broken out when it was time for the larvae to turn into pupae. From the latter came millions of moths. They flew around in the trees like a blinding snowstorm and laid countless numbers of eggs. An even greater destruction was prophesied for the following year. The destruction came not only to the forest, but also to the caterpillars. The sickness spread quickly from forest to forest. The sick caterpillars stopped eating, crawled up to the branches of the trees and died there. There was great rejoicing among the people when they saw them die but there was even greater rejoicing among the forest animals. 
From day to day, the dog, Carr, went about with savage glee, thinking of the hour when he might venture to kill Helpless. But the caterpillars, meanwhile, had spread over miles of pine woods. Not in one summer did the disease reach them all. Many lived to become pupas and moths. Grayskin sent messages to his friend Carr by the birds of passage to say that he was alive and faring well. But the birds told Carr confidentially that on several occasions Grayskin had been pursued by poachers and that only with the greatest difficulty had he escaped. Carr lived in a state of continual grief, yearning and anxiety. Yet he had to wait two whole summers more before there was an end of the caterpillars. Carr no sooner heard the gamekeeper say that the forest was out of danger than he started on a hunt for helpless. But when he was in the thick of the forest, he made a frightful discovery. He could not hunt any more. He could not run. He could not track his enemy. And he could not see at all. During the long years of waiting, old age had overtaken Carr. He had grown old without having noticed it. He had not the strength even to kill a water snake. He was not able to save his friend Grayskin from his enemy. Part 6 Retribution One afternoon, Akka from Kebnekes and her flock alighted on the shore of Forest Lake. Spring was backward, as it always is in the mountain districts. Ice covered all the lake, save a narrow strip next to the land. The geese at once plunged into the water to bathe and hunt for food. In the morning, Nils Holgersen had dropped one of his wooden shoes, so he went down by the elms and birches that grew along the shore to look for something to bind around his foot. The boy walked quite a distance before he found anything that he could use. He glanced about nervously, for he did not fancy being in the forest. Give me the plains and the lakes, he thought. There you can see what you're likely to meet. Now, if this were a grove of little birches, it would be well enough, for then the ground would be almost bare. But how people can like these wild, pathless forests is incomprehensible to me. If I owned this land, I would chop down every tree. At last he caught sight of a piece of birch bark, and just as he was fitting it to his foot, he heard a rustle behind him. He turned quickly. A snake darted from the brush straight toward him. The snake was uncommonly long and thick, but the boy soon saw that it had a white spot on each cheek. Why, it's only a water snake, he laughed. It can't harm me. But the next instant, the snake gave him a powerful blow on the chest that knocked him down. The boy was on his feet in a second and running away, but the snake was after him. The ground was stony and scrubby. The boy could not proceed very fast, and the snake was close at his heels. Then the boy saw a big rock in front of him and began to scale it. I do hope the snake can't follow me here, he thought, but he had no sooner reached the top of the rock than he saw that the snake was following him. Quite close to the boy, on a narrow ledge at the top of a rock, lay a round stone as large as a man's head. As the snake came closer, the boy ran behind the stone and gave it a push. It rolled right down on the snake, drawing it along to the ground where it landed on its head. That stone did its work well, thought the boy with a sigh of relief, as he saw the snake squirm a little and then lie perfectly still. I don't think I've been in greater peril on the whole journey, he said. He had hardly recovered from the shock when he heard a rustle above him and saw a bird circling through the air to light on the ground right beside the snake. The bird was like a crow in size and form, but was dressed in a pretty coat of shiny black feathers. The boy cautiously retreated into a crevice of the rock. His adventure in being kidnapped by crows was still fresh in his memory, and he did not care to show himself when there was no need of it. The bird strode back and forth beside the snake's body and turned it over with his beak. Finally, he spread his wings and began to shriek in ear-splitting tones. It is certainly helpless, the water snake that lies dead here. Once more, he walked the length of the snake. Then he stood in a deep study and scratched his neck with his foot. It isn't possible that there can be two such snakes in the forest, he pondered. It must surely be helpless. He was just going to thrust his beak into the snake, but suddenly checked himself. You mustn't be a numbskull, Pataki, he remarks to himself. Surely you cannot be thinking of eating the snake until you have called Carr. He wouldn't believe that Helpless was dead until he could see it with his own eyes. The boy tried to keep quiet, but the bird was so ludicrously solemn as he stalked back and forth, chattering to himself. 
that he had to laugh. The bird heard him, and with a flap of his wings he was up on the rock. The boy rose quickly and walked toward him. "'Are you not the one who is called Pataki the Raven? And are you not a friend of Akka from Kebnekes?' asked the boy. The bird regarded him intently, then nodded three times. "'Surely you're not the little chap who flies around with the wild geese and whom they call Thumbietot?' "'Oh, you're not so far out of the way,' said the boy. "'What luck that I should have run across you! Perhaps you can tell me who killed this water snake?' "'The stone which I rolled down on him killed him,' replied the boy, and related how the whole thing had happened. "'That was cleverly done for one who is as tidy as you are,' said the raven. "'I have a friend in these parts who will be glad to know that the snake has been killed, and I should like to render you a service in return.' "'Then tell me why you're glad the water snake is dead,' responded the boy. "'It's a long story,' said the raven. "'You wouldn't have the patience to listen to it.' But the boy insisted that he had, and then the raven told him the whole story about Carr and Grayskin and Helpless, the water snake. When he'd finished, the boy sat quietly for a moment, looking straight ahead. Then he spoke. "'I seem to like the forest better since hearing this,' I wonder if there's anything left of the old Liberty Forest. Most of it has been destroyed, said Bataki. The trees look as if they had passed through a fire. They'll have to be cleared away, and it will take many years before the forest will be what it once was. That snake deserved his death, declared the boy, but I wonder if it could be possible that he was so wise he could send sickness to the caterpillars. Perhaps he knew that they frequently became sick in that way, intimated Bataki. Uh, yes, that may be, but all the same, I must say that he was a very wily snake. The boy stopped talking because he saw the raven was not listening to him, but sitting with gaze averted. Hark, he said, Carr is in the vicinity. Won't he be happy when he sees that the helpless is dead? The boy turned his head in the direction of the sound. He's talking with the wild geese, he said. Oh, you may be sure that he's dragged himself down to the strand to get the latest news about Greyskin. Both the boy and the raven jumped to the ground and hastened down to the shore. All the geese had come out of the lake and stood talking with an old dog who was so weak and decrepit that it seemed as if he might drop dead at any moment. "'There's Carr," said Bataki to the boy. "'Let him hear first what the wild geese have to say to him. Later we shall tell him that the water snake is dead.' Presently they heard Akka talking to Carr. "'It happened last year while we were making our usual spring trip,' remarked the leader goose. We started out one morning, Ixi, Caxi and I, and we flew over the great boundary forest between Dalekala and Helsingland. Under us we saw only thick pine forests. The snow was still deep among the trees and the creeks were mostly frozen. Suddenly we noticed three poachers down in the forest. They were on skis, had dogs in leash, carried knives in their belts, but had no guns. As there was a hard crust on the snow, they did not bother to take the winding forest paths, but skied straight ahead. Apparently they knew very well where they must go to find what they were seeking. We wild geese flew on, high up in the air, so that the whole forest under us was visible. When we sighted the poachers, we wanted to find out where the game was, so we circled up and down, peering through the trees. Then in a dense thicket we saw something that looked like big moss-covered rocks, but couldn't be rocks, for there was no snow on them. We shot down suddenly and lit in the center of the thicket, the three rocks moved. They were three elk, a bull, and two cows resting in the bleak forest. When we alighted, the elk bull rose and came towards us. He was the most superb animal we have ever seen. When he saw that it was only some poor wild geese that had awakened him, he lay down again. No, old granddaddy, you mustn't go back to sleep, I cried. Flee as fast as you can. There are poachers in the forest, and they are bound for this very dear fold. Thank you, goose mother, said the elk. He seemed to be dropping to sleep while he was speaking. But surely you must know that we elk are under the protection of the law at this time of year. Those poachers are probably out for a fox, he yawned. There are plenty of fox trails in the forest, but the poachers are not looking for them. Believe me, old granddaddy, they know that you are lying here and are coming to attack you. They have no guns with them, only spears and knives, for they dare not fire a shot at this season. The elk bull lay there calmly, but the elk cow seemed to feel uneasy. It may be as the geese say, they remarked, beginning to bestir themselves. You just lie down, said the elk bull. There are no poachers coming here, of that you may be certain. There was nothing more to be done, so we wild geese rose again into the air. 
but we continued to circle over the place to see how it would turn out for the elk. We had hardly reached our regular flying altitude when we saw the elk bull come out from the thicket. He sniffed the air a little then, walked straight towards the poachers. As he strode along, he stepped upon dry twigs that cracked noisily. A big, barren marsh lay just beyond him. Thither he went and took his stand in the middle. There was nothing to hide him from view. There he stood until the poachers emerged from the woods. Then he turned and fled in the opposite direction. The poachers let loose the dogs and they themselves skied after him at full speed. The elk threw back his head and loped as fast as he could. He kicked up snow until it flew like a blizzard about him. Both dogs and men were left far behind. Then the elk stopped as if to wait their approach. When they were within sight, they dashed ahead again. We understood that he was purposely tempting the hunters away from the place where the cows were. We thought it brave of him to face danger himself in order that those who were dear to him might be left in safety. None of us wanted to leave the place until we had seen how all this was to end. Thus the chase continued for two hours or more. We wondered that the poachers went to the trouble of pursuing the elk when they were not armed with rifles. They couldn't have thought that they could succeed in tiring out a runner like him. Then we noticed that the elk no longer ran so rapidly. He stepped on the snow more carefully, and every time he lifted his feet, blood could be seen in his tracks. We understood why the poachers had been so persistent. They had counted on help from the snow. The elk was heavy, and with every step he sank to the bottom of the drift. The hard crust on the snow was scraping his legs. It scraped away the fur and tore out pieces of flesh so that he was in torture every time he put his foot down. The poachers and the dogs, who were so light that the ice crust could hold their weight, pursued him all the while. He ran on and on his steps becoming more and more uncertain and faltering he gasped for breath not only did he suffer intense pain but he was also exhausted from wading through the deep snow drifts at last he lost all patience he paused to let poachers and dogs come upon him and was ready to fight them as he stood there waiting he glanced upward when he saw us wild geese circling above him he cried out stay here wild geese until all is over and the next time you fly over colmard and look up car and ask him if he doesn't think that his friend Grayskin has met with a happy end. When Akka had gone so far in her story, the old dog rose and walked nearer to her. Grayskin led a good life, he said. He understands me. He knows that I'm a brave dog, and that I shall be glad to hear that he had a happy end. Now tell me how. He raised his tail and threw back his head, as if to give himself a bold and proud bearing. Then he collapsed. "'Car! Car!' called a man's voice from the forest. The old dog rose obediently. "'My master is calling me,' he said, "'and I must not tarry longer. I just saw him load his gun. Now we two are going into the forest for the last time. Many thanks, wild goose. I know everything that I need to know to die content. Chapter 23 The Wind Witch Part 1 In Nark In bygone days there was something in Nark, the like of which was not to be found elsewhere. It was a witch named Isetta Kaiser. The name Kaiser had been given her because she had a good deal to do with wind and storm, and these wind witches are always so called. The surname was added because she was supposed to have come from the East Satter Swamp in Asker Parish. It seemed as though her real abode must have been at Asker, but she used also to appear at other places. Nowhere in Ornark could one be sure of not meeting her. She was no dark, mournful witch, but gay and frolicsome, and what she loved most of all was a gale of wind. As soon as there was wind enough, off she would fly to the Nark Plain for a good dance. On days when a whirlwind swept the plain, Isata Kaiser had fun. She would stand right in the wind and spin round, her long hair flying up among the clouds, and the long trail of her robe sweeping the ground like a dust cloud, while the whole plain lay spread out under her like a ballroom floor. Of a morning, Isata Kaiser would sit up in some tall pine at the top of a precipice and look across the plain. If it happened to be winter and she saw many teams on the roads, she hurriedly blew up a blizzard, piling the drifts so high that people could barely get back to their homes by evening. 
If it chanced to be summer and good harvest weather, he said a Kaiser would sit quietly until the first hayricks had been loaded. Then she would come with a couple of heavy showers, which put an end to the work for that day. It was only too true that she seldom thought of anything else than raising mischief. The charcoal burners up in the Kill Mountains hardly dared take a catnap, for as soon as she saw an unwatched kiln, she stole up and blew on it until it began to burn in a great flame. If the metal drivers from Laxa and Svarta were out late of an evening, Isata Kaiser would veil the roads and the country round about in such dark clouds that both men and horses lost their way and drove the heavy trucks down into swamps and morasses. If, on a summer's day, the dean's wife at Glanshammer had spread the tea table in the garden and along would come a gust of wind that lifted the cloth from the table and turned over cups and saucers, they knew who had raised the mischief. If the mayor of Orobro's hat blew off so that he had to run across the whole square after it, if the wash on the line blew away and got covered with dirt, or if the smoke poured into the cabins and seemed unable to find its way out through the chimney, it was easy enough to guess who was out making merry. Although Isata Kaiser was fond of all sorts of tantalising games, there was nothing really bad about her. One could see that she was hardest on those who were quarrelsome, stingy or wicked, while honest folk and poor little children she would take under her wing. Old people say of her that once, when Asuka Church was burning, Isata Kaiser swept through the air, lit amid fire and smoke on the church roof, and averted the disaster. All the same, the Nark folk were often rather tired of Isata Kaiser, but she never tired of playing her tricks on them. As she sat on the edge of a cloud and looked down upon Nark, which rested so peacefully and comfortably beneath her, she must have thought, the inhabitants would fare much too well if I were not in existence. They would grow sleepy and dull. There must be someone like myself to rouse them and keep them in good spirits. Then she would laugh wildly, and chattering like a magpie, would rush off, dancing and spinning from one end of the plain to the other. When a Nark man saw her come dragging her dust trail over the plain, he could not help smiling. Provoking and tiresome she certainly was, but she had a merry spirit. It was just as refreshing for the peasants to meet Isata Kaiser as it was for the plain to be lashed by the windstorm. Nowadays it is said that Isata Kaiser is dead and gone, like all other witches. But this one can hardly believe. It is as if someone were to come and tell you that henceforth the air would always be still on the plain, and the wind would never more dance across it with blustering breezes and drenching showers. He who fancies that Isata Kaiser is dead and gone may as well hear what occurred in Nark the year that Nils Holgersen travelled over that part of the country. Then let him tell what he thinks about it. Part 2. Market Eve. Wednesday, April 27th. It was the day before the big cattle fair at Orobro. It rained in torrents, and people thought, This is exactly as in Isata Kaiser's time. At fairs she used to be more prankish than usual. It was quite in her line to arrange a downpour like this on a market eve. As the day wore on, the rain increased, and toward evening came regular cloudbursts. The roads were like bottomless swamps. The farmers who had started from home with their cattle early in the morning that they might arrive at a seasonable hour fed badly. Cows and oxen were so tired they could hardly move and many of the poor beasts dropped down in the middle of the road to show that they were too exhausted to go any farther. All who lived along the roadside had to open their doors to the market-bound travellers and harbour them as best they could. Farmhouses, barns and sheds were soon crowded to their limit. Meanwhile, those who could struggle along toward the inn did so, but when they arrived they wished they had stopped at some cabin along the road. All the cribs in the barn and all the stalls in the stable were already occupied. There was no other choice than to let horses and cattle stand out in the rain. Their masters could barely manage to get under cover. The crush and mud and slush in the barnyard were frightful. Some of the animals were standing in puddles and could not even lie down. There were thoughtful masters, of course, who procured straw for their animals to lie on, and spread blankets over them, 
But there were those also who sat in the inn, drinking and gambling, entirely forgetful of the dumb creatures which they should have protected. The boy and the wild geese had come to a little wooded island in Halmar Lake that evening. The island was separated from the mainland by a narrow and shallow stream, and at low tide one could pass over it dryshot. It rained just as hard on the island as it did everywhere else. The boy could not sleep for the water that kept dripping down on him. Finally he got up and began to walk. He fancied that he felt the rain less when he moved about. He had hardly circled the island when he heard a splashing in the stream. Presently he saw a solitary horse tramping along among the trees. Never in all his life had he seen such a wreck of a horse. He was broken-winded and stiff-kneed and so thin that every rib could be seen under the hide. He bore neither harness nor saddle, only an old bridle from which dangled a half-rotted rope-end. Obviously he had had no difficulty in breaking loose. The horse walked straight toward the spot where the wild geese were sleeping. The boy was afraid that he would step on them. "'Where are you going? Feel your ground!' shouted the boy. "'Oh, there you are!' exclaimed the horse. "'I've walked miles to meet you.' "'Have you heard of me?' asked the boy, astonished. "'I've got ears, even if I am old. There are many who talk of you nowadays.' As he spoke, the horse bent his head that he might see better, and the boy noticed that he had a small head, beautiful eyes, and a soft, sensitive nose. He must have been a good horse at the start, though he has come to grief in his old age, he thought. "'I wish you would come and help me with something,' pleaded the horse. The boy thought it would be embarrassing to accompany a creature who looked so wretched, and excused himself on account of the bad weather. "'You'll be no worse off on my back than you are lying here,' said the horse. "'But perhaps you don't dare to go with an old tramp of a horse like me.' "'Certainly I dare,' said the boy. "'Then wake the geese, so that we can arrange with them where they shall come for you tomorrow,' said the horse. The boy was soon seated on the animal's back, and the old nag trotted along better than he thought possible.' It was a long ride in the rain and darkness before they halted near a large inn, where everything looked terribly uninviting. The wheel tracks were so deep in the road that the boy feared he might drown should he fall down into them. Alongside the fence which enclosed the yard, some thirty or forty horses and cattle were tied, with no protection against the rain, and in the yard were wagons piled with packing cases where sheep, calves, hogs and chickens were shut in. The horse walked over to the fence and stationed himself. The boy remained seated upon his back, and with his good night eyes plainly saw how badly the animals fared. "'How do you happen to be standing out here in the rain?' he asked. "'We're on our way to a fair at Orobro, but we're obliged to put up here on account of the rain. This is an inn, but so many travellers have already arrived, but there's no room for us in the barns.' The boy made no reply, but sat quietly looking about him. Not many of the animals were asleep, and on all sides he heard complaints and indignant protests. They had reason enough for grumbling, for the weather was even worse than it had been earlier in the day. A freezing wind had begun to blow, and the rain which came bleating down upon them was turning to snow. It was easy enough to understand what the horse wanted the boy to help him with. "'Do you see that fine farmyard?' directly opposite the inn remarked the horse yes i see it answered the boy and i can't comprehend why they haven't tried to find shelter for all of you in there they are already full perhaps <coughs> no there are no strangers in that <coughs> place said the horse the <coughs> people who live on that farm are so stingy and selfish that <coughs> it would be useless for anyone to ask them for harbour <coughs> if that's the case i suppose you'll have to stand where you are "'I was born and raised on that farm,' said the horse. "'I know that there's a large barn and a big cowshed with many empty stalls and mangers, "'and I was wondering if you couldn't manage in some way or other to get us in over there.' "'I don't think I could venture,' hesitated the boy. "'But he felt so sorry for the poor beasts that he wanted to at least try.' He ran into the strange barnyard and saw at once that all the outhouses were locked and the keys gone. He stood there, puzzled and helpless, 
when aid came to him from an unexpected source. A gust of wind came sweeping along with terrific force and flung open a shed door right in front of him. The boy was not long in getting back to the horse. "'It isn't possible to get into the barn or the cowhouse,' he said, "'but there's a big empty hay shed that they've forgotten to bolt. I can lead you into that.' "'Thank you,' said the horse. "'It will seem good to sleep once more on familiar ground.' The master of the place was a man of thirty-five, tall and dignified, with a handsome but melancholy face. During the day he'd been out in the rain and had got wet, like everyone else, and at supper he asked his old mother, who was still mistress of the place, to light a fire on the hearth that he might dry his clothes. The mother kindled a feeble blaze, for in that house they were not wasteful with wood, and the master hung his coat on the back of a chair and placed it before the fire. With one foot on top of the andiron and a hand resting on his knee, he stood gazing into the embers. Thus he stood for two whole hours, making no move other than to cast a log on the fire now and then. The mistress removed the supper things and turned down his bed for the night before she went to her own room and seated herself. At intervals she came to the door and looked wonderingly at her son. "'It's nothing, mother. I'm only thinking,' he said. His thoughts were on something that had occurred shortly before. When he passed the inn, a horse-dealer had asked him if he would not like to purchase a horse, and had shown him an old nag so weather-beaten that he asked the dealer if he took him for a fool, since he wished to palm off such a played-out beast on him. "'Oh, no!' said the horse-dealer. "'I only thought that, inasmuch as the horse once belonged to you, you might wish to give him a comfortable home in his old age. He has need of it.' Then he looked at the horse, and recognised it as one which he himself had raised and broken in. But it did not occur to him to purchase such an old and useless creature on that account. No, indeed, he was not one who squandered his money. All the same, the sight of the horse had awakened many memories, and it was the memories that kept him awake. That horse had been a fine animal. His father had let him tend it from the start. He had broken it in and had loved it above everything else. His father had complained that he used to feed it too well, and often he had been obliged to steal out and smuggle oats to it. Once, when he ventured to talk with his father about letting him buy a broadcloth suit or having the cart painted, his father stood as if petrified, and he thought the old man would have a stroke. He tried to make his father understand that when he had a fine horse to drive, he should look presentable himself. The father made no reply, but two days later he took the horse to Orobro and sold it. It was cruel of him, but it was plain that his father had feared that this horse might lead him into vanity and extravagance, and now, so long afterward, he had to admit that his father was right. A horse like that surely would have been a temptation. At first, he had grieved terribly over his loss. Many a time he had gone down to Orobro just to stand on a street corner and see the horse pass by, or to steal into the stable and give him a lump of sugar. He thought, if I ever get the farm, the first thing I do will be to buy back my horse. Now his father was gone, and he himself had been master for two years, but he had not made a move toward buying the horse. He had not thought of him for ever so long, until tonight. It was strange that he should have forgotten the beast so entirely. His father had been a very headstrong, domineering man. When his son was grown and the two had worked together, the father had gained absolute power over him. The boy had come to think that everything his father did was right, and after he became the master, he only tried to do exactly as his father would have done. He knew, of course, that folks said his father was stingy, but it was well to keep a tight hold on one's purse and not throw away money needlessly. The goods one has received should not be wasted. It was better to live on a debt-free place and be called stingy than to carry heavy mortgages like other farm owners. He had gone so far in his mind when he was called back by a strange sound. It was as if a shrill, mocking voice were repeating his thoughts. It's better to keep a firm hold on one's purse and be called stingy than to be in debt like other farm owners. It sounded as if someone was trying to make sport of his wisdom, and he was about to lose his temper when he realised that it was all a mistake. The wind 
was beginning to rage, and he had been standing there getting so sleepy that he mistook the howling of the wind in the chimney for human speech. He glanced up at the wall clock, which just then struck eleven. "'It's time that you were in bed,' he remarked to himself. Then he remembered that he had not yet gone the rounds of the farmyard, as it was his custom to do every night, to make sure that all doors were closed and all lights extinguished. This was something he had never neglected since he became master. He drew on his coat and went out in the storm. He found everything as it should be, save that the door to the empty hay shed had been blown open by the wind. He stepped inside for the key, locked the shed door, and put the key into his coat pocket. Then he went back to the house, removed his coat, and hung it before the fire. Even now he did not retire, but began pacing the floor. The storm without, with its biting wind and snow-blended rain, was terrible, and his old horse was standing in this storm without so much as a blanket to protect him. He should at least have given his old friend a roof over his head, since he'd come such a long distance. At the inn across the way, the boy heard an old war clock strike eleven times. Just then he was untying the animals to lead them to the shed in the farmyard opposite. It took some time to rouse them and get them into line. When all were ready, they marched in a long procession into the stingy farmer's yard with the boy as their guide. While the boy had been assembling them, the farmer had gone the rounds of the farmyard and locked the hay shed so that when the animals came along, the door was closed. The boy stood there dismayed. He could not let the creature stand out there. He must go into the house and find the key. "'Keep them quiet out here while I go in and fetch the key,' he said to the old horse, and off he ran. On the path right in front of the house, he paused to think out how he should get inside. As he stood there, he noticed two little wanderers coming down the road who stopped before the inn. The boy saw at once that they were two little girls and ran towards them. "'Come now, Britta Major," said one. "'You mustn't cry any more. Now we're at the inn. Here they will surely take us in.' The girl had but just said this when the boy called to her. "'No, you mustn't try to get in there. It's simply impossible. But at the farmhouse opposite there are no guests. Go there instead.' The little girls heard the words distinctly, though they could not see the one who spoke to them. They did not wonder much at that, however, for the night was as black as pitch. The larger of the girls promptly answered, "'We don't care to enter that place, because those who live there are stingy and cruel. It is their fault that we two must go out on the highways and beg.' "'That may be so,' said the boy. "'But all the same, you should go there. You shall see that it will be well for you.' "'We can try.' "'But it is doubtful that they will even let us enter,' observed the two little girls as they walked up to the house and knocked. The master was standing by the fire, thinking of the horse, when he heard the knocking. He stepped to the door to see what was up, thinking all the while that he would not let himself be tempted into admitting any wayfarer. As he fumbled the lock, a gust of wind came along, wrenched the door from his hand and swung it open. To close it, he had to step out on the porch, and when he stepped back into the house, the two little girls were standing within. They were two poor beggar girls, ragged, dirty, and starving, two little tots bent under the burden of their beggar's packs, which were as large as themselves. "'Who are you that go prowling about at this hour of the night?' said the master gruffly. The two children did not answer immediately, but first removed their packs. Then they walked up to the man and stretched forth their tiny hands in greeting. "'We are Anna and Britta Madger from the Engard,' said the elder, "'and we're going to ask for a night's lodging.' He did not take the outstretched hands and was just about to drive out the bigger children when a fresh recollection faced him. Engard was not that a little cabin where a poor widow with five children had lived. The widow had owed his father a few hundred kroner, and in order to get back his money he sold her cabin. After that the widow, with her three eldest children, went to Norland to seek employment, and the two youngest became a charge on the parish. As he called this to mind he grew bitter. He knew that his father had been severely censured for squeezing out that money, which by right belonged to him. "'What are you doing nowadays?' he asked in a cross tone. "'Didn't the board of charities take charge of you?' "'Why do you roam around and beg?' "'It's not our fault,' replied the larger girl. "'The people with whom we are living have sent us out to beg.' "'Well, your packs are filled,' the farmer observed. 
so you can't complain. Now you'd better take out some of the food you have with you and eat your fill, for here you'll get no food, as all the women folk are in bed. Later you may lie down in the corner by the hearth, so you won't have to freeze. He waved his hand as if to ward them off, and his eyes took on a hard look. He was thankful that he had had a father who had been careful of his property. Otherwise he might perhaps have been forced in childhood to run about and beg as these children now did. No sooner had he thought this out to the end than the shrill mocking voice he had heard once before that evening repeated it, word for word. He listened and at once understood that it was nothing, only the wind roaring in the chimney. But the queer thing about it was, when the wind repeated his thoughts, they seemed so strangely stupid and hard and false. The children, meanwhile, had stretched themselves side by side on the floor. They were not quiet, but lay there muttering. Do be still, won't you? He growled, for he was in such an irritable mood that he could have beaten them. But the mumbling continued, and again he called for silence. When mother went away, piped a clear little voice, she made me promise that every night I would say my evening prayer. I must do this, and Britta Major too. As soon as we have said, God who cares for little children, we'll be quiet. The master sat quite still while the little ones said their prayers. Then he rose and began pacing back and forth, back and forth, wringing his hands all the while as though he had met with some great sorrow. The horse driven out and wrecked. These two children turned into road beggars, both father's doings. Perhaps father did not do right. After all, he thought. He sat down again and buried his head in his hands. Suddenly his lips began to quiver, and into his eyes came tears, which he hastily wiped away. Fresh tears came, and he was just as prompt to brush these away, but it was useless for more followed. When his mother stepped into the room, he swung his chair quickly and turned his back to her. She must have noticed something unusual, for she stood quietly behind him a long while, as if waiting for him to speak. She realised how difficult it always is for men to talk of the things they feel most deeply. She must help him, of course. From her bedroom she had observed all that had taken place in the living room, so that she did not have to ask questions. She walked very softly over to the two sleeping children, lifted them and bore them to her own bed. Then she went back to her son. Lars, she said, as if she did not see that he was weeping, you had better let me keep these children. What, mother? He gasped, trying to smother the sobs. I, I have been suffering for years, ever since father took the cabin from their mother, and so have you. Uh, yes, but I want to keep them here and make something of them. They are too good to beg. He could not speak, for now the tears were beyond his control, but he took his old mother's withered hand and patted it. Then he jumped up as if something had frightened him. What would father have said of this? Father had his day at ruling, retorted the mother. Now it's your day. As long as father lived, we had to obey him. Now is the time to show what you are. Her son was so astonished that he ceased crying. But I have just shown what I am, he returned. No, you haven't, protested the mother. You only try to be like him. Father experienced hard times which made him fear poverty. He believed that he had to think of himself first. But you have never had any difficulties that should make you hard. You have more than you need, and it would be unnatural of you not to think of others. When the two little girls entered the house, the boy slipped in behind them and secreted himself in a dark corner. He had not been there long before he caught a glimpse of the shed key, which the farmer had thrust into his coat pocket. When the master of the house drives the children out, I'll take the key and run, he thought. But the children were not driven out, and the boy crouched in the corner, not knowing what he should do next. The mother talked long with her son, and while she was speaking, he stopped weeping. Gradually his features softened. He looked like another person. All the while he was stroking the wasted old hand. Now we may as well retire, said the old lady when she saw that he was calm again. No, he said, suddenly rising. I cannot retire yet. 
that there's a stranger without whom I must shelter tonight. He said nothing further, but quickly drew on his coat, lit the lantern, and went out. There were the same wind and chill without, but as he stepped to the porch, he began to sing softly. He wondered if the horse would know him, and if he would be glad to come back to his old stable. As he crossed the house yard, he heard a door slam. That shed door has blown open again, he thought, and went over to close it. A moment later, he stood by the shed and was just going to shut the door when he heard a rustling within. The boy, who had watched his opportunity, had run directly to the shed where he left the animals, but they were no longer out in the rain. A strong wind had long since thrown open the door and helped them to get a roof over their heads. The patter which the master heard was occasioned by the boy running into the shed. By the light of the lantern, the man could see into the shed. The whole floor was covered with sleeping cattle. There was no human being to be seen. The animals were not bound, but were lying here and there in the straw. He was enraged at the intrusion and began storming and shrieking to rouse the sleepers and drive them out. But the creatures lay still and would not let themselves be disturbed. The only one that rose was an old horse that came slowly toward him. All of a sudden, the man became silent. He recognised the beast by its gait. He raised the lantern, and the horse came over and laid its head on his shoulder. The master patted and stroked it. "'My old horsey, my old horsey,' he said. "'What have they done to you? "'Oh, yes, dear, I'll buy you back. "'You'll never again have to leave this place. "'You shall do whatever you like, horsey mine.' Those whom you have brought with you uh, may remain here, but you shall come with me to the stable. Now I can give you all the oats you're able to eat without having to smuggle them, and you're not all used up either. The handsomest horse on the church knoll, that's what you shall be once more. There, 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 there. Chapter 24 The Breaking Up of the Ice Thursday, April 28th. The following day, the weather was clear and beautiful. There was a strong west wind. People were glad of that, for it dried up the roads, which had been soaked by the heavy rains of the day before. Early in the morning, the two Smallland children, Osa the Goose Girl and Little Mats, were out on the highway leading from Sormland to Nock. The road ran alongside the southern shore of Hjalmar Lake, and the children were walking along, looking at the ice, which covered the greater part of it. The morning sun darted its clear rays upon the ice, which did not look dark and forbidding like most spring ice, but sparkled temptingly. As far as they could see, the ice was firm and dry, and the rain had run down into cracks and hollows, or been absorbed by the ice itself. The children saw only the sound ice. Osa the Goose Girl and Little Mats were on their way north, and they could not help thinking of all the steps they would be saved if they could cut straight across the lake instead of going around it. They knew to be sure that spring ice is treacherous, but this looked perfectly secure. They could see that it was several inches thick near the shore. They saw a path which they might follow, and the opposite shore appeared to be so near that they ought to be able to get there in an hour. Come, let's try, said Little Mats. If we only look before us so that we don't go down into some hole, we can do it. So they went out on the lake, and the ice was not very slippery, but rather easy to walk upon. There was more water on it than they expected to see, and here and there were cracks where the water pulled up. One had to watch out for such places, but that was easy to do in broad daylight with the sun shining. The children advanced rapidly, and talked only of how sensible they were to have gone out on the ice instead of tramping the slushy road. When they had been walking a while, they came to Vin Island, where an old woman had sighted them from her window. She rushed from her cabin, waved them back, and shouted something which they could not hear. They understood perfectly well that she was warning them not to come any farther, but they thought there was no immediate danger. It would be stupid for them to leave the ice when all was going so well. And therefore, they went on past Vin Island and had a stretch of seven miles of ice ahead of them. Out there was so much water that the children were obliged to take roundabout ways, but that was sport to them. They vied with each other as to which could find the soundest ice. They were neither tired nor hungry. The whole day was before them, and they laughed at each obstacle they met. Now and then they cast a glance ahead at the farther shore. 
It still appeared far away, although they'd been walking a good hour. They were rather surprised that the lake was so broad. The shore seems to be moving farther away from us, little Mats observed. Out there, the children were not protected against the wind, which was becoming stronger and stronger every minute, and was pressing their clothes so close to their bodies that they could hardly go on. The cold wind was the first disagreeable thing they had met with on the journey. But the amazing part of it was that the wind came sweeping along with a loud roar, as if it brought with it the noise of a large mill or factory, though nothing of the kind was to be found out there on the ice. They had walked to the west of the big island of Valen. Now they thought they were nearing the north shore. And suddenly the wind began to blow more and more, while the loud roaring increased so rapidly that they began to feel uneasy. All at once it occurred to them that the roar was caused by the foaming and rushing of the waves breaking against a shore. Even this seemed improbable since the lake was still covered with ice. At all events, they paused and looked about. They noticed far in the west a white bank, which stretched clear across the lake. At first, they thought it was a snowbank alongside a road. Later, they realised it was the foam-capped waves dashing against the ice. They took hold of hands and ran without saying a word. Open sea lay beyond in the west, and suddenly the streak of foam appeared to be moving eastward. They wondered if the ice was going to break all over. What was going to happen? They felt now that they were in great danger. All at once it seemed as if the ice under their feet rose, rose and sank, as if someone from below were pushing it. And presently they heard a hollow boom, and then there were cracks in the ice all around them. The children could see how they crept along under the ice covering. The next moment all was still, then the rising and sinking began again, and thereupon the cracks began to widen into crevices through which the water bubbled up. By and by the crevices became gaps. Soon after that the ice was divided into large flows. Oh, sir, said little Mats, this must be the breaking up of the ice. Why, so it is, little Mats, said Osa. But as yet we can get to land, run for your life. As a matter of fact, the wind and waves had a good deal of work to do yet to clear the ice from the lake. The hardest part was done when the ice cake burst into pieces, but all these pieces must be broken and hurled against each other to be crushed, worn down and dissolved. There was still a great deal of hard and sound ice left which formed large, unbroken surfaces. The greatest danger for the children lay in the fact that they had no general view of the ice. They did not see the places where the gaps were so wide that they could not possibly jump over them, nor did they know where to find any flows that would hold them. So they wandered aimlessly back and forth, going farther out on the lake instead of nearer land. At last, confused and terrified, they stood still and wept. Then a flock of wild geese in rapid flight came rushing by. They shrieked loudly and sharply, but the strange thing was that above the geese cackle, the little children heard these words. You must go to the right, the right, the right. They began at once to follow the advice, but before long they were again standing irresolute, facing another broad gap. Again they heard the geese shrieking above them, and again amid the geese cackle they distinguished a few words. Stand where you are, stand where you are. The children did not say a word to each other, but obeyed and stood still. Soon after that the ice floes floated together so that they could cross the gap. Then they took hold of hands again and ran. They were afraid not only of the peril, but of the mysterious help that had come to them. Soon they had to stop again, and immediately the sound of the voice reached them. Straight ahead, straight ahead, it said. This leading continued for about half an hour. By that time they had reached Leunga Point, where they left the ice and waded to shore. They were still terribly frightened, even though they were on firm land. They did not stop to look back at the lake, where the waves were pitching the ice floes faster and faster, but ran on. When they'd gone a short distance along the point, Oza paused suddenly. Wait here, little Mats, she said. I've forgotten something. Osa the goose girl went down to the strand again, where she stopped to rummage in her bag. Finally, she fished out a little wooden shoe, which she placed on a stone where it could be plainly seen. Then she ran to little Mats, without once looking back. But the instant her back was turned, a big white goose shot down from the sky like a streak of lightning, snatched the wooden shoe, 
and flew away with it. Chapter 25 Thumbietot and the Bears The Ironworks Thursday, April 28th When the wild geese and Thumbietot had helped Osa the goose girl and little mats across the ice, they flew into Westmanland, where they alighted in a grain field to feed and rest. A strong west wind blew almost the entire day on which the wild geese travelled over the mining districts, and as soon as they attempted to direct their course northward, they were buffeted toward the east. Now, Akka thought that Smurf Fox was at large in the eastern part of the province, therefore she would not fly in that direction, but turned back time and time again, struggling westward with great difficulty. At this rate, the wild geese advanced very slowly, and late in the afternoon they were still in the Westmanland mining districts. Toward evening, the wind abated suddenly, and the tired travellers hoped that they would have an interval of easy flight before sundown. Then along came a violent gust of wind, which tossed the geese before it like balls, and the boy, who was sitting comfortably with no thought of peril, was lifted from the goose's back and hurled into space. Little and light as he was, he could not fall straight to the ground in such a wind, so at first he was carried along with it, drifting down slowly and spasmodically, as a leaf falls from a tree. "'Why, this isn't so bad!' thought the boy as he fell. I'm tumbling as easily as if I were only a scrap of paper. Morton Goosey Gander will doubtless hurry along and pick me up. The first thing the boy did when he landed was to tear off his cap and wave it so that the big white gander should see where he was. Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? He called and was rather surprised that Morton Goosey Gander was not already at his side. But the big white gander was not to be seen, nor was the wild goose flock outlined against the sky. It had entirely disappeared. He thought this rather singular, but he was neither worried nor frightened. Not for a second did it occur to him that folk like Akka and Morton Goosey Gander would abandon him. The unexpected gust of wind had probably borne them along with it. As soon as they could manage to turn, they would surely come back and fetch him. But what was this? Where on earth was he anyway? He had been standing, gazing toward the sky for some sign of the geese, but now he happened to glance about him. He had not come down on even ground, but had dropped into a deep, wide mountain cave, or whatever it might be. It was as large as a church, with almost perpendicular walls on all four sides, and with no roof at all. On the ground were some huge rocks, between which moss and lignan brush and dwarfed birches grew. Here and there, in the wall, were projections from which swung rickety ladders. At one side there was a dark passage which, apparently, led far into the mountain. The boy had not been travelling over the mining districts a whole day for nothing. He comprehended at once that the big cleft had been made by the men who had mined ore in this place. "'I must try and climb back to earth again,' he thought. "'Otherwise I fear that my companions won't find me.' He was about to go over to the wall, when someone seized him from behind, and he heard a gruff voice growl in his ear, "'Who are you?' The boy turned quickly, and in the confusion of the moment he thought he was facing a huge rock covered with brownish moss. Then he noticed that the rock had broad paws to walk with, a head, two eyes, and a growling mouth. He could not pull himself together to answer, nor did the big beast appear to expect it of him, for it knocked him down rolled him back and forth with its paws and nosed him. It seemed just about ready to swallow him when it changed its mind and called, Bram and Mull, come here, you cubs, and you shall have something good to eat. A pair of frowsy cubs, as uncertain on their feet and as woolly as puppies, came tumbling along. What have you got, Mama Bear? May we see? Oh, may we see? shrieked the cubs excitedly. Oh, so I've fallen in with bears, thought the boy to himself. Now Smile Fox won't have to trouble himself further to chase after me. The mother bear pushed the boy along to the cubs. One of them nabbed him quickly and ran off with him, but he did not bite hard. He was playful and wanted to amuse himself a while with Thumbietot before eating him. The other cub was after the first one to snatch the boy for himself, and as he lumbered along he managed to tumble straight down on the head of the one that carried the boy, so the two cubs rolled over each other, biting, clawing and snarling. During the tussle, the boy got loose, ran over to the wall and started to scale it. Then both cubs scurried after him, and nimbly scaling the cliff, they caught up with him and tossed him down on the moss like a ball. 
Now I know how a poor little mousy fares when it falls into the cat's claws, thought the boy. He made several attempts to get away. He ran deep down into the old tunnel and hid behind the rocks and climbed the birches, but the cubs hunted him out, go where he would. The instant they caught him, they let him go, so that he could run away again and they should have the fun of recapturing him. At last the boy got so sick and tired of it all that he threw himself down on the ground. Run away, growled the cubs, or we'll eat you up. You'll have to eat me then, said the boy, for I can't run any more. Immediately both cubs rushed over to the mother bear and complained, Mama bear, a oh, mama bear, he won't play any more. Then you must divide him evenly between you, said mother bear. When the boy heard this, he was so scared that he jumped up instantly and began playing again. As it was bedtime, Mother Bear called to the cubs that they must now come and cuddle up to her and go to sleep. They had been having such a good time that they wished to continue their play next day, so they took the boy between them and laid their paws over him. They did not want him to move without waking them. They went to sleep immediately. The boy thought that after a while he would try to steal away, but never in all his life had he been so tumbled and tossed and hunted and rolled, and he was so tired out that he too fell asleep. By and by, Father Bear came clambering down the mountain wall. The boy was wakened by his tearing away stone and gravel as he swung himself into the old mine. The boy was afraid to move much, but he managed to stretch himself and turn over so that he could see the big bear. He was a frightfully coarse, huge old beast with great paws, large glistening tusks and wicked little eyes. The boy could not help shuddering as he looked at this old monarch of the forest. It smells like a human being round here, said Father Bear the instant he came up to Mother Bear, and his growl was as the rolling of thunder. How can you imagine anything so absurd, said Mother Bear, without disturbing herself. It has been settled for good and all that we are not to harm mankind any more. But if one of them were to put in an appearance here, where the cubs and I have our quarters, there wouldn't be enough left of him for you to even catch a scent of him. Father Bear lay down beside Mother Bear. You ought to know me well enough to understand that I don't allow anything dangerous to come near the cubs. Talk instead uh, of what you've been doing. I haven't seen you for a whole week. I've been looking out for a new residence, said Father Bear. First I went over to Vermland to learn from our kinsmen at Exerod how they fared in that country. But I had my trouble for nothing. There wasn't a bear's den left in the whole forest. I believe the humans want the whole earth to themselves, said Mother Bear. Even if we leave people and cattle in peace and live solely upon lignin and insects and green things, we cannot remain unmolested in the forest. I wonder where we could move to in order to live in peace. We've lived comfortably for many years in this pit, observed Father Bear. But I can't be content here now since the big noise shop has been built right in our neighbourhood. Lately I've been taking a look at the land east of Dow River over by Garpen Mountain. Old mine pits are plentiful there too, and other fine retreats. I thought it looked as if one might be fairly protected against men. The instant Father Bear said this, he sat up and began to sniff. It's extraordinary that whenever I speak of human beings, I'll catch that queer scent again, he remarked. Go and see for yourself if you don't believe me, challenged Mother Bear. I should just like to know where a human being could hide down here. The bear walked all around the cave and nosed. Finally, he went back and lay down without a word. What did I tell you, said Mother Bear, that of course you think that no one but yourself has any nose or ears. One can't be too careful with such neighbours as we have, said Father Bear gently. Then he leapt up with a roar. As luck would have it, one of the cubs had moved a paw over to Nils Holgersen's face, and the poor little wretch could not breathe, but began to sneeze. It was impossible for Mother Bear to keep Father Bear back any longer. He pushed the young ones to right and left, and caught sight of the boy before he had time to sit up. He would have swallowed him instantly if Mother Bear had not cast herself between them. Don't touch him! He belongs to the cubs, she said. They have had such fun with him the whole evening they couldn't bear to eat him up, but wanted to save him until morning. Father Bear pushed Mother Bear aside. Don't meddle with what you don't understand, he roared. Can't you scent that human odour about him from afar? I shall eat him at once, or he will play us some mean trick. 
he opened his jaws again. But meanwhile, the boy had had time to think, and quick as a flash, he dug into his knapsack and brought forth some matches, his sole weapon of defence, struck one on his leather breeches and stuck the burning match into the bear's open mouth. Father Bear snorted when he smelled the sulphur, and with that the flame went out. The boy was ready with another match, but curiously enough, Father Bear did not repeat his attack. "'Can you light many of those little blue roses?' asked Father Bear. "'I can light enough to put an end to the whole forest,' replied the boy, for he thought that in this way he might be able to scare Father Bear. "'Oh, that would be no trick for me,' boasted the boy, hoping that this would make the bear respect him. "'Good!' exclaimed the bear. "'You shall render me a service. Now I'm very glad that I did not eat you.' Father Bear carefully took the boy between his tusks and climbed up from the pit. He did this with remarkable ease and agility, considering that he was so big and heavy. As soon as he was up, he speedily made for the woods. It was evident that Father Bear was created to squeeze through dense forests. The heavy body pushed through the brushwood as a boat does through water. Father Bear ran along till he came to a hill at the skirt of the forest, where he could see the big noise shop. Here he lay down and placed the boy in front of him, holding him securely between his forepaws. "'Now, look down at that big noise shop,' he commanded. The great ironworks, with many tall buildings, stood at the edge of a waterfall. High chimneys sent forth dark clouds of smoke. Blasting furnaces were in full blaze, and light shone from all the windows and apertures. Within, hammers and rolling mills were going with such force that the air rang with their clatter and boom. All around the workshops proper were immense coal sheds, great slag heaps, warehouses, wood piles, and tool sheds. Just beyond were long rows of working men's homes, pretty villas, schoolhouses, assembly halls, and shops. But there all was quiet, and apparently everybody. But there all was quiet, and apparently everybody was asleep. The boy did not glance in that direction, but gazed intently at the ironworks. The earth around them was black, the sky above them was like a great fiery dome, the rapids, white with foam, rushed by, while the buildings themselves were sending out light and smoke, fire and sparks. It was the grandest sight the boy had ever seen. "'Surely you don't mean to say you can set fire to a place like that?' remarked the bear, doubtingly. The boy stood wedged between the beast's paws, thinking— the only thing that might save him would be that the bear should have a high opinion of his capability and power. "'It's all the same to me,' he answered with a superior air. "'Big or little, I can burn it down.' "'Then I'll tell you something,' said Father Bear. "'My forefathers lived in this region from the time that the forest first sprang up. From them I inherited hunting grounds and pastures, lairs and retreats, and have lived here in peace all my life.' In the beginning I wasn't troubled much by the human kind. They dug in the mountains and picked up a little ore. Down here, by the rapids, they had a forge and a furnace, but the hammers sounded only a few hours during the day, and the furnace was not fired more than two moons at a stretch. It wasn't so bad but that I could stand it, but these last years, since they've built this noise shop, which keeps up the same racket both day and night, life here has become intolerable. Formerly only a manager and a couple of blacksmiths lived here, but now there are so many people that I can never feel safe from them. I thought that I should have to move away, but I have discovered something better. The boy wondered what Father Bear had hit upon, but no opportunity was afforded him to ask, as the bear took him between his tusks again and lumbered down the hill. The boy could see nothing, but knew by the increasing noise that they were approaching the rolling mills. Father Bear was well informed regarding the ironworks. He had prowled around there on many a dark night, had observed what went on within, and had wondered if there would never be any cessation of the work. He had tested the walls with his paws, and wished that he were only strong enough to knock down the whole structure with a single blow. He was not easily distinguishable against the dark ground, and when, in addition, he remained in the shadow of the walls, there was not much danger of his being discovered. Now he walked fearlessly between the workshops and climbed to the top of a slag heap. There he sat up on his haunches, took the boy between his forepaws, and held him up. "'Try to look into the house,' he commanded. 
A strong current of air was forced into a big cylinder, which was suspended from the ceiling and filled with molten iron. As this current rushed into the mess of iron with an awful roar, showers of sparks of all colours spurted up in bunches, in sprays, in long clusters. They struck against the wall and came splashing down over the whole big room. Father Bear let the boy watch the gorgeous spectacle until the blowing was over and the flowing and sparkling red steel had been poured into ingot moulds. The boy was completely charmed by the marvellous display and almost forgot that he was imprisoned between a bear's two paws. Father Bear let him look into the rolling mill. He saw a workman take a short, thick bar of iron at white heat from a furnace, opening and place it under a roller. When the iron came out from under the roller, it was flattened and extended. Immediately, another workman seized it and placed it beneath a heavier roller, which made it still longer and thinner. And thus it was passed from roller to roller, squeezed and drawn out until, finally, it curled along the floor like a long red thread. But while the first bar of iron was being pressed, a second was taken from the furnace and placed under the rollers, and when this was a little along, a third was brought. Continuously fresh threads came crawling over the floor like hissing snakes. The boy was dazzled by the iron, but he found it more splendid to watch the workmen who dexterously and delicately seized the glowing snakes with their tongs and forced them under the rollers. It seemed like play for them to handle the hissing iron. I call that real man's work, the boy remarked to himself. The bear then let the boy have a peep at the furnace and the forge, and he became more and more astonished as he saw how the blacksmiths handled iron and fire. Those men have no fear of heat and flames, he thought. The workmen were sooty and grimy. He fancied they were some sort of fire folk. That was why they could bend and mould the iron as they wished. He could not believe that they were just ordinary men, since they had such power. They keep this up day after day, night after night, said Father Bear, as he dropped wearily down on the ground. You understand that one gets rather tired of that kind of thing. I'm mighty glad that at last I can put an end to it. Indeed, said the boy. How will you go about it? Oh, I thought that you were going to set fire to the buildings, said Father Bear. That would put an end to all this work, and I could remain in my old home. The boy was all of a shiver. So it was for this that Father Bear had brought him here. If you will set fire to the noise works, I'll promise to spare your life said Father Bear, but if you don't do it, I'll make short work of you. The huge workshops were built of brick, and the boy was thinking to himself that Father Bear could command as much as he liked. It was impossible to obey him. And presently he saw that it might not be impossible after all. Just beyond them lay a pile of chips and shavings to which he could easily set fire, and beside it was a wood pile that almost reached the coal shed. The coal shed extended over to the workshops, and if that once caught fire, the flames would soon fly over to the roof of the iron foundry. Everything combustible would burn, the walls would fall from heat, and the machinery would be destroyed. Will you, or won't you? demanded Father Bear. The boy knew that he ought to answer promptly that he would not, but he also knew that then the bear's paws would squeeze him to death. Therefore, he replied, I shall have to think it over. Very well, do so, assented Father Bear. Let me say to you that iron is the thing that has given men the advantage over us bears, which is another reason for my wishing to put an end to the work here. The boy thought he would use the delay to figure out some plan of escape, but he was so worried he could not direct his thoughts where he would. Instead, he began to think of the great help that iron had been to mankind. They needed iron for everything. There was iron in the plough that broke up the field, in the axe that felled the tree for building houses, in the scythe that mowed the grain, and in the knife, which could be turned to all sorts of uses. There was iron in the horse's bit, in the lock on the door, in the nails that held furniture together, in the sheathing that covered the roof, the rifle which drove away wild beasts was made of iron, also the pick that had broken up the mine. Iron covered the men of war he had seen in Karls Krona. The locomotive steamed through the country on iron rails. The needle that had stitched his coat was of iron. The shears that clipped the sheep and the kettle that cooked the food. Big 
and little alike much that was indispensable was made from iron. Father Bear was perfectly right in saying that it was the iron that gave men their mastery over the bears. Now, will you or won't you? Father Bear repeated. The boy was startled from his musing. Here he stood thinking of matters that were entirely unnecessary and had not yet found a way to save himself. You mustn't be so impatient, he said. This is a serious matter for me and I've got to have time to consider. Well, then, consider another moment, said Father Bear. But let me tell you that it's because of the iron that men have become so much wiser than we bears. For this alone, if for nothing else, I should like to put a stop to the work here. Again, the boy endeavoured to think out a plan of escape, but his thoughts wandered willy-nilly. They were taken up with the iron, and gradually he began to comprehend how much thinking and calculating men must have done before they discovered how to produce iron from ore, and he seemed to see sooty blacksmiths of old bending over the forge, pondering how they should properly handle it. Perhaps it was because they had thought so much about the iron that intelligence had been developed in mankind, until finally they became so advanced they were able to build great works like these. The fact was that men owed more to the iron than they themselves knew. Well, what say you? Will you or won't you? insisted Father Bear. The boy shrank back. Here he stood, thinking needless thoughts, and had no idea as to what he should do to save himself. It's not such an easy matter to decide as you think, he answered. You must give me time for reflection. I can wait for you a little longer, said Father Bear, but after that you'll get no more, Grace. You must know that it's the fault of the iron that the humankind can live here on the property of the bears. And now you understand why I would be rid of the work. The boy meant to use the last moment to think out some way to save himself, but, anxious and distraught as he was, his thoughts wandered again. And now he began thinking of all that he'd seen when he flew over the mining districts. It was strange that there should be so much life and activity and so much work back there in the wilderness. Just think how poor and desolate this place would be had there been no iron here. This very foundry gave employment to many and had gathered round it many homes filled with people who in turn had attracted hither railways and telegraph wires and come come growled the bear will you or won't you the boy swept his hand across his forehead no plan of escape had as yet come to his mind but this much he knew he did not wish to do any harm to the iron, which was so useful to rich and poor alike, and which gave bread to so many people in this land. I won't, he said. Father Bear squeezed him a little harder, but said nothing. You will not get me to destroy the ironworks, defied the boy. The iron is so great a blessing that it will never do to harm it. Then, of course, you don't expect to be allowed to live very long, said the bear. No, I don't expect it returned the boy, looking the bear straight in the eye. Father Bear gripped him still harder. It hurt so that the boy could not keep the tears back, but he did not cry out or say a word. Very well, then, said Father Bear, raising his paw very slowly, hoping that the boy would give in at the last moment. But just then the boy heard something click very close to them and saw the muzzle of a rifle two paces away. Both he and Father Bear had been so engrossed in their own affairs, they had not observed that a man had stolen right upon them. Oh, Father Bear, don't you hear the clicking of a trigger? cried the boy. Run, or you'll be shot! Father Bear grew terribly hurried. However, he allowed himself time enough to pick up the boy and carry him along. As he ran, a couple of shots sounded and the bullets grazed his ears, but luckily he escaped. The boy thought as he was dangling from the bear's mouth, that never had he been so stupid as he was tonight. If he had only kept still, the bear would have been shot, and he himself would have been freed. But he had become so accustomed to helping the animals that he did it naturally, and as a matter of course. When Father Bear had run some distance into the woods, he paused and set the boy down on the ground. 
"'Thank you, little one,' he said. "'I dare say those bullets would have caught me "'if you hadn't been there. "'And now I want to do you a service in return. "'If you should ever meet with another bear, "'just say to him this, which I shall whisper to you, "'and he won't touch you.' "'Father Bear whispered a word or two into the boy's ear "'and hurried away, "'for he thought he heard hounds and hunters pursuing him. The boy stood in the forest, free and unharmed, and could hardly understand how it was possible. The wild geese had been flying back and forth the whole evening, peering and calling, but they had been unable to find Thumbietot. They searched long after the sun had set, and finally, when it had grown so dark that they were forced to alight somewhere for the night, they were very downhearted. There was not one among them but thought the boy had been killed by the fall and was laying dead in the forest where they could not see him. But the next morning, when the sun peeped over the hills and awakened the wild geese, the boy lay sleeping, as usual, in their midst. When he woke and heard them shrieking and cackling their astonishment, he could not help laughing. They were so eager to know what had happened to him that they did not care to go to breakfast until he had told them the whole story. The boy soon narrated his entire adventure with the bears, but after that he seemed reluctant to continue. "'How I got back to you, perhaps, you already know,' he said. "'No, we know nothing. We thought you were killed.' "'That's curious,' remarked the boy. "'Oh, yes, when Father Bear left me, I climbed up into a pine and fell asleep. At daybreak I was awakened by an eagle hovering over me. He picked me up with his talons and carried me away. He didn't hurt me, but flew straight here to you and dropped me down among you.' "'Didn't he tell you who he was?' asked the big white gander. He was gone before I had time to even thank him. I thought the mother Akka had sent him after me. How extraordinary, exclaimed the white goosey gander. But are you certain that it was an eagle? I'd never before seen an eagle, said the boy, but he was so big and splendid that I can't give him a lowlier name. Morton goosey gander turned to the wild geese to hear what they thought of this. But they stood gazing into the air as though they were thinking of something else. We must not forget entirely to eat breakfast today, said Akka, quickly spreading her wings. Chapter 26 The Flood Part 1 The Swans May 1st to 4th There was a terrible storm raging in the district north of Lake Malar, which lasted several days. The sky was a dull grey, the wind whistled and the rain beat. Both people and animals knew the spring could not be ushered in with anything short of this. Nevertheless, they thought it unbearable. After it had been raining for a whole day, the snowdrifts in the pine forests began to melt in earnest, and the spring brooks grew lively. All the pools on the farms, the standing water in the ditches, the water that oozed between the tufts in marshes and swamps, all were in motion and tried to find their way to creeks, that they might be borne along to the sea. The creeks rushed as fast as possible down to the rivers, and the rivers did their utmost to carry the water to Lake Malar. All the lakes and rivers in Upland and the mining district quickly threw off their ice covers on one and the same day, so that the creeks filled with ice flows, which rose clear up to their banks. Swollen as they were, they emptied into Lake Malar, and it was not long before the lake had taken in as much water as it could well hold. Down by the outlet was a raging torrent. Nordstrom is a narrow channel, and it could not let out the water quickly enough. Besides, there was a strong easterly wind that lashed against the land, obstructing the stream when it tried to carry the fresh water into the East Sea. Since the rivers kept running to Malaren, with more water than it could dispose of, there was nothing for the big lake to do but overflow its banks. It rose very slowly, as if reluctant to injure its beautiful shores, but as they were mostly low and gradually sloping, it was not long before the water had flooded several acres of land, and there was enough to create the greatest alarm. Lake Malar is unique in its way, being made up of a succession of narrow fjords, bays and inlets. In no place does it spread into a storm centre, but seems to have been created only for pleasure trips, yachting tours and fishing. Nowhere does it present barren, desolate, windswept shores. It looks as if it never thought that its shores could hold anything but country seats, summer villas, manors and amusement resorts. 
but because it usually presents a very agreeable and friendly appearance, there is all the more havoc whenever it happens to drop its smiling expression in the spring and show that it can be serious. At that critical time, Smurf Fox happened to come sneaking through a birch grove just north of Lake Malar. As usual, he was thinking of Thumbietot and the wild geese, and wondering how he should ever find them again, he had lost all track of them. As he stole cautiously along, more discouraged than usual, he caught sight of Agar, the carrier pigeon, who had perched herself on a birch branch. "'My, but I'm in luck to run across you, Agar!' exclaimed Smur. "'Maybe you can tell me where Akka from Kebna Kays and her flock hold forth nowadays.' "'It's quite possible that I know where they are,' Agar hinted. "'But I'm not likely to tell you.' "'Please yourself,' retorted Smur. "'Nevertheless, you can take a message that I have for them. "'You probably know the present condition of Lake Malar. "'There's a great overflow down there, "'and all the swans who live in Chelster Bay "'are about to see their nests, with all their eggs, destroyed.' Daylight, the Swan King, has heard of the midget who travels with the wild geese and knows a remedy for every ill. He has sent me to ask Akka if she will bring Thumbietot down to Hjalster Bay. I dare say I can convey your message, Agar replied, but I can't understand how the little boy will be able to help with the swans. Nor do I, said Smur, but he can do almost everything, it seems. "'Quite surprising to me that Daylight should friend his messages by a fox,' Agar remarked. "'Well, we're not exactly what you'd call good friends,' said Smur smoothly. "'But in an emergency like this, we must help one another. "'Perhaps it would be just as well not to tell Akka that you got the message from a fox. "'Between you and me, she's inclined to be a little suspicious.' The safest refuge for waterfowl in the whole Mallard district is Helster Bay. It has low shores, shallow water, and is also covered with reeds. It is by no means as large as Lake Tukern, but nevertheless, Helster is a good retreat for birds, since it has long been forbidden territory to hunters. It is the home of a great many swans, and the owner of the old castle nearby has prohibited all shooting on the bay, so that they might be unmolested. As soon as Akka received word that the swans needed her help, she hastened down to Hjalster Bay. She arrived with a flock one evening and saw at a glance that there had been a great disaster. The big swans' nests had been torn away, and the strong wind was driving them down to the bay. Some had already fallen apart, two or three had capsized, and the eggs lay at the bottom of the lake. When Akka alighted on the bay, all the swans living there were gathered near the eastern shore, where they were protected from the wind. Although they had suffered much by the flood, they were too proud to let anyone see it. "'It is useless to cry,' they said. "'There are plenty of root fibres and stems here. We can soon build new nests.' None had thought of asking a stranger to help them, and the swans had no idea that Smur Fox had sent for the wild geese. There were several hundred swans resting on the water. They had placed themselves according to rank and station. The young and inexperienced were farthest out, and the old and wise nearer the middle of the group, and right in the centre sat Daylight, the Swan King, and Snow White, the Swan Queen, who were older than any of the others, and regarded the rest of the swans as their children. The geese alighted on the west shore of the bay, but when Akka saw where the swans were, she swam toward them at once. She was very much surprised at their having sent for her, but she regarded it as an honour and did not wish to lose a moment in coming to their aid. As Akka approached the swans, she paused to see if the geese who followed her swam in a straight line and at even distances apart. "'Now swim along quickly!' she ordered. Don't stare at the swans, as if you have never before seen anything beautiful, and don't mind what they may say to you. This was not the first time that Akka had called on the aristocratic swans. They had always received her in a manner befitting a great traveller like herself. But still, she did not like the idea of swimming in among them. She never felt so grey and insignificant as when she happened upon swans. One or another of them was sure to drop a remark about common grey feathers and poor folk, but it is always best to take no notice of such things. This time everything passed off uncommonly well. 
the swans politely made way for the wild geese, who swam forward through a kind of passageway which formed an avenue bordered by shimmering white birds. It was a beautiful sight to watch them as they spread their wings like sails to appear well before the strangers. They refrained from making comments, which rather surprised Akka. Evidently, Daylight had noted their misbehaviour in the past and had told the swans that they must conduct themselves in a proper manner, so thought the leader goose. But just as the swans were making an effort to observe the rules of etiquette, they caught sight of the goosey gander, who swam last in the long goose line. Then there was a murmur of disapproval, even of threats among the swans, and at once there was an end to their good deportment. "'What's this?' shrieked one. "'Do the wild geese intend to dress up in white feathers?' "'They needn't think that we will make swans of them,' cried another. They began shrieking, one louder than another, in their strong, resonant voices. It was impossible to explain that a tame goosey gander had come with the wild geese. "'It must be the goose king himself come along,' they said tauntingly. "'There's no limit to their audacity. "'That's no goose, it's only a tame duck.' The big white gander remembered Akka's admonition to pay no attention, no matter what he might hear. He kept quiet and swam ahead as fast he could, but it did no good. The swans became more and more impertinent. "'What kind of a frog does he carry on his back?' asked one. "'They must think we don't see it's a frog because it is dressed like a human being.' The swans, who but a moment before had been resting in such perfect order, now swam up and down excitedly, all tried to crowd forward to get a glimpse of the white wild goose. "'That white goosey gander ought to be ashamed to come here and parade before swans. He is probably as grey as the rest of them. He has only been in a flower barrel at some farmhouse.' Akka had just come up to daylight and was about to ask him what kind of help he wanted of her, when the swan king noticed the uproar among the swans. "'What do I see? Haven't I taught you to be polite to strangers?' he said with a frown. Snow White, the swan queen, swam out to restore order among her subjects, and again daylight returned to Akka. Presently Snow White came back, appearing greatly agitated. "'Can't you keep them quiet?' shouted daylight. "'There's a white wild goose over there!' answered Snow White. Is it not shameful? I don't wonder they are furious. A white wild goose, scoffed Daylight. That's too ridiculous. There can't be such a thing. You must be mistaken. The crowds around Morton Goosey Gander grew larger and larger. Akka and the other wild geese tried to swim over to him, but were jostled hither and thither and could not get to him. The old Swan King, who was the strongest among them, swam off quickly pushed all the others aside and made his way over to the big white gander. But when he saw that there really was a white goose on the water, he was just as indignant as the rest. He hissed with rage, flew straight at Morton Goosey Gander and tore out a few feathers. "'I'll teach you a lesson, wild goose!' he shrieked, "'so that you'll not come again to the swans, stoked out in this way!' "'Fly, Morton Goosey Gander, fly, fly!' cried Akka for she knew that otherwise the swans would pull out every feather the goosey gander had. "'Fly! Fly!' screamed Thumbietot too. But the goosey gander was so hedged in by the swans that he had not room enough to spread his wings. All around him the swans stretched their long necks, opened their strong bills, and plucked his feathers. Morton, goosey gander, defended himself as best he could by striking and biting. The wild geese also began to fight the swans. It was obvious how this would have ended had the geese not received help quite unexpectedly. A redtail noticed that they were being roughly treated by the swans. Instantly he cried out the shrill call the little birds use when they need help to drive off a hawk or a falcon. Three calls had barely sounded when all the little birds in the vicinity came shooting down to Hjalster Bay as if on wings of lightning. These delicate little creatures swooped down upon the swans, screeched in their ears, and obstructed their view with the flutter of their tiny wings. They made them dizzy with their fluttering and drove them to distraction with their cries of shame, shame swans. The attack of the small birds lasted but a moment. When they were gone and the swans came to their senses, they saw that the geese had risen and flown over to the other end of the bay. Part 2 The New Watchdog There was this, at least, to be said in the swan's favour. 
When they saw that the wild geese had escaped, they were too proud to chase them. Moreover, the geese could stand on a clump of reeds with perfect composure and sleep. Nils Holgersen was too hungry to sleep. It is necessary for me to get something to eat, he said. At that time, when all kinds of things were floating on the water, it was not difficult for a little boy like Nils Holgersen to find a craft. He did not stop to deliberate, but hopped down on a stump that had drifted in amongst the reeds. Then he picked up a little stick and began to pole towards shore. Just as he was landing, he heard a splash in the water. He stopped short. First he saw a lady swan asleep in her big nest quite close to him. Then he noticed that a fox had taken a few steps into the water and was sneaking up to the swan's nest. Hi, 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 get up, get up, cried the boy, beating the water with his stick. The lady swan rose, but not so quickly, but that the fox could have pounced upon her had he cared to. However, he refrained and instead hurried straight toward the boy. Thumbietot saw the fox coming and ran for his life. Wide stretches of meadow land spread before him. He saw no tree that he could climb, no hole where he might hide. He just had to keep running. The boy was a good runner, but it stands to reason that he could not race with a fox. Not far from the bay, there were a number of little cabins with candle lights shining through the windows. Naturally, the boy ran in that direction, but he realised that long before he could reach the nearest cabin, the fox would catch up to him. Once the fox was so close that it looked as if the boy would surely be his prey, but Nils quickly sprang aside and turned back toward the bay. By that move, the fox lost time, and before he could reach the boy, the latter had run up to two men who were on their way home from work. The men were tired and sleepy. They had noticed neither boy nor fox, although both had been running right in front of them. Nor did the boy ask help of the men. He was content to walk close beside them. Surely the fox won't venture to come up to the men, he thought. But presently the fox came pattering along. He probably counted on the men taking him for a dog, for he went straight up to them. Whose dog can that be sneaking around here? queried one. He looks as though he were ready to bite. The other paused and glanced back. Go along with you, he said, and gave the fox a kick that sent it to the opposite side of the road. What are you doing here? After that, the fox kept at a safe distance, but followed all the while. Presently, the men reached a cabin and entered it. The boy intended to go in with them, but when he got to the stoop, he saw a big, shaggy watchdog rush out from his kennel to greet his master. Suddenly, the boy changed his mind and remained out in the open. Listen, watchdog, whispered the boy as soon as the men had shut the door. I wonder if you'd like to help me catch a fox tonight. The dog had poor eyesight and had become irritable and cranky from being changed. What? I catch a fox? He barked angrily. Who are you that makes fun of me? You just come within my region. I'll teach you not to fool with me. You needn't think that I'm afraid to come near you, said the boy, running up to the dog. When the dog saw him, he was so astonished that he could not speak. I'm the one they call Thumbietot, who travels with the wild geese, said the boy, introducing himself. Haven't you heard of me? I believe the sparrows have twittered a little about you, the dog returned. They say you've done wonderful things for one of your size. I've been rather lucky up to present, admitted the boy. But now it's all up with me unless you help me. There's a fox at my heels. He's laying in wait for me round the corner. Don't you suppose I can smell him, retorted the dog. But we'll soon be rid of him. With that, the dog sprang as far as the chain would allow, barking and growling for ever so long. Now I don't think he will show his face again tonight, said the dog. It will take something besides a fine bark to scare the fox, the boy remarked. He'll soon be here again, and that is precisely what I wish, for I've set my heart on your catching him. Are you poking fun at me now? asked the dog. Only come with me into your kennel, and I'll tell you what to do. The boy and the watchdog crept into the kennel and crouched there, whispering. By and by, the fox stuck his nose out from his hiding place. When all was quiet, he crept along cautiously. He scented the boy all the way to the kennel, but halted at a safe distance and sat down to think of some way to coax him out. Suddenly, the watchdog poked his head out and growled at him. Go away, or I'll catch you. I'll sit here as long as I please for all of you defied the fox. Go away, repeated the fox threateningly, or there will be no more hunting for you after tonight. But the fox only grinned and did not move an inch. 
I know how far your chain can reach, he said. I have warned you twice, said the dog, coming out from his kennel, and now blame yourself. With that, the dog sprang at the fox and caught him without the least effort, for he was loose, and the boy had unbuckled his collar. There was a hot struggle, but it was soon over. The dog was the victor. The fox lay on the ground and dared not move. Don't stir, or I'll kill you, snarled the dog. Then he took the fox by the scruff of the neck and dragged him to the kennel. There the boy was ready with the chain. He placed the dog collar around the neck of the fox, tightening it so that he was securely chained. During all this the fox had to lie still, for he was afraid to move. Now, Smurf Fox, I hope you'll make a good watchdog, laughed the boy when he'd finished. Chapter 27 Dunfin Part 1 The City That Floats on the Water Friday, May 6th No one could be more gentle and kind than the little grey goose Dunfin. All the wild geese loved her, and the tame white goosey gander would have died for her. When Dunfin asked for anything, not even Acker could say no. As soon as Dunfin came to Lake Malar, the landscape looked familiar to her. Just beyond the lake lay the sea, with many wooded islands, and there, on a little islet, lived her parents and her brothers and sisters. She begged the wild geese to fly to her home before travelling farther north, that she might let her family see that she was still alive. It would be such a joy to them. Acker frankly declared that she thought Dunfin's parents and brothers and sisters had shown no great love for her when they abandoned her at Oland, but Dunfin would not admit that Acker was in the right. What else was there to do when they saw that I could not fly? She protested. Surely they couldn't remain at Oland on my account. Dunfin began telling the wild geese all about her home in the archipelago to try to induce them to make the trip. Her family lived on a rock island. Seen from a distance, there appeared to be nothing but stone there, but when one came closer, there were to be found the choicest goose tidbits in clefts and hollows, and one might search long for better nesting places than those that were hidden in the mountain crevices or among the osier bushes. But the best of all was the old fisherman who lived there. Dunfin had heard that in his youth he had been a great shot and had always lain in the offing and hunted birds. But now, in his old age, since his wife had died and the children had gone from home so that he was alone in the hut, he had begun to care for the birds on his island. He never fired a shot at them, nor would he permit others to do so. He walked around amongst the birds' nests, and when the mother birds were sitting, he brought them food. Not they all loved him. Dunfin had been in his hut many times, and he had fed her with breadcrumbs. Because he was kind to the birds, they flocked to his island in such great numbers that it was becoming overcrowded. If one happened to arrive a little late in the spring, all the nesting places were occupied. That was why Dunfin's family had been obliged to leave her. Dunfin begged so hard that she finally had her way, although the wild geese felt that they were losing time and really should be going straight north. But a little trip like this to the cliff island would not delay them more than a day. So they started off one morning after fortifying themselves with a good breakfast and flew eastward over Lake Malar. The boy did not know for certain where they were going, but he noticed that the farther east they flew, the livelier it was on the lake, and the more built up were the shores. Heavily freighted barges and sloops, boats and fishing smacks were on their way east, and these were met and passed by many pretty white steamers. Along the shores ran country roads and railway tracks, all in the same direction. There was some place beyond in the east where all wished to go in the morning. On one of the islands the boy saw a big white castle, and to the east of it the shores were dotted with villas. At the start these lay far apart, then they became closer and closer, and presently the whole shore was lined with them. They were of every variety, here a castle, there a cottage, then a low manor house appeared, or a mansion with many small towers. Some stood in gardens, but most of them were in the wild woods which bordered the shores. Despite their dissimilarity, they had one point of resemblance. They were not plain and sombre-looking, like other buildings, but were gaudily painted in striking greens and blues, reds and whites, like children's playhouses. As the boy sat on the goose's back and glanced down at the curious shore mansions, 
Dunfin cried out with delight. Now I know where I am. Over there lies the city that floats on the water. The boy looked ahead. At first he saw nothing but some light clouds and mists rolling forward over the water. But soon he caught sight of some tall spires, and then one and another house with many rows of windows. They appeared and disappeared, rolling hither and thither. But not a strip of shore did he see. Everything over there appeared to be resting on the water. Nearer to the city he saw no more pretty playhouses along the shores, only dingy factories. Great heaps of coal and wood were stacked behind tall planks, and alongside black, sooty docks lay bulky freight steamers. But over all was spread a shimmering, transparent mist, which made everything appear so big and strong and wonderful that it was almost beautiful. The wild geese flew past factories and freight steamers and were nearing the cloud-enveloped spires. Suddenly, all the mists sank to the water, save the thin fleecy ones that circled above their heads, beautifully tinted in blues and pinks. The other clouds rolled over water and land. They entirely obscured the lower portions of the houses. Only the upper stories of the roofs and gables were visible. Some of the buildings appeared to be as high as the Tower of Babel. The boy no doubt knew that they were built upon hills and mountains, but these he did not see only the houses that seemed to float among the white, drifting clouds. In reality, the buildings were dark and dingy, for the sun in the east was not shining on them. The boy knew that he was riding above a large city, for he saw spires and house roofs rising from the clouds in every direction. Sometimes an opening was made in the circling mists, and he looked down into a running, tortuous stream, but no land could he see. All this was beautiful to look upon, but he felt quite distraught, as one does when happening upon something one cannot understand. When he had gone beyond the city, he found that the ground was no longer hidden by clouds, but that shores, streams and islands were again plainly visible. He turned to see the city better, but could not, for now it looked quite enchanted. The mists had taken on colour from the sunshine and were rolling forward in the most brilliant reds, blues and yellows. The houses were white, as if built of light, and the windows and spires sparkled like fire. All things floated on the water, as before. The geese were travelling straight east. They flew over factories and workshops, then over mansions edging the shores. Steamboats and tugs swarmed on the water, but now they came from the east and were steaming westward toward the city. The wild geese flew on, but instead of the narrow Malar fjords and the little islands, Broader waters and larger islands spread under them. At last the land was left behind and seen no more. They flew still farther out, where they found no more large inhabited islands. Only numberless little rock islands were scattered on the water. Now the fjords were not crowded by the land. The sea lay before them, vast and limitless. Here the wild geese alighted on a cliff island, and as soon as their feet touched the ground, the boy turned to Dunfin. "'What city did we fly over just now?' he asked. "'I don't know what human beings have named it,' said Dunfin. "'We grey geese call it the city that floats on the water.'" Part 2 The Sisters Dunfin had two sisters, Prettywing and Goldeye. They were strong and intelligent birds, but they did not have such a soft and shiny feather dress as Dunfin, nor did they have a sweet and gentle disposition. From the time they had been little yellow goslings, their parents and relatives and even the old fishermen had plainly shown them that they thought more of Dunfin than of them. Therefore, the sisters had always hated her. When the wild geese landed on the cliff island, Prettywing and Goldeye were feeding on a bit of grass close to the strand and immediately caught sight of the strangers. "'See, Sister Goldeneye, what fine-looking geese have come to our island!' exclaimed Prettywing. I have rarely seen such graceful birds. Do you notice that they have a white goosey gander among them? Did you ever set eyes on a handsomer bird? One could almost take him for a swan. Goldeneye agreed with her sister that these were certainly very distinguished strangers that had come to the island, but suddenly she broke off and called, Sister Prettywing, oh, Sister Prettywing, don't you see whom they bring with them? Prettywing also caught sight of Dunfin and was so astounded that she stood 
for a long time with her bill wide open and only hissed. It can't be possible, that is, is she? How did she manage to get in with people of that class? Why, we left her at Oland to freeze and starve. The worst of it is she will tattle to father and mother that we flew so close to her that we knocked her wing out of joint, said Goldeye. You'll see that it will end in our being driven from the island. We have nothing but trouble in store for us now that that young one has come back, snapped Pretty Wing. Still, I think it would be best for us to appear as pleased as possible over her return. She is so stupid that perhaps she didn't even notice that we gave her a push on purpose. While Pretty Wing and Goldeye were talking in this strain, the wild geese had been standing on the strand, pluming their feathers after the flight. Now they marched in a long line up the rocky shore to the cleft where Dunfin's parents usually stopped. Dunfin's parents were good folk. They had lived on the island longer than anyone else, and it was their habit to counsel and aid all newcomers. They too had seen the geese approach, but they had not recognised Dunfin in the flock. "'It is strange to see wild geese land on this island,' remarked the goose master. "'It is a fine flock that one can see by their flight.' "'But it won't be easy to find pasturage for so many,' said the goosewife, who was gentle and sweet-tempered, like Dunfin. When Akka came marching with her company, Dunfin's parents went out to meet her and welcome her to the island. Dunfin flew from her place at the end of the line and lit between her parents. "'Mother and father, I am here at last,' she cried joyously. "'Don't you know? Dunfin!' At first the old goose parents could not quite make out what they saw, but when they recognised Dunfin they were absurdly happy, of course. While the wild geese and Morton Goosey Gander and Dunfin were chattering excitedly, trying to tell how she had been rescued, Pretty Wing and Goldeneye came running. They cried, "'Welcome!' and pretended to be so happy because Dunfin was at home that she was deeply moved. The wild geese fared well on the island and decided not to travel farther until the following morning. After a while, the sisters asked Dunfin if she would come with them and see the places where they intended to build their nests. She promptly accompanied them and saw that they had picked out secluded and well-protected nesting places. "'Now, where will you settle down, Dunfin?' they asked. "'I? Why, I don't intend to remain on the island,' she said. "'I'm going with the wild geese up to Lapland.' "'What a pity that you must leave us,' said the sisters. "'I should have been very glad to remain here with father and mother and you,' said Dunfin, "'had I not promised the big white.' "'What?' shrieked Prettywig. "'Are you to have the handsome goosey gander? "'Then it is.' But here Goldeye gave her a sharp nudge, and she stopped short. The two cruel sisters had much to talk about all the afternoon. They were furious because Dunfin had a suitor like the white goosey gander. They themselves had suitors, but theirs were only common, grey geese. And since they had seen Morton goosey gander, they thought them so homely and low-bred that they did not wish even to look at them. "'This will grieve me to death,' whimpered Goldeye, "'if at least it had been you, Sister Prettywig, who had captured him. "'I would rather see him dead than to go about here the entire summer "'thinking of Dunfin's capturing a white goosey gander.' pouted Prettywig. However, the sisters continued to appear very friendly toward Dunfin, and in the afternoon Goldeye took Dunfin with her, that she might see the one she thought of marrying. "'He's not as attractive as the one you will have,' said Goldeye, "'but to make up for it one can be certain that he is what he is.' "'What do you mean, Goldeye?' questioned Dunfin. At first Goldeye would not explain what she had meant, but at last she came out with it. "'We have never seen a white goose travel with wild geese,' said the sister, "'and we wonder if he can be bewitched.' "'You are very stupid,' reported Dunfin indignantly. "'He is a tame goose, of course.' "'He brings with him one who is bewitched,' said Goldeye, "'and under the circumstances he too must be bewitched. "'Are you not afraid that he may be a black cormorant?' "'She was a good talker and succeeded in frightening Dunfin thoroughly.' "'You don't mean what you are saying,' pleaded the little grey goose. "'You only wish to frighten me.' "'I wish what is for your good, Dunfin,' said Goldeye. "'I can't imagine anything worse than for you to fly away with a black cormorant. "'But now I shall tell you something. "'Try to persuade him to eat some of the roots I have gathered here. "'If he is bewitched, it will be apparent at once. "'If he is not, he will remain as he is.' The boy was sitting amongst the wild geese, listening to Akka 
and the old goose master when Dunfin came flying up to him. Thumby Tot, Thumby Tot, she cried. Morton Goosey Gander is dying. I have killed him. Let me get up on your back, Dunfin, and take me to him. Away they flew, and Akka and the other wild geese followed them. When they got to the Goosey Gander, he was lying prostrate on the ground. He could not utter a word, only gasped for breath. Tickle him under the gorge and slap him on the back, commanded Akka. The boy did so, and presently the big white gander coughed up a large white root which had stuck in his gorge. "'Have you been eating of these?' asked Akka, pointing to some roots that lay on the ground. "'Yes,' groaned the goosey gander. "'Then it is well they stuck in your throat,' said Akka, "'for they are poisonous. Had you swallowed them you certainly should have died.' "'Dunfin bade me eat them,' said the goosey gander. "'My sister gave them to me,' protested Dunfin, and she told everything. "'You must beware of these sisters of yours, Dunfin,' warned Akka, "'for they wish you no good, depend upon it.' But Dunfin was so constituted that she could not think evil of anyone, and a moment later, when Prettywing asked her to come and meet her intended, she went with her immediately. "'Oh, he isn't as handsome as yours,' said the sister, "'but he is much more courageous and daring.' "'How do you know he is?' challenged Dunfin. For some time past there has been weeping and wailing amongst the seagulls and wild ducks on the island. Every morning at daybreak a strange bird of prey comes and carries off one of them. What kind of a bird is it? asked Dunfin. We don't know, replied the sister. One of his kind has never before been seen on the island, and strange to say he has never attacked one of us geese. But now my intended has made up his mind to challenge him tomorrow morning and drive him away. Oh, I hope he'll succeed, said Dunfin. "'I hardly think he will,' returned the sister. "'If my goosey gander were as big and as strong as yours, I should have a hope. "'Do you wish me to ask Morton Goosey Gander to meet the strange bird?' asked Dunfin. "'Indeed I do,' exclaimed Pretty Wing excitedly. "'You couldn't render me a greater service.' The next morning the goosey gander was up before the sun. He stationed himself on the highest point on the island and peered in all directions. Presently he saw a big dark bird coming from the west. His wings were exceedingly large, and it was easy to tell that he was an eagle, but expected a more dangerous adversary than an owl, and how he understood that he could not escape this encounter with his life. But it did not occur to him to avoid a struggle with a bird who was many times stronger than himself. The great bird swooped down on a seagull and dug his talons into it, before the eagle could spread his wings, Morton Goosey Gander rushed up to him. "'Drop that!' he shouted. "'And don't come here again, or you'll have me to deal with.' "'What kind of a lunatic are you?' said the eagle. "'It's lucky for you that I never fight with geese, or you would soon be done for.' Morton Goosey Gander thought the eagle considered himself too good to fight with him, and flew at him, incensed, biting him on the throat and beating him with his wings. This... Naturally, the eagle would not tolerate, and he began to fight, but not with his full strength. The boy lay sleeping in the quarters where Akka and the other wild geese slept when Dunfin called. Thumby Tot, Thumby Tot, Morton Goosey Gander is being torn to pieces by an eagle. Let me get up on your back, Dunfin, and take me to him, said the boy. When they arrived on the scene, Morton Goosey Gander was badly torn and bleeding, but he was still fighting. The boy could not battle with the eagle. All that he could do was to seek more efficient help. "'Hurry, Dunfin, and call Akka and the wild geese!' he cried. The instant he said that, the eagle flew back and stopped fighting. "'Who's speaking of Akka? he asked. He saw Thumbitot and heard the wild geese honking, so he spread his wings. "'Tell Akka I never expected to run across her or any of her flock out here in the sea,' he said, and soared away in a rapid and graceful flight. "'That is the same self-eagle who once brought me back to the wild geese,' the boy remarked, gazing after the bird in astonishment. The geese had decided to leave the island at dawn, but first they wanted to feed a while. As they walked about and nibbled, a mountain duck came up to Dunfin. "'I have a message for you from your sisters.' said the duck. They dare not show themselves among the wild geese, but they asked me to remind you not to leave the island without calling on the old fisherman. That's so, exclaimed Dunfin, but she was so frightened now that she would not go alone, and asked the goosey gander and Thumbitot to accompany her to the hut. The door was open, so Dunfin entered, but the others remained outside. 
After a moment, they heard Acker give the signal to start and called Dunfin. A grey goose came out and flew with the wild geese away from the island. They had travelled quite a distance along the archipelago when the boy began to wonder at the goose who accompanied them. Dunfin always flew lightly and noiselessly, but this one laboured with heavy and noisy wing strokes. "'We are in the wrong company. It is Pretty Wing that follows us.' The boy had barely spoken when the goose uttered such an ugly and angry shriek that all knew who she was. Akka and the others turned to her, but the grey goose did not fly away at once. Instead, she bumped against the big goosey gander, snatched Thumbitot, and flew off with him in her bill. There was a wild chase over the archipelago. Pretty Wing flew fast, but the wild geese were close behind her, and there was no chance for her to escape. Suddenly, they saw a puff of smoke rise up from the sea and heard an explosion. In their excitement, they had not noticed that they were directly above a boat in which a lone fisherman was seated. However, none of the geese was hurt, but just there, above the boat, Pretty Wing opened her bill and dropped Thumbitot into the sea. Chapter 28 Stockholm Skansen A few years ago at Skansen, the great park just outside of Stockholm where they have collected so many wonderful things, there lived a little man named Clement Larsen. He was from Halsingland and had come to Skansen with his fiddle to play folk dances and other old melodies. As a performer, he appeared mostly in the evening. During the day, it was his business to sit on guard in one of the many pretty peasant cottages which have been moved to Skansen from all parts of the country. In the beginning, Clement thought that he fared better in his old age than he had ever dared dream. But after a time, he began to dislike the place terribly, especially while he was on watch duty. It was all very well when visitors came into the cottage to look around, but some days Clement would sit for many hours, all alone, and then he felt so homesick that he feared he would have to give up his place. He was very poor and knew that at home he would become a charge on the parish, and therefore he tried to hold out as long as he could, although he felt more unhappy from day to day. One beautiful evening in the beginning of May, Clement had been granted a few hours' leave of absence. He was on his way down the steep hill leading out of Skansen when he met an island fisherman coming along with his game bag. The fisherman was an active young man who came to Skansen with seafowl that he'd managed to capture alive. Clement had met him before many times. The fisherman stopped Clement to ask if the superintendent at Skansen was at home. When Clement had replied, he in turn asked what choice thing the fisherman had in his bag. "'You can see what I have,' the fisherman answered, "'if in return you will give me an idea as to what I should ask for it.' He held open the bag, and Clement peeped into it once, and again, and then quickly drew back a step or two. "'Good gracious, Ashbjorn!' he exclaimed. "'How did you catch that one?' He remembered that when he was a child, his mother used to talk of the tiny folk who lived under the cabin floor. He was not permitted to cry or to be naughty, lest he provoke these small people." After he was grown, he believed his mother had made up these stories about the elves to make him behave himself. But it had been no invention of his mother's, it seemed, for there in Ashbjorn's bag lay one of the tiny folk. There was a little of the terror natural to childhood left in Clement, and he felt a shudder run down his spinal column as he peeped into the bag. Ashbjorn saw that he was frightened and began to laugh, but Clement took the matter seriously. "'Tell me, Ashbjorn, where you came across him?' he asked. "'You may be sure that I wasn't lying in wait for him,' said Ashbjorn. "'He came to me. I started out early this morning and took my rifle along into the boat. I had just pulled away from the shore when I sighted some wild geese coming from the east, shrieking like mad. I sent them a shot, but hit none of them. Instead, this creature came tumbling down into the water, so close to the boat that I only had to put out my hand and pick him up. I hope you didn't shoot him, Ashbjorn.' "'Oh, no, he is well and sound, but when he came down he was a little dazed at first, "'so I took advantage of that fact to wind the ends of two sail threads "'round his ankles and wrists so that he couldn't run away. "'Ah, here's something for Skansen,' I thought instantly. "'Clement grew strangely troubled as the fisherman talked. "'All that he had heard about the tiny folk in his childhood, "'of their vindictiveness towards enemies and their benevolence towards friends, 
came back to him. It had never gone well with those who had attempted to hold one of them captive. You should let him go at once, Ashbjorn, said Clement. I came precious near being forced to set him free, returned the fisherman. You may as well know, Clement, that the wild geese followed me all the way home, and they crisscrossed over the island the whole morning, honk honking as if they wanted him back. Not only they, but the entire population. Seagulls, sea swallows, and many others who are not worth a shot of powder alighted on the island and made an awful racket. When I came out, they fluttered about me until I had to turn back. My wife begged me to let him go, but I had made up my mind that he should come here to Scanson. So I placed one of the children's dolls in the window, hid the midget in the bottom of my bag, and started away. The birds must have fancied that it was he who stood in the window, for they permitted me to leave without pursuing me. D "'Does it say anything?' asked Clement. "'Yes. At first he tried to call the birds, but I wouldn't have it and put a gag in his mouth.' "'Oh, Ashbjorn,' protested Clement, "'how can you treat him so? Don't you see that he's something supernatural?' "'I don't know what he is,' said Ashbjorn calmly. "'Let others consider that. I'm satisfied if only I can get a good sum for him.' And now tell me, Clement, what do you think the doctor at Scanson would give me? There was a long pause before Clement replied. He felt very sorry for the poor little chap. He actually imagined that his mother was standing beside him, telling him that he must always be kind to the tiny folk. I have no idea what the doctor up there would care to give you, Ashbjorn, he said finally. But if you will leave him with me, I'll pay you twenty kroner for him. Ashbjorn stared at the fiddler in amazement when he heard him name so large a sum. He thought that Clement believed the midget had some mysterious power and might be of service for him. He was by no means certain that the doctor would think him such a great find or would offer to pay so high a sum for him. So he accepted Clement's proffer. The fiddler poked his purchase into one of his wide pockets, turned back to Scanson and went into a moss-covered hut where there were neither visitors nor guards. He closed the door after him, took out the midget who was still bound hand and foot and gagged, and laid him down gently on a bench. "'Now listen to what I say,' said Clement. "'I know, of course, that such as you do not like to be seen of men, but prefer to go about and busy yourselves in your own way. Therefore I have decided to give you your liberty, but only on one condition, that you will remain in this park until I permit you to leave. If you agree to this, nod your head.' three times. Clement gazed at the midget with confident expectation, but the latter did not move a muscle. You shall not fare badly, continued Clement. I'll see to it that you are fed every day, and you will have so much to do there that the time will not seem long to you. But you mustn't go elsewhere till I give you leave. Now, we'll agree as to a signal. So long as I set your food out in a white bowl, you are to stay. When I set it out in a blue one, you may go. Clement paused again, expecting the midget to give the sign of approval, but he did not stir. Uh, very well, said Clement. Then there's no choice but to show you to the master of this place. Then you'll be put in a glass case, and all the people in the big city of Stockholm will come and stare at you. This scared the midget, and he promptly gave the signal. That was right said Clement as he cut the cord that bound the midget's hands. Then he hurried toward the door. The boy unloosed the bands around his ankles and tore away the gag before thinking of anything else. When he turned to Clement to thank him, he had gone. Just outside the door, Clement met a handsome, noble-looking gentleman who was on his way to a place close by from which there was a beautiful outlook. Clement could not recall having seen the stately old man before, but the latter must surely have noticed Clement some time when he was playing the fiddle, because he stopped and spoke to him. "'Good day, Clement,' he said. "'How do you do? You're not ill, are you? I think you've grown a bit thin of late.' There was such an expression of kindliness about the old gentleman that Clement plucked up courage and told him of his homesickness. "'What?' exclaimed the old gentleman. "'Are you homesick when you're in Stockholm? It can't be possible!' He looked almost offended. Then he reflected that it was only an ignorant old peasant from Halsingland that he talked with, and so resumed his friendly attitude. Surely you have never heard how the city of Stockholm was founded. If you had, you would comprehend that your anxiety to get away is only a foolish fancy. Come with me to the bench over yonder, and I will tell you something about Stockholm. 
When the old gentleman was seated on the bench, he glanced down at the city, which spread in all its glory below him, and he drew a deep breath, as if he wished to drink in all the beauty of the landscape. And thereupon he turns to the fiddler. "'Look, Clement,' he said, and as he talked, he traced with his cane a little map in the sand in front of him. "'Here lies Upland, and here to the south a point juts out, which is split up by a number of bays. And here we have Sormland with another point, which is just as cut up, and points straight north. Here, from the west, comes a lake filled with islands. It is Lake Mullar. From the east comes another body of water, which can barely squeeze in between the islands and islets. It is the East Sea. Here, Clement, where Upland joins Sormland and Mullaren joins the East Sea, comes a short river, in the centre of which lie four little islets that divide the river into several tributaries, uh, one of which is called Norristrom, but was formerly Stocksund. In the beginning, these islets were common wooded islands, such as one finds in plenty on Lake Malar even today, and for ages they were entirely uninhabited. They were well located between two bodies of water and two bodies of land, but this no one remarked. Year after year passed, people settled along Lake Malar and in the archipelago, but these river islands attracted no settlers. Sometimes it happened that a seafarer put into port at one of them and pitched his tent for the night, but no one remained there long. One day, a fisherman who lived on Liding Island, out in Saltfjord, steered his boat toward Lake Malar, where he had such good luck with his fishing that he forgot to start for home in time. He got no farther than the four islets, and the best he could do was to land on one and wait until later in the night, when there would be bright moonlight. It was late summer and warm. The fisherman hauled his boat on land, lay down beside it, his head resting upon a stone, and fell asleep. When he awoke, the moon had been up a long while. It hung right above him and shone with such splendour that it was like broad daylight. The man jumped to his feet and was about to push his boat into the water when he saw a lot of black specks moving out in the stream. A school of seals was heading full speed for the island. When the fisherman saw that they intended to crawl up on land, he bent down for his spear, which he always took with him in the boat. But when he straightened up, he saw no seals. Instead, there stood on the strand the most beautiful young maidens, dressed in green, trailing satin robes with pearl crowns upon their heads. The fishermen understood that these were mermaids who lived on desolate rock islands far out to sea and had assumed seal disguises in order to come up on land and enjoy the moonlight on the green islets. He laid down the spear very cautiously, and when the young maidens came up on the island to play, he stole behind and surveyed them. He had heard that sea nymphs were so beautiful and fascinating that no one could see them and not be enchanted by their charms, and he had to admit that this was not too much to say of them. When he stood for a while under the shadow of the trees and watched the dance, he went down to the strand, took one of the sealskins lying there, and hid it under a stone. Then he went back to his boat, lay down beside it, and pretended to be asleep. Presently he saw the young maidens trip down to the strand to don their sealskins. It was play and laughter, which was changed to weeping and wailing when one of the mermaids could not find her seal robe. Her companions ran up and down the strand and helped her search for it, but no trace could they find. While they were seeking, they noticed that the sky was growing pale, and the day was breaking, so they could tarry no longer, and they all swam away, leaving behind the one whose seal skin was missing. She sat on the strand and wept. The fisherman felt sorry for her, of course, but he forced himself to lie still till daybreak. Then he got up, pushed the boat into the water, and stepped into it to make it appear that he saw her by chance after he had lifted the oars. "'Who are you?' he called out. "'Are you shipwrecked?' She ran towards him and asked if he had seen her sealskin. The fisherman looked as if he did not know what she was talking about. She sat down again and wept. 
Then he determined to take her with him in the boat. Come with me to my cottage, he commanded, and my mother will take care of you. You can't stay here on the island where you have neither food nor shelter. He talked so convincingly that she was persuaded to step into his boat. Both the fisherman and his mother were very kind to the poor mermaid, and she seemed to be happy with them. She grew more contented every day, and helped the older woman with her work, and was exactly like any other island lass, only she was much prettier. One day the fisherman asked her if she would be his wife, and she did not object, but at once said yes. Preparations were made for the wedding. The mermaid dressed as a bride in her green trailing robe with the shimmering pearl crown she had worn when the fisherman first saw her. There was neither church nor parson on the island at that time, so the bridal party seated themselves in the boats to row up to the first church they should find. And the fisherman had the mermaid and his mother in his boat, and he rowed so well that he was far ahead of all the others. When he had come so far that he could see the islet in the river where he won his bride, he could not help smiling. "'What are you smiling at?' she asked. "'Oh, I'm thinking of that night when I hid your sealskin,' answered the fisherman, for he felt so sure of her that he thought there was no longer any need for him to conceal anything. "'What are you saying?' asked the bride, astonished. "'Surely I have never possessed a sealskin. It appeared she had forgotten everything.' "'Don't you recollect how you danced with the mermaids?' he asked. "'I don't know what you mean,' said the bride. "'I think that you must have dreamed a strange dream last night.' "'If I show you your sealskin, you'll probably believe me,' uh, laughed the fisherman promptly, turning the boat towards the islet. They stepped ashore, and he brought the sealskin out from under the stone where he had hidden it. But the instant the bride set eyes on the sealskin, she grasped it and drew it over her head— it snuggled close to her, as if there was life in it, and immediately she threw herself into the stream. The bridegroom saw her swim away and plunged into the water after her, but he could not catch up to her. When he saw that he couldn't stop her in any other way, in his grief he seized his spear and held it. He aimed better than he had intended, for the poor mermaid gave a piercing shriek and disappeared in the depths. The fisherman stood on the strand, waiting for her to appear again. He observed that the water around him began to take on a soft sheen, a beauty that he had never seen before. It shimmered in pink and white, like the colour play on the inside of seashells. As the glittering water lapped the shores, the fishermen thought that they too were transformed. They began to blossom and waft their perfumes. A soft sheen spread over them, and they also took on a beauty which they had never possessed before. He understood how all this had come to pass, for it is thus with mermaids. One who beholds them must needs find them more beautiful than any one else, and the mermaid's blood being mixed with the water that bathed the shores, well, her beauty was transferred to both. All who saw them must love them and yearn for them. This was their legacy from the mermaid. When the stately old gentleman had got thus far in his narrative, he turned to Clement and looked at him. Clement nodded reverently, but made no comment, as he did not wish to cause a break in the story. "'Now, you must bear this in mind, Clement,' the old gentleman continued with a roguish glint in his eyes. "'From that time on, people emigrated to the islands. At first, only fishermen and peasants settled there, but others two were attracted to them. One day, uh, the king and his earl sailed up the stream. They started at once to talk of these islands, having observed they were so situated that every vessel that sailed toward Lake Malar had to pass them. The earl suggested that there ought to be a lock put on the channel which could be opened or closed at will to let in merchant vessels and shut out pirates. This idea was carried out, said the old gentleman as he rose and began to trace in the sand again with his cane. On the largest of these islands, the earl erected a fortress with a strong tower, which was called Carnan, 
and around the island a wall was built. Here, at the north and south ends of the wall, they made gates and placed strong towers over them. Across the other islands they built bridges. Uh, these were likewise equipped with high towers. Out in the water, round about, they put a wreath of piles with bars that could open and close, so that no vessel could sail past without permission. Therefore, you see, Clement, the four islands which had lain so long unnoticed were soon strongly fortified. But this was not all, for the shores and the sand tempted people, and before long they came from all quarters to settle there. They built a church, which has since been called Storkiken. Uh, here it stands near the castle, and here, within the walls, were the little huts the pioneers built for themselves. They were primitive, but they served their purpose. More was not needed at that time to make the place pass for a city, and the city was named Stockholm. There came a day, Clement, when the earl, who had begun the work, went to his final rest, and Stockholm was without a master builder. Monks called the Greyfriars came to the country. Stockholm attracted them. They asked permission to erect a monastery there, so the king gave them an island, one of the smaller ones, this one facing Lake Malar. There they built, and the place was called Greyfriars Island. Other monks came called the Blackfriars. They too asked for right to build in Stockholm near the South Gate. On this, the larger of the islands north of the city, a holy ghost house or a hospital was built, while on the smaller one, thrifty men put up a mill, and along the little islands close by, the monks fished. As you know, there is only one island now, for the canal between the two has filled up, but it is still called Holy Ghost Island. And now, Clement, all the little wooded islands were dotted with houses, but still people kept streaming in, for these shores and waters have the power to draw people to them. Hither came pious women of the Order of St. Clara, and asked for ground to build upon. For them there was no choice but to settle on the north shore at Normalm, as it's called. You may be sure they were not over-pleased with this location, for across Normalm ran a high ridge, and on that the city had its gallows hill, so that it was a detested spot. And nevertheless, the poor Clares erected their church and their convent on the strand below the ridge. After they were established there, they soon found plenty of followers. Upon the ridge itself were built a hospital and a church, consecrated to St. Goran, and just below the ridge a church was erected to St. Jacob. And even at Sodomarm, where the mountain rises perpendicularly from the strand, they began to build. There they raised a church to St. Mary. But you must not think that only cloister folk moved to Stockholm. There were also many others, principally German tradesmen and artisans, these were more skilled than the Swedes and were well received. They settled within the walls of the city, where they pulled down the wretched little cabins that stood there and built high, magnificent stone houses. Uh, but space was not plentiful within the walls. Therefore, they had to build the houses close together, with gables facing the narrow by-lanes. So, you see, Clement, that Stockholm could attract people. At this point in the narrative, another gentleman appeared and walked rapidly down the path toward the man who was talking to Clement, but he waved his hand and the other remained at a distance. The dignified old gentleman still sat on the bench beside the fiddler. Now, Clement, you must render me a service, he said. I have no time to talk more with you, but I will send you a book about Stockholm and you must read it from cover to cover. I have, so to speak, laid the foundations of Stockholm for you. Study the rest out for yourself, and learn how the city has thrived and changed. Read how the little narrow wall-enclosed city on the islands has spread into this great sea of houses below us. Read how, on the spot where the dark tower Carnan once stood, the beautiful light castle below us was erected, and how the Grey Friars Church has been turned into the burial place of the Swedish kings. Uh, read how islet after islet was built up with factories, how the ridge was lowered and the sound filled in, how the truck gardens at the south 
and north ends of the city have been converted into beautiful parks or built-up quarters. How the king's private deer park has become the people's favourite pleasure resort. You must make yourself at home here, Clement. This city does not belong exclusively to the Stockholmers. It belongs to you and to all Swedes. As you read about Stockholm, remember that I have spoken the truth, for the city has the power to draw everyone to it. First, the king moved here, and then the nobles built their palaces here, and then one after another was attracted to the place. So that now, as you see, Stockholm is not a city unto itself or for nearby districts. It has grown into a city for the whole kingdom. You know, Clement, that there are judicial courts in every parish throughout the land. But in Stockholm, they have jurisdiction for the whole nation. You know that there are judges in every district court in the country. But at Stockholm, there is only one court to which all the others are accountable. You know that there are barracks and troops in every part of the land, but those at Stockholm command the whole army. Everywhere in the country you will find railroads, but the whole great national system is controlled and managed at Stockholm. Here you will find the governing boards for the clergy, for teachers, for physicians, for bailiffs and jurors. This is the heart of your country, Clement. All the change you have in your pocket is coined here. And the postage stamps you stick on your letters are made here. There is something here for every Swede. Here no one need feel homesick, for here all Swedes are at home. And when you read all of that that has been brought here to Stockholm, think too of the latest that the city is attracted to itself. These old-time peasant cottages here at Skansen, the old dances, the old costumes and house furnishings, the musicians and storytellers. Everything good of the old-time Stockholm has tempted here to Skansen to do it honour, that it may, in turn, stand before the people with renewed glory. But first, and last, remember, as you read about Stockholm, that you are to sit in this place. You must see how the waves sparkle in joyous play and how the shores shimmer with beauty. You will come under the spell of their witchery, Clement. The handsome old gentleman had raised his voice so that it rang out strong and commanding and his eyes shone. Then he rose and, with a wave of his hand to Clement, walked away. Clement understood that the one who had been talking to him was a great man, and he bowed to him as low as he could. The next day came a royal lackey with a big red book and a letter for Clement, and in the letter it said that the book was from the king. After that, the little old man, Clement Larson, was light-headed for several days, and it was impossible to get a sensible word out of him. When a week had gone by, he went to the superintendent and gave in his notice. He simply had to go home. Oh, why must you go home? Can't you learn to be content here? asked the doctor. Oh, I am contented here, said Clement. That matter troubles me no longer, but I must go home all the same. Clement was quite perturbed, because the king had said that he should learn all about Stockholm and be happy there. But he could not rest until he had told everyone at home that the king had said those words to him. He could not renounce the idea of standing on the church knoll at home and telling high and low that the king had been so kind to him that he had sat beside him on the bench and had sent him a book and had taken the time to talk to him, a poor fiddler, for a whole hour in order to cure him of his homesickness. It was good to relate this to the Laplanders and the Dalekarlian peasant girls at Skansen, but what was that compared to being able to tell all of it at home? Even if Clement were to end in the poorhouse, it wouldn't be so hard after this. He was a totally different man from what he had been, and he would be respected and honoured in a very different way. This new yearning took possession of Clement. He simply had to go up to the doctor and say that he must go home. Chapter 29 Gorgo the Eagle 
Part 1. In the Mountain Glen Far up among the mountains of Lapland, there was an old eagle's nest on a ledge, which projected from a high cliff. The nest was made of dry twigs of pine and spruce, interlaced one with another until they formed a perfect network, and year by year the nest had been repaired and strengthened. It was about two metres wide and nearly as high as a Laplander's hut, and the cliff on which the eagle's nest was situated towered above a big glen, which was inhabited in summer by a flock of wild geese, as it was an excellent refuge for them. It was so secluded between cliffs that not many knew of it, even among the Laplanders themselves. In the heart of this glen there was a small round lake, in which was an abundance of food for the tiny goslings, and on the tufted lake shores, which were covered with osier bushes and dwarfed birches, the geese found fine nesting places. In all ages eagles had lived on the mountain, and geese in the glen. Every year the former carried off a few of the latter, but they were very careful not to take so many that the wild geese would be afraid to remain in the glen. The geese, in their turn, found the eagles quite useful. They were robbers, to be sure, but they kept other robbers away. Two years before Nils Holgersen travelled with the wild geese, the old leader goose, Akka, from Kebnekes, was standing at the foot of the mountain slope, looking toward the eagle's nest. The eagles were in the habit of starting on their chase soon after sunrise. During the summers that Akka had lived in the glen, she had watched every morning for their departure to find if they stopped in the glen to hunt or if they flew beyond it to other hunting grounds. She did not have to wait long before the two eagles left the ledge on the cliff. Stately and terror-striking, they soared into the air. They directed their course toward the plain and Akka breathed a sigh of relief. The old leader goose's days of nesting and rearing of young were over, and during the summer she passed the time going from one goose range to another, giving counsel regarding the brooding and care of the young. Aside from this, she kept an eye out not only for eagles but also for mountain fox and owls, and all other enemies who were a menace to the wild geese and their young. About noontime, Akka began to watch for the eagles again. This she had done every day during all the summers that she had lived in the glen. She could tell at once by their flight if their hunt had been successful, and in that event she felt relieved for the safety of those who belonged to her. But on this particular day she had not seen the eagles return. I must be getting old and stupid, she thought, when she had waited a time for them. The eagles have probably been home this long while. In the afternoon she looked toward the cliff again, expecting to see the eagles perched on the rocky ledge where they usually took their afternoon rest. Toward evening, when they took their bath in the Dale Lake, she tried again to get sight of them, but failed. Again, she bemoaned the fact that she was growing old. She was so accustomed to having the eagles on the mountain above her that she could not imagine the possibility of their not having returned. The following morning, Akka was awake in good season to watch for the eagles, but she did not see them. On the other hand, she heard in the morning stillness a cry that sounded both angry and plaintive, and it seemed to come from the eagle's nest. Can there possibly be anything amiss with the eagles? She wondered. She spread her wings quickly and rose so high that she could perfectly well look down into the nest. There she saw neither of the eagles. There was no one in the nest save a little half-fledged eaglet who was screaming for food. Akka sank down toward the eagle's nest, slowly and reluctantly. It was a gruesome place to come to. It was plain what kind of robber folk lived there. In the nest and on the cliff ledge lay bleached bones, bloody feathers, pieces of skin, hare's heads, birds' beaks, and the tufted claws of grouse. And the eaglet, who was lying in the midst of this, was repulsive to look upon with his big, gaping bill, his awkward, down-clad body, and his undeveloped wings where the prospective quills stuck out like thorns. At last Akka conquered her repugnance and alighted on the edge of the nest, at the same time glancing about her anxiously in every direction, for each second she expected to see the old eagles coming back. "'It is well that someone has come at last!' cried the baby eagle. "'Fetch me some food at once!' 
Well, well, don't be in such haste, said Akka. Tell me first where your father and mother are. That's what I should like to know myself. They went off yesterday morning and left me a lemming to live upon while they were away. You can believe that was eaten long ago. It's a shame for mother to let me starve in this way. Akka began to think that the eagles had really been shot, and she reasoned that if she were to let the eaglets starve, she might perhaps be rid of the whole robber tribe for all time. But it went very much against her not to succour a deserted young one, so far as she could. "'Why do you sit there and stare?' snapped the eaglet. "'Didn't you hear me say, I want food?' Akka spread her wings and sank down to the little lake in the glen. A moment later, she returned to the eagle's nest with a salmon trout in her bill. The eaglet flew into a temper when she dropped the fish in front of him. "'Do you think I can eat such stuff?' he shrieked, pushing it aside and trying to strike Akka with his bill. "'Fetch me a willow grouse or a lemming, do you hear?' Akka stretched her head forward and gave the eaglet a sharp nip in the neck. "'Let me say to you,' remarked the old goose, "'that if I am to procure food for you, you must be satisfied with what I give you. Your mother and father are dead, and from them you can get no help. But if you want to lie here and starve to death while you wait for grouse and lemming, I shall not hinder you.' When Akka had spoken her mind, she promptly retired, and did not show her face in the eagle's nest again for some time. But when she did return, the eaglet had eaten the fish, and when she dropped another in front of him, he swallowed it at once, although it was plain that he found it very distasteful. Akka had imposed upon herself a tedious task. The old eagles never appeared again, and she alone had to procure for the eaglet all the food he needed. She gave him fish and frogs, and he did not seem to fare badly on this diet, but grew big and strong. He soon forgot his parents, the eagles, and fancied that Akka was his real mother. Akka, in turn, loved him as if he had been her own child. She tried to give him a good bringing up, and to cure him of his wildness and overbearing ways. After a fortnight, Akka observed that the time was approaching for her to molt and put on a new feather dress so as to be ready to fly. For a whole moon she would be unable to carry food to the baby eaglet, and he might starve to death. So Akka said to him one day, "'Gorgo, I can't come to you any more with fish.' Everything depends now upon your pluck, which means can you dare to venture into the glen, so I can continue to procure food for you. You must choose between starvation and flying down to the glen, but that too may cost you your life. Without a second's hesitation, the eaglet stepped upon the edge of the nest. Barely taking the trouble to measure the distance to the bottom, he spread his tiny wings and started away. He rolled over and over in space, but nevertheless made enough use of his wings to reach the ground almost unhurt. Down there in the glen, Gorgo passed the summer in company with the little goslings, and was a good comrade for them. Since he regarded himself as a gosling, he tried to live as they lived. When they swam in the lake, he followed them until he came near drowning. It was most embarrassing to him that he could not learn to swim, and he went to Akka and complained of his inability. "'Why can't I swim like the others?' he asked. "'Your claws grow too hooked, and your toes too large, while you are up there on the cliff,' Akka replied. "'But you'll make a fine bird all the same.' The eaglet's wings soon grew so large that they could carry him, but not until autumn, when the goslings learned to fly, did it dawn upon him that he could use them for flight. There came a proud time for him, for... At this sport, he was the peer of them all. His companions never stayed up in the air any longer than they had to, but he stayed there nearly the whole day and practised the art of flying. So far, it had not occurred to him that he was of another species than the geese, but he could not help noting a number of things that surprised him, and he questioned Akka constantly. "'Why do grouse and lemming run and hide when they see my shadow on the cliff?' he queried. They don't show such fear of other goslings. Your wings grew too big when you were on the cliff, said Akka. It is that which frightens the little wretches. But don't be unhappy because of that. You'll be a fine bird all the same. After the eagle had learned to fly, he taught himself to fish and to catch frogs. But by and by, he began to ponder this also. 
How does it happen that I live on fish and frogs? he asked. The other goslings don't. This is due to the fact that I had no other food to give you when you were on the cliff, said Akka. But don't let that make you sad. You'll be a fine bird all the same. When the wild geese began their autumn moving, Gorgo flew along with the flock, regarding himself all the while as one of them. The air was filled with birds who were on their way south, and there was great excitement among them when Akka appeared with an eagle in her train. The wild goose flock was continually surrounded by swarms of the curious who loudly expressed their astonishment. Akka bade them be silent, but it was impossible to stop so many wagging tongues. "'Why do they call me an eagle?' Gorgo asked repeatedly, growing more and more exasperated. "'Can't they see that I'm a wild goose? I'm no bird-eater who preys upon this kind.' "'How dare they give me such an ugly name?' One day they flew above a barnyard where many chickens walked on a dump heap and picked. Brr, an eagle! Brr, an eagle!' shrieked the chickens and started to run for shelter. But Gorgo, who had heard the eagles spoken of as savage criminals, could not control his anger. He snapped his wings together and shot to the ground, striking his talons into one of the hens. "'I'll teach you, I will, that I'm no eagle!' he screamed furiously and struck with his beak. That instant he heard Akka call to him from the air and rose obediently. The wild goose flew toward him and began to reprimand him. "'What are you trying to do?' she cried, beating him with her bill. Or "'Was it perhaps your intention to tear that poor hen to pieces?' But when the eagle took his punishment from the wild goose without a protest, there arose from the great bird throng around them a perfect storm of taunts and jibes. The eagle heard this and turned toward Akka with flaming eyes, as though he would have liked to attack her. But he suddenly changed his mind, and with quick wing strokes bounded into the air, soaring so high that no call could reach him, and he sailed around up there as long as the wild geese saw him. Two days later he appeared again in the wild goose flock. "'I know who I am,' he said to Akka. "'Since I am an eagle, I must live as becomes an eagle, but I think we can be friends all the same.' "'You or any of yours I shall never attack.' But Akka had set her heart on successfully training an eagle into a mild and harmless bird, and she could not tolerate his wanting to do as he chose. "'Do you think that I wish to be the friend of a bird-eater?' she asked. "'Live as I have taught you to live, and you may travel with my flock as heretofore.' Both were proud and stubborn, and neither of them would yield." It ended in Akka's forbidding the eagle to show his face in her neighbourhood, and her anger toward him was so intense that no one dared speak his name in her presence. After that, Gorgo roamed around the country, alone and shunned, like all great robbers. He was often downhearted, and certainly longed many a time for the days when he thought himself a wild goose, and played with the merry goslings. Among the animals he had a great reputation for courage. They used to say of him that he feared no one but his foster-mother, Akka, and they could also say of him that he never used violence against a wild goose. Part 2. In Captivity Gorgo was only three years old, and had not as yet thought about marrying and procuring a home for himself when he was captured one day by a hunter and sold to the Skansen Zoological Garden, where there were already two eagles held captive in a cage built of iron bars and steel wires. The cage stood out in the open and was so large that a couple of trees had easily been moved into it, and quite a large cairn was piled up in there. Notwithstanding all this, the birds were unhappy. They sat motionless on the same spot nearly all day. Their pretty, dark feather dresses became rough and lustreless, and their eyes were riveted with hopeless longing on the sky without. During the first week of Gorgo's captivity, he was still awake and full of life, but later a heavy torpor came upon him. He perched himself on one spot, like the other eagles, and stared at vacancy. He no longer knew how the days passed. One morning, Gorgo sat in his usual torpor. He heard someone call to him from below. He was so drowsy that he could barely rouse himself enough to lower his glance. "'Who is calling me?' he asked. "'Oh, Gorgo, don't you know me? It's Thumbitot, who used to fly around with the wild geese.' "'Is Akka also captured?' asked Gorgo, in the tone of one who is trying to collect his thoughts after a long sleep. 
And no, Acker, the white goosey gander, and the whole flock are probably safe and sound up in Lapland at this season, said the boy. It's only I who am a prisoner here. As the boy was speaking, he noticed that Gorgo averted his glance and began to stare into space again. Golden Eagle, cried the boy, I have not forgotten that once you carried me back to the wild geese and that you spared the white goosey gander's life. Tell me if I can be of any help to you. Gorgo scarcely raised his head. Don't disturb me, Thumbietot, he yawned. I'm sitting here dreaming that I'm free, and I'm soaring away up among the clouds. I don't want to be awake. You must rouse yourself and see what goes on around you, the boy admonished, or you will soon look as wretched as the other eagles. I wish I were as they are. They're so lost in their dreams that nothing more can trouble them, said the eagle. When night came, and all three eagles were asleep, there was a light scraping on the steel wires stretched across the top of the cage. The two listless old captives did not allow themselves to be disturbed by the noise, but Gorgo awakened. "'Who's there? Uh, who's moving up on the roof?' he asked. "'It's Thumbietot, Gorgo,' answered the boy. "'I'm sitting here filing away all the steel wires, so that you can escape.' The eagle raised his head and saw in the night light how the boy sat and filed the steel wires at the top of the cage. He felt hopeful for an instant, but soon discouragement got the upper hand. "'I'm a big bird, Thumbietot,' said Gorgo. "'How can you ever manage to file away enough wires for me to come out? "'You'd better quit that and leave me in peace.' "'Oh, go to sleep and don't bother me,' said the boy. "'I'll not be through tonight, nor tomorrow night. "'But I shall try to free you in time, for here you'll become a total wreck.' Gorgo fell asleep. When he awoke the next morning, he saw at a glance that a number of wires had been filed. That day he felt less drowsy than he had done in the past— he spread his wings and fluttered from branch to branch to get the stiffness out of his joints. One morning early, just as the first streak of sunlight made his appearance, Thumbietot awakened the eagle. "'Try now, Gorgo,' he whispered. The eagle looked up. The boy had actually filed off so many wires that now there was a big hole in the wire netting. Gorgo flapped his wings and propelled himself upward. Twice he missed and fell back into the cage, but finally he succeeded in getting out. With proud wing strokes, he soared into the clouds. Little Thumbietot sat and gazed after him with a mournful expression. He wished that someone would come and give him his freedom too. The boy was domiciled now at Skansen. He had become acquainted with all the animals there and had made many friends among them. He had to admit that there was so much to see and learn that it was not difficult for him to pass the time. To be sure, his thoughts went forth every day to Morton and Goosey Gander and his other comrades, and he yearned for them. If only I weren't bound by my promise, he thought, I'd find some bird to take me to them. It may seem strange that Clement Larson had not restored the boy's liberty, but one must remember how excited the little fiddler had been when he left Skansen. The morning of his departure, he had thought of setting out the midget's food in a blue bowl, but unluckily he'd been unable to find one. All the Skansen folk, lapps, peasant girls, artisans and gardeners, had come to bid him goodbye, and he had had no time to search for a blue bowl. It was time to start, and at the last moment he had to ask the old Laplander to help him. "'One of the tiny folk happens to be living here at Skansen,' said Clement, "'and every morning I set out a little food for him,' "'Will you do me the favour of taking these few coppers "'and purchasing a blue bowl with them? "'Put a little gruel and milk in it, "'and tomorrow morning set it out under the steps of Bolner's Cottage.' "'The old Laplander looked surprised, "'but there was no time for Clement to explain further, "'as he had to be off to the railway station. "'The Laplander went down to the zoological village "'to purchase the bowl. "'As he saw no blue one that he thought appropriate, "'he bought a white one.' and this he conscientiously filled and set out every morning. And that was why the boy had not been released from his pledge. He knew that Clement had gone away, but he was not allowed to leave. That night the boy longed more than ever for his freedom. This was because summer had come now in earnest. During his travels he had suffered much in cold and stormy weather, and when he first came to Skansen he had thought that perhaps it was just as well that he had been compelled to break the journey. He would have been frozen to death had he gone to Lapland in the month of May, but now it was warm, 
The earth was green-clad, birches and poplars were clothed in their satiny foliage, and the cherry trees. In fact, all the fruit trees were covered with blossoms. The berry bushes had green berries on their stems, the oaks had carefully unfolded their leaves and peas, cabbages and beans were growing in the vegetable garden at Scanson. Now it must be warm up in Lapland, thought the boy. I should like to be seated on Morton Goosey Gander's back on a fine morning like this. It would be great fun to ride around in the warm still air and look down at the ground as it now lies decked with green grass and embellished with pretty blossoms. He sat musing on this when the eagle suddenly swooped down from the sky and perched beside the boy on top of the cage. I wanted to try my wings to see if they were still good for anything, said Gorgo. You didn't suppose that I meant to leave you here in captivity. Get up on my back and I'll take you to your comrades. No, that's impossible, the boy answered. I have pledged my word that I would stay here till I am liberated. Uh, what sort of nonsense are you talking? protested Gorgo. In the first place they brought you here against your will, and then they forced you to promise that you would remain here. Uh, surely you must understand that such a promise one need not keep. Oh no, I must keep it, said the boy. I thank you all the same for your kind intention, but you can't help me. Oh, can't I? said Gorgo. We'll see about that. In a twinkling he grasped Nils Holgersen in his big talons and rose with him toward the skies, disappearing in a northerly direction. Chapter 30 On Over Gastric Land Part 1 The Precious Girdle Wednesday, June 15th The eagle kept on flying until he was a long distance north of Stockholm. Then he sank to a wooded hillock where he relaxed his hold on the boy. The instant Thumbitot was out of Gorgo's clutches, he started to run back to the city as fast as he could. The eagle made a long swoop caught up to the boy and stopped him with his claw. "'Do you propose to go back to prison?' he demanded. "'That's my affair. I can go where I like, for all of you,' retorted the boy, trying to get away. Thereupon the eagle gripped him with his strong talons and rose in the air. Now Gorgo circled over the entire province of Upland, and did not stop again until he came to the great waterfalls at Alvacalbi, where he alighted on a rock in the middle of the rushing rapids below the roaring falls. Again he relaxed his hold on the captive. The boy saw that here there was no chance of escape from the eagle. Above them the white scum wall of the waterfall came tumbling down, and in a mighty torrent. Thumbitot was very indignant to think that in this way he had been forced to become a promise-breaker. He turned his back to the eagle and would not speak to him. Now that the bird had set the boy down in a place from which he could not run away, he told him, confidentially, that he had been brought up by Akka from Kevna Kays, and that he had quarrelled with his foster-mother. "'Now, Thumbitot, perhaps you understand why I wish to take you back to the wild geese,' he said. "'I have heard that you are in great favour with Akka, and it was my purpose to ask you to make peace between us.' As soon as the boy comprehended that the eagle had not carried him off in a spirit of contrariness, he felt kindly toward him. "'I should like very much to help you,' he returned, but I am bound by my promise. Thereupon he explains to the eagle how he had fallen into captivity, and how Clement Larsen had left Skansen without setting him free. Nevertheless, the eagle would not relinquish his plan. Listen to me, Thumbitot, he said. My wings can carry you wherever you wish to go, and my eyes can search out whatever you wish to find. Tell me how the man looks who exacted this promise from you, and I will find him and take you to him, and then it is for you to do the rest. Thumbitot approved of the proposition. I can see, Gorgo, that you have had a wise bird like Akka for a foster mother, the boy remarked. He gave a graphic description of Clement Larson and added that he had heard at Skansen that the little fiddler was from Housingland. We'll search for him through the whole of Housingland, from Youngby to Melanso, from Great Mountain to Hornland, said the eagle. Tomorrow before sundown you shall have a talk with the man. I fear you are promising more than you can perform, doubted the boy. I should be a mighty poor eagle if I couldn't do that much, said Gorgo. So, when Gorgo and Thumbitot left Avalcarby, they were good friends, and the boy willingly took his mount for a ride on the eagle's back. Thus he had an opportunity to see much of the country. When clutched in the eagle's talons, he had seen nothing. Perhaps it was just as well, for in the forenoon he had travelled over Uppsala, 
Ostabis big factories, the Danamora mine and the ancient castle of Orbihus, and he would have been sadly disappointed at not seeing them had he known of their proximity. The eagle bore him speedily over Gastrickland. In the southern part of the province there was very little to tempt the eye, but as they flew northward it began to get interesting. This country is clad in a spruce skirt and a grey stone jacket, thought the boy, but around its waist it wears a girdle which has not its match in value, for it is embroidered with blue lakes and green groves. The green ironworks adorn it like a row of precious stones, and its buckle is a whole city, with castles and cathedrals and great clusters of houses. When the travellers arrived in the northern forest region, Gorgo alighted on top of a mountain. As the boy dismounted, the eagle said, "'There's game in this forest, and I can't forget my late captivity and feel really free until I've gone a-hunting. You won't mind me leaving you for a while?' "'No, of course I won't,' the boy assured him. "'You may go where you like it, if only you were back here by sundown,' said the eagle as he flew off. The boy sat on a stone, gazing across the bare rocky ground and the great forests round about. He felt rather lonely, but soon he heard singing in the forest below and saw something bright moving amongst the trees. Presently he saw a blue and yellow banner, and he knew by the songs and the merry chatter that it was being borne at the head of a procession. On it came, up the winding path. He wondered where it and those who followed it were going. He couldn't believe that anybody would come up to such an ugly, desolate waste as the place where he sat. But the banner was nearing the forest border, and behind it marched many happy people for whom it had led the way. Suddenly there was life and movement all over the mountain plain. After that there was so much for the boy to see that he didn't have a dull moment. Part 2. Forest Day On the mountain's broad back, where Gorgo left Thumbitot, there had been a forest fire ten years before. Since that time the charred trees had been felled and removed, and the great fire-swept area had begun to deck itself with green along the edges where it skirted the healthy forest. However, the larger part of the top was still barren and appallingly desolate. Charred stumps, standing sentinel-like between the rock ledges, bore witness that once there had been a fine forest here, but no fresh roots sprang from the ground. One day, in the early summer, all the children in the parish had assembled in front of the schoolhouse near the fire-swept mountain. Each child carried either a spade or a hoe on its shoulder and a basket of food in its hand. As soon as all were assembled, they marched in a long procession toward the forest. The banner came first, with the teachers on either side of it. Then followed a couple of foresters and a wagon-load of pine shrubs and spruce seeds, and then the children. The procession did not pause in any of the birch groves near the settlements, but marched on deep into the forest. As it moved along, the foxes stuck their heads out of the lairs in astonishment, and wondered what kind of backwards people these were. As they marched past old culpits where charcoal kilns were fired every autumn, the crossbeaks twisted their hooked bills and asked one another what kind of colas these might be who were now thronging the forest. Finally, the procession reached the big, burnt mountain plain. The rocks had been stripped of the fine twin-flower creepers that once covered them. They had been robbed of the pretty silver moss and the attractive reindeer moss. Around the dark water, gathered in clefts and hollows, there was now no wood sorrel. The little patches of soil in crevices and between stones were without ferns, without star flowers without all the green and red and light and soft and soothing things which usually clothe the forest ground. It was as if a bright light flashed upon the mountain when all the parish children covered it. Here again was something sweet and delicate, something fresh and rosy, something young and growing. Perhaps these children would bring to the poor abandoned forest a little new life. When the children had rested and eaten their luncheon, they seized hoes and spades and began to work. The foresters showed them what to do. They set out shrub after shrub on every clear spot of earth they could find. As they worked, they talked quite knowingly among themselves of how the little shrubs they were planting would bind the soil so that it could not get away, and of how new soil would form under the trees. By and by, seeds would drop, and in a few years they would be picking both strawberries and raspberries, where now there were only bare rocks. 
the little shrubs which they were planting would gradually become tall trees. Perhaps big houses and great splendid ships would be built from them. If the children had not come here and planted while there was still a little soil in the clefts, all the earth would have been carried away by wind and water, and the mountain could never more have been clothed in green. It was well that we came, said the children. We were just in the nick of time. They felt very important. While they were working on the mountain, their parents were at home. By and by, they began to wonder how the children were getting along. Of course, it was only a joke about their planting a forest, but it might be amusing to see what they were trying to do. So, presently, both fathers and mothers were on their way to the forest. When they came to the outlying stock farms, they met some of the neighbours. "'Are you going to the fire-swept mountain?' they asked. "'That's where we're bound for.' "'To have a look at the children?' "'Yes, to see what they're up to. "'It's only play, of course.' It isn't likely there will be many forest trees planted by the youngsters. We have brought the coffee pot along so that we can have something warm to drink, since we must stay there all day with only lunch basket provisions. So the parents of the children went on up the mountain. At first they thought only of how pretty it looked to see all the rosy-cheeked little children scattered over the grey hills. Later they observed how the children were working how some were setting out shrubs, while others were digging furrows and sowing seeds. Others again were pulling up heather to prevent its choking the young trees. They saw that the children took the work seriously and were so intent upon what they were doing that they scarcely had time to glance up. The fathers and mothers stood for a moment and looked on. Then they too began to pull up heather, just for the fun of it. The children were the instructors, for they were already trained and had to show their elders what to do. Thus it happened that all the grown-ups who had come to watch the children took part in the work. And then, of course, it became greater fun than before. By and by the children had even more help. Other implements were needed, so a couple of long-legged boys were sent down to the village for spades and hoes. As they ran past the cabins, the stay-at-homes came out and asked, "'What's wrong? Has there been an accident?' "'No, indeed. But the whole parish is up on the fire-swept mountain planting a forest. If the whole parish is there, we can't stay at home.' So party after party of peasants went crowding to the top of the burnt mountain. They stood a moment and looked on. The temptation to join the workers was irresistible. It's a pleasure to sow one's own acres in the spring and to think of the grain that will spring up from the earth, but this work is even more alluring, they thought. Not only slender blades would come from that sowing, but mighty trees with tall trunks and sturdy branches. It meant giving birth not merely to a summer's grain, but to many years' growths. It meant the awakening hum of insects, the song of the thrush, the play of grouse, and all kinds of life on the desolate mountain. Moreover, it was like raising a memorial for coming generations. They could have left a bare, treeless height as a heritage. Instead, they were to leave a glorious forest. Coming generations wouldn't know their forefathers had been a good and wise folk, and they would remember them with reverence and gratitude. Chapter 31 A Day in Housingland Part 1 A Large Green Leaf Thursday, June 16th the following day, the boy travelled over Housingland. It spread beneath him with new pale green shoots on the pine trees, new birch leaves in the groves, new green grass in the meadows, and sprouting grain in the fields. It was a mountainous country, but directly through it ran a broad light valley, from either side of which branched other valleys, some short and narrow, some broad and long. This land resembles a leaf, thought the boy, for it's as green as a leaf, and the valleys subdivide it in about the same ways as the veins of a leaf are foliated. The branch valleys, like the main one, were filled with lakes, rivers, farms, and villages. They snuggled, light and smiling, between the dark mountains, until they were gradually squeezed together by the hills. There they were so narrow that they could not hold more than a little brook. On the high land between the valleys there were pine forests which had no even ground to grow upon. There were mountains standing all about, and the forest covered the whole, like a woolly hide stretched over a bony body. It was a picturesque country to look down upon, and the boy saw a good deal of it, because the eagle was trying to find the old fiddler, Clement Larson, and flew from ravine to ravine looking for him. 
A little later in the morning, there was life and movement on every farm. The doors of the cattle sheds were thrown wide open, and the cows were let out. They were prettily coloured, small, supple, and sprightly, and so sure-footed that they made the most comic leaps and bounds. After them came the calves and sheep, and it was plainly to be seen that they, too, were in the best of spirits. It grew livelier every moment in the farmyards. A couple of young girls with knapsacks on their backs walked among the cattle. A boy with a long switch kept the sheep together, and a little dog ran in and out among the cows, barking at the ones that tried to gore him. The farmer hitched a horse to a cart loaded with tubs of butter, boxes of cheese, and all kinds of eatables, and the people laughed and chattered. They and the beasts were alike merry, as if looking forward to a day of real pleasure. A moment later, all were on their way to the forest. One of the girls walked in the lead and coaxed the cattle with pretty musical calls. The animals followed in a long line. The shepherd boy and the sheepdog ran hither and thither to see that no creature turned from the right course, and last came the farmer and his hired man. They walked beside the cart to prevent it being upset, for the road they followed was a narrow, stony forest path. It may have been the custom for all the peasants in Housingland to send their cattle into the forests on the same day, or perhaps it only happened so that year. At any rate, the boy saw how processions of happy people and cattle wandered out from every valley and every farm and rushed into the lonely forest, filling it with life. From the depths of the dense woods, the boy heard the shepherd maiden's songs and the tinkle of the cowbells. Many of the processions had long and difficult roads to travel, and the boy saw how they tramped through marshes, how they had to take roundabout ways to get past windfalls, and how, time and again, the carts bumped against stones and turned over with all their contents. But the people met all the obstacles with jokes and laughter. In the afternoon, they came to a cleared space where cattle sheds and a couple of rude cabins had been built. The cows mooed with delight as they tramped on the luscious green grass in the yards between the cabins, and at once began grazing. The peasants, with merry chatter and banter, carried water and wood, and all that had been brought in the carts into the larger cabin. Presently, smoke rose from the chimney, and then the dairymaids, the shepherd boy, and the men squatted upon a flat rock and ate their supper. Gorgo the eagle was certain that he should find Clement Larson among those who were off for the forest. Whenever he saw a stock farm procession, he sank down and scrutinised it with his sharp eyes. But hour after hour passed, without his finding the one he sought. After much circling round, toward evening they came to a stony and desolate tract east of the great main valley. There the boy saw another outlying stock farm under him. The people and the cattle had arrived, and the men were splitting wood, and the dairymaids were milking cows. "'Look there!' said Gorgo. "'I think we've got him!' He sank, and to his great astonishment the boy saw that the eagle was right. There, indeed, stood Clement Larson chopping wood. Gorgo alighted on a pine tree in the thick woods a little away from the house. "'I have fulfilled my obligation,' said the eagle, with a proud toss of his head. "'Now you must try and have a word with the man. I'll perch here at the top of the thick pine and wait for you.' Part 2. The Animals' New Year's Eve the day's work was done at the forest ranches. Supper was over, and the peasants sat about and chatted. It was a long time since they had been in the forest of a summer's night, and they seemed reluctant to go to bed and sleep. It was as light as day, and the dairymaids were busy with their needlework. Ever and anon they raised their heads, looked toward the forest, and smiled. Now we're here again, they said. The town with its unrest faded from their minds, and the forest with its peaceful stillness enfolded them. When at home they had wondered how they should ever be able to endure the loneliness of the woods, but once there they felt that they were having their best time. Many of the young girls and young men from neighbouring ranches had come to call upon them, so that there were quite a lot of folk seated on the grass before the cabins, but they did not find it easy to start conversation. The men were going home the next day, so the dairymaids gave them little commissions and bade them take greetings to their friends in the village. This was nearly all that had been said. Suddenly, the eldest of the dairy girls looked up from her work and said laughingly, "'There's no need of our sitting here so silent tonight, for we have two storytellers with us. One is Clement Larson, who sits beside me, and the other is Bernard from Sonasso, who stands back there gazing toward Black's Ridge.' 
I think that we should ask each of them to tell us a story. To the one who entertains us the better, I shall give the muffler I'm knitting. This proposal won hearty applause. The two competitors offered lame excuses, naturally, but were quickly persuaded. Clement asked Bernard to begin, and he did not object. He knew little of Clement Larson, but assumed that he would come out with some story about ghosts and trolls. As he knew that people liked to listen to such things, he thought it best to choose something of the same sort. Some centuries ago, he began, a dean here in Delsbow Township was riding through the dense forest on a New Year's Eve. He was on horseback, dressed in a fur coat and cap. On the pommel of his saddle hung a satchel, in which he kept the communion service, the prayer book, and the clerical robe. He had been summoned on a parochial errand to a remote forest settlement, where he had talked with a sick person until late in the evening. Now, he was on his way home, but feared he should not get back to the rectory until after midnight. As he had to sit in the saddle that he should have been at home in his bed, he was glad it was not a rough night. The weather was mild, the air still and the skies overcast. And behind the clouds hung a full round moon which gave some light, although it was out of sight. But for that faint light it would have been impossible for him to distinguish paths from fields. For that it was a snowless winter, and all things had the same greyish-brown colour. The horse the Dean rode was one he prized very highly. He was strong and sturdy, and quite as wise as a human being. He could find his way home from any place in the township. The dean had observed this on several occasions, and he relied upon it with such a sense of security that he never troubled himself to think where he was going when he rode the horse. So he came along now in the grey night, through the bewildering forest, with the reins dangling and his thoughts far away. He was thinking of the sermon he had to preach on the morrow, and of much else besides, and it was a long time before it occurred to him to notice how far along he was on his homeward way. When he did glance up, he saw that the forest was as dense about him as at the beginning, and he was somewhat surprised, for he had ridden so long that he should have come to the inhabited portion of the township. Delspo was about the same then as now. The church and parsonage and all the large farms and villages were at the northern end of the township, while at the southern part there were only forests and mountains. And the dean saw that he was still in the unpopulated district and knew that he was in the southern part and must ride to the north to get home. There were no stars, nor was there a moon to guide him, but he was a man who had the four cardinal points in his head. He had the positive feeling that he was travelling southward, or possibly eastward. He intended to turn the horse at once, but hesitated. The animal had never strayed, and it did not seem likely that he would do so now. It was more likely that the dean was mistaken. He had been far away in thought and had not looked at the road. So he let the horse continue in the same direction and again lost himself in his reverie. And suddenly a big branch struck him and almost swept him off the horse and then he realised he must find out where he was. He glanced down and saw that he was riding over a soft marsh and there was no beaten path. The horse trotted along at a brisk pace and showed no uncertainty. Again, the dean was positive that he was going in the wrong direction, and now he did not hesitate to interfere. He seized the reins and turned the horse about, guiding him back to the roadway. No sooner was he there than he turned again and made straight for the woods. The dean was certain that he was going wrong, but because the beast was so persistent, he thought that probably he was trying to find a better road and let him go along. The horse did very well, although he had no path to follow. If a precipice obstructed his way, he climbed it as nimbly as a goat, and later, when they had to descend, he bunched his hoofs and slid down the rocky inclines. "'May he only find his way home before church hour,' thought the dean. "'I wonder how the Delsbow folk would take it if I were not in my church on time.' He did not have to brood over this for long, for soon he came to a place that was familiar to him. It was a little creek where he'd fished the summer before." And now he saw it was, as he feared, he was in the depths of the forest, and the horse was plodding along in a south-easterly direction. He seemed determined to carry the dean as far from the church and rectory as he could. The clergyman dismounted. He could not let the horse carry him into the wilderness. He must go home, and since the animal persisted in going in the wrong direction, he decided to walk and lead him until they came to more familiar roads. The dean wound the reins around his arm and began to walk. 
It was not an easy matter to tramp through the forest in a heavy fur coat, but the Dean was strong and hardy and had little fear of overexertion. The horse, meanwhile, caused him fresh anxiety. He would not follow, but planted his hooves firmly on the ground. At last, the Dean was angry. He had never beaten that horse, and he did not wish to do so now. Instead, he threw down the reins and walked away. "'We may as well part company here, since you want to go your own way,' he said. He had not taken more than two steps before the horse came after him, took a cautious grip on his coat sleeve, and stopped him. The Dean turned and looked the horse straight in the eyes, as if to search out why he behaved so strangely. Afterward, the Dean could not quite understand how this was possible, but it is certain that, dark as it was, he plainly saw the horse's face and read it like that of a human being. He realised that the animal was in a terrible state of apprehension and fear. He gave his master a look that was both imploring and reproachful. "'I have served you day after day and done your bidding,' he seemed to say. "'Will you not follow me this one night?' The dean was touched by the appeal in the animal's eyes. It was clear that the horse needed his help tonight, in one way or another. Being a man through and through, the dean promptly determined to follow him. Without further delay, he sprang into the saddle. "'Go on,' he said. "'I will not desert you since you want me. No one shall say of the dean in Delsbo that he refused to accompany any creature who was in trouble.' He let the horse go, as he wished, and thought only of keeping his seat. It proved to be a hazardous and troublesome journey, uphill most of the way. The forest was so thick that he could not see two feet ahead, but it appeared to him that they were ascending a high mountain. The horse climbed perilous steeps. Had the dean been guiding, he should not have thought of riding over such ground. "'Surely you don't intend to go up to Black's Ridge, do you?' laughed the dean, who knew that was one of the highest peaks in Holsingland. During the ride, he discovered that he and the horse were not the only ones who were out that night. He heard stones roll down and branches crackle, as if animals were breaking their way through the forest. He remembered that wolves were plentiful in that section, and wondered if the horse wished to lead him to an encounter with wild beasts.' They mounted up and up, and the higher they went, the more scattered were the trees. At last they rode on almost bare highland, where the dean could look in every direction. He gazed out over immeasurable tracts of land which went up and down in mountains and valleys covered with sombre forests. It was so dark he had difficulty in seeing any orderly arrangement, but presently he could make out where he was. "'Why, of course, it's Black Ridge that I've come to,' he remarked to himself. "'It can't be any other mountain, for there in the west I see Jarv Island, "'and to the east the sea glitters around Ag Island. And "'Toward the north also I see something shiny. It must be Delin. "'In the depths below me I see white smoke from Neon Falls. "'Yes, I'm up on Black's Ridge. What an adventure!' "'When they were at the summit, the horse stopped behind a thick pine, as if to hide.' The dean bent forward and pushed aside the branches that he might have an unobstructed view. The mountain's bald plate confronted him. It was not empty and desolate, as he'd anticipated. In the middle of the open space was an immense boulder around which many wild beasts had gathered. Apparently, they were holding a conclave of some sort. Near to the big rock he saw bears, so firmly and heavily built that they seemed like fur-clad blocks of stone. They were lying down, and their little eyes blinked impatiently. It was obvious they had come from their winter's sleep to attend court, and that they could hardly keep awake. And behind them, in tight rows, were hundreds of wolves. They were not sleepy, for wolves are more alert in winter than in the summer. They sat upon their haunches like dogs, whipping the ground with their tails and panting, their tongues lolling far out of their jaws. And behind the wolves, the lynx skulked, stiff-legged and clumsy, like misshapen cats. They were loath to be among the other beasts, and hissed and spat when one came near them. The row back of the lynx was occupied by the wolverines, with dog faces and bear coats. They were not happy on the ground, and they stamped their pads impatiently, longing to get into the trees. 
Behind them, covering the entire space to the forest border, leaped the foxes, uh, the weasels and the martins. These were small and perfectly formed, but they looked even more savage and bloodthirsty than the larger beasts. All this the dean plainly saw, for the whole place was illuminated. Upon the huge rock at the centre was the wood nymph who held in her hand a pine torch which burned in a big red flame. The nymph was as tall as the tallest tree in the forest. She wore a spruce brush mantle and had spruce cone hair. As she stood very still, her face turned toward the forest. She was watching and listening. The dean saw everything as plain as plain could be, but his astonishment was so great that he tried to combat it and would not believe the evidence of his own eyes. Such things cannot possibly happen, he thought. I have ridden much too long in the bleak forest. This is only an optical illusion. Nevertheless, he gave the closest attention to the spectacle and wondered what was about to be done. He hadn't long to wait before he caught the sound of a familiar bell coming from the depths of the forest, and the next moment he heard footfalls and crackling of branches, as when many animals break through the forest. A big herd of cattle was climbing the mountain. They came through the forest in the order in which they had marched to the mountain ranches. First came the bell cow, followed by the bull, then the other cows and the calves. The sheep, closely herded, followed. After them came the goats, and last were the horses and colts. The sheepdog trotted along beside the sheep, but neither shepherd nor shepherdess attended them. The dean thought it heartrending to see the tame animals coming straight toward the wild beasts. He would gladly have blocked their way and called halt, but he understood that it was not within human power to stop the march of the cattle on this night. Therefore, he made no move. The domestic animals were in a state of torment over that which they had to face. If it happened to be the cowbell's turn, she advanced with drooping head and faltering step. The goats had no desire either to play or to butt, and the horses tried to bear up bravely, but their bodies were all of a quiver with fright. The most pathetic of all was the sheepdog. He kept his tail between his legs and crawled on the ground. The bell cow led the procession all the way up to the wood nymph, who stood on the boulder at the top of the mountain, and the cow walked around the rock and then turned toward the forest without any of the wild beasts touching her. In the same way, all the cattle walked unmolested past the wild beasts. As the creatures filed past, the dean saw the wood nymph lower her pine torch over one and another of them. Every time this occurred, the beasts of prey broke into loud, exultant roars, particularly when it was lowered over a cow or some other large creature. The animal that saw the torch turning toward it uttered a piercing shriek, as if it had received a knife thrust into its flesh, while the entire herd to which it belonged billowed their lamentations. Then the dean began to comprehend the meaning of what he saw. Surely he had heard that the animals in Delsbo assembled on Black's Ridge every New Year's Eve, that the wood nymph might mark out which among the tame beasts would that year be prey for the wild beasts. The dean pitied the poor creatures that were at the mercy of savage beasts, when in reality they should have no master but man. The leading herd had only just left, when another bell tinkled, and the cattle from another farm tramped up to the mountain top. These came in the same order as the first and marched past the wood nymph who stood there, stern and solemn, indicating animal after animal for death. Herd upon herd followed, without a break in the line of procession. Some were so small that they included only one cow and a few sheep. Others consisted of only a pair of goats. It was apparent that these were from very humble homes, but they too were compelled to pass in review. The dean thought of the Delsbo farmers, who had so much love for their beasts. Did they but know of it, surely they would not allow a repetition of this, he thought. They would risk their own lives rather than let their cattle wander amongst bears and wolves to be doomed by the wood nymph. The last herd to appear was the one from the rectory farm. The dean heard the sound of the familiar bell a long way off. The horse, too, must have heard it, for he began to shake in every limb and was bathed in sweat. So 
It's your turn now to pass before the wood nymph to receive your sentence, the dean said to the horse. Uh, don't be afraid. Now I know why you brought me here, and I shall not leave you. The fine cattle from the parsonage farm emerged from the forest and marched to the wood nymph and the wild beasts. Last in the line was the horse that had brought his master to Black's Ridge. The dean did not leave the saddle, but let the animal take him to the wood nymph. He had neither knife nor gun for his defence, but he had taken out the prayer book and sat pressing it to his heart as he exposed himself to the battle against evil. At first it appeared as if none had observed him. The dean's cattle filed past the wood nymph in the same order as the others had done. She did not wave the torch toward any of these, but as soon as the intelligent horse stepped forward, she made a movement to mark him for death. Instantly, the dean held up the prayer book, and the torchlight fell upon the cross on its cover. The wood nymph uttered a loud, shrill cry, and let the torch drop from her hand. Immediately, the flame was extinguished. In the sudden transition from light to darkness, the dean saw nothing, nor did he hear anything. About him reigned the profound stillness of a wilderness in winter. Then the dark clouds parted, and through the opening stepped the full round moon to shed its light upon the ground. The dean saw that he and the horse were alone on the summit of Black's Ridge. Not one of the many wild beasts was there. The ground had not been trampled by the herds that had passed over it, but the dean himself sat with his prayer book before him, while the horse under him stood trembling and foaming. By the time the dean reached home, he no longer knew whether or not it had been a dream, a vision or reality, this that he had seen, but he took it as a warning to him to remember the poor creatures who were at the mercy of wild beasts. He preached so powerfully to the Delsbo peasants that in his day all the wolves and bears were exterminated from that section of the country, although they may have returned since his time. Here Bernard ended his story. He received praise from all sides, and it seems to be a foregone conclusion that he would get the prize. The majority thought it almost a pity that Clement had to compete with him. But Clement, undaunted, began. Uh, one day, uh, while I was living at Scanson, just outside of Stockholm, and longing for home, then he told about the tiny midget he had ransomed so that he would not have to be confined in a cage to be stared at by all the people. He told also that no sooner had he performed this act of mercy than he was rewarded for it. He talked and talked, and the astonishment of his hearers grew greater and greater. But when he came to the royal lackey and the beautiful book, all the dairy maids dropped their needlework and sat staring at Clement in open-eyed wonder at his marvellous experiences. As soon as Clement had finished, the eldest of the dairy maids announced that he should have the muffler. Bernhard related only things that happened to another, but Clement has himself been the hero of a true story which I consider far more important. In this all concurred, they regarded Clement with very different eyes after hearing that he had talked with the king, and the little fiddler was afraid to show how proud he felt, but at the very height of his elation, someone asked him what had become of the midget. I had no time to set out the blue bowl for him myself, said Clement, so I asked the old Laplander to do it. What has become of him since, I don't know. No sooner had he spoken than a little pine cone came along and struck him on the nose. It did not drop from a tree, and none of the peasants had thrown it. It was simply impossible to tell whence it had come. Aha, Clement, winked the dairymaid. It appears as if the tiny folk were listening to us. You should not have left it to another to set out that blue bowl. Chapter 32 In Medalpad, Friday, June 17th The boy and the eagle were out bright and early the next morning. Gorgo hoped that he would get far up into West Bosnia that day, as luck would have it, he heard the boy remark to himself that in a country like the one through which they were now travelling, it must be impossible for people to live. The land which spread below them was southern Medalpad. When the eagle heard the boy's remark, he replied, Up here they have forests for fields. 
The boy thought of the contrast between the light golden rye fields with their delicate blades that spring up in one summer, and the dark spruce forest with its solid trees which took many years to ripen for harvest. One who has to get his livelihood from such a field must have a deal of patience, he observed. Nothing more was said until they came to a place where the forest had been cleared and the ground was covered with stumps and lopped off branches. As they flew over this ground, the eagle heard the boy mutter to himself that it was a mighty ugly and poverty-stricken place. This field was cleared last winter, said the eagle. The boy thought of the harvesters at home who rode on their reaping machines on fine summer mornings, and in a short time mowed a large field. But the forest field was harvested in winter. The lumbermen went out in the wilderness when the snow was deep and the cold most severe. It was tedious work to fell even one tree, and to hew down a forest such as this, they must have been out in the open many weeks. They have to be hardy men to mow a field of this kind, he said. When the eagle had taken two more wing strokes, they sighted a log cabin at the edge of the clearing. It had no windows and only two loose boards for a door. The roof had been covered with bark and twigs, but now it was gaping, and the boy could see that inside the cabin there were only a few big stones to serve as a fireplace, and two board benches. When they were above the cabin, the eagle suspected that the boy was wondering who could have lived in such a wretched hut as that. The reapers who mowed the forest field lived there, the eagle said. The boy remembered how the reapers in his home had returned from their day's work cheerful and happy, and how the best his mother had in the larder was always spread for them. While here, after the arduous work of the day, they must rest on hard benches in a cabin that was worse than an outhouse, and what they had to eat he could not imagine. "'I wonder if there are any harvest festivals for these labourers?' he questioned. A little farther on, they saw below them a wretchedly bad road winding through the forest. It was narrow and zigzag, hilly and stony, and cut up by brooks in many places. As they flew over it, the eagle knew that the boy was wondering what was carted over a road like that. Over this road the harvest was conveyed to the stack, the eagle said. The boy recalled what fun they had at home when the harvest wagons drawn by two sturdy horses carried the grain from the field. The man who drove sat proudly on top of the load. The horses danced and pricked up their ears, while the village children who were allowed to climb upon the sheaves sat there laughing and shrieking, half pleased, half frightened. But here the great logs were drawn up and down steep hills. Here the poor horses must be worked to their limit, and the driver must often be in peril. I'm afraid there has been very little cheer along this road, the boy observed. The eagle flew on with powerful wing strokes, and soon they came to a river bank covered with logs, chips and bark. The eagle perceived that the boy wondered why it looked so littered up down there. Here the harvest has been stacked, the eagle told him. The boy thought of how the grain stacks in his part of the country were piled up close to the farms, as if they were their greatest ornaments, while here the harvest was borne to a desolate river strand and left there. I wonder if anyone out in this wilderness counts his stacks and compares them with his neighbours, he said. A little later they came to Lyungan, a river which glides through a broad valley. Immediately everything was so changed that they might well think they had come to another country. The dark spruce forest had stopped on the inclines above the valley, and the slopes were clad in light-stemmed birches and aspens. The valley was so broad that in many places the river widened into lakes. Along the shores lay a large, flourishing town. As they soared above the valley, the eagle realised that the boy was wondering if the fields and meadows here could provide a livelihood for so many people. Here live the reapers who mow the forest fields, the eagle said. The boy was thinking of the lowly cabins and the hedged-in farms down in Skane when he exclaimed, Why, here the peasants live in real manners. It looks as if it might be worth one's while to work in the forest. The eagle had intended to travel straight north, but when he had flown out over the river, he understood that the boy wondered who handled the timber after it was stacked on the river bank. The boy recollected how careful they had been at home never to let a grain be wasted, while here were great rafts of logs floating down the river uncared for. He could not believe that more than half of the logs ever reached their destination. Many were floating in midstream, and for them all went smoothly. Others moved close to the shore, bumping against points of land, and some were left behind in the still waters of the creeks. 
On the lakes, there were so many logs that they covered the entire surface of the water. These appeared to be lodged for an indefinite period. At the bridges, they stuck. In the falls, they were punched. Then they were pyramided and broken in two. Afterward, in the rapids, they were blocked by the stones and massed into great heaps. I wonder how long it takes for the logs to get to the mill, said the boy. The eagle continued his slow flight down River Lyungan. Over many places he paused in the air on outspread wings, that the boy might see how this kind of harvest work was done. Presently they came to a place where the loggers were at work. The eagle marked that the boy wondered what they were doing. They are the ones who take care of the belated harvest, the eagle said. The boy remembered the perfect ease with which his people at home had driven their grain to the mill. Here the men ran alongside the shores with long boat hooks and with toil and effort urged the logs along. They waded out in the river and were soaked from top to toe. They jumped from stone to stone far out into the rapids, and they tramped on the rolling log heaps as calmly as though they were on flat ground. They were daring and resolute men. As I watch this, I'm reminded of the iron moulders in the mining districts who juggle with fire as if it were perfectly harmless, remarked the boy. These loggers play with water as if they were its masters. They seem to have subjugated it so that it dare not harm them. Gradually they neared the mouth of the river, and Bothnia Bay was beyond them. Gorgo flew no farther straight ahead, but went northward along the coast. Before they had travelled very far, they saw a lumber camp as large as a small city. While the eagle circled back and forth above it, he heard the boy remark that this place looked interesting. "'Here you have the great lumber camp called Svartvik,' the eagle said. The boy thought of the mill at home, which stood peacefully embedded in foliage, and moved its wings very slowly. This mill, where they grind the forest harvest, stood on the water. The mill pond was crowded with logs. One by one the helpers seized them with their cant hooks, crowded them into the chutes, and hurried them along to the whirling saws. What happened to the logs inside, the boy could not see, but he heard loud buzzing and roaring, and from the other end of the house small cars ran out, loaded with white planks. The cars ran on shining tracks down to the lumber yard, where the planks were piled in rows, forming streets like blocks of houses in a city. In one place they were building new piles, in another they were pulling down old ones. These were carried aboard two large vessels which lay waiting for cargo. The place was alive with workmen, and in the woods, back of the yard, they had their homes. They'll soon manage to saw up all the forests in metal pad the way they work here, said the boy. The eagle moved his wings just a little, and carried the boy above another large camp, very much like the first, with the mill, yard, wharf, and the homes of the workmen. This is called Kukikenborg, the eagle said. He flapped his wings slowly flew past two big lumber camps and approached a large city. When the eagle heard the boy ask the name of it, he cried, This is Sundsvall, the manor of lumber districts. The boy remembered the cities of Skane, which looked so old and grey and solemn, while here, in the bleak north, the city of Sundsvall faced a beautiful bay, and looked young and happy and beaming. There was something odd about the city when one saw it from above, for in the middle stood a cluster of tall stone structures which looked so imposing that their match was hardly to be found in Stockholm. Around the stone buildings there was a large open space. Then came a wreath of frame houses which looked pretty and cosy in their little gardens. But they seemed to be conscious of the fact that they were very much poorer than the stone houses, and dared not venture into their neighbourhood. This must be both a wealthy and powerful city, remarked the boy. Can it be possible that the poor forest soil is the source of all this? The eagle flapped his wings again, and went over to Alna Island, which lies opposite Sundsvall. The boy was greatly surprised to see all the sawmills that decked the shores. On Alna Island they stood, one next another, and on the mainland opposite were mill upon mill, lumber yard upon lumber yard. He counted forty, at least, but believed there were many more. How wonderful it all looks from up here, he marvelled. So much life and activity I've not seen in any place save this on the whole trip. It's a great country that we have. Wherever I go, there's always something new for people to live upon. Chapter 33 A Morning in Engermanland Part 1 The Bread Saturday 
June 18th. Next morning, when the eagle had flown some distance into Angermanland, he remarked that today he was the one who was hungry and must find something to eat. He set the boy down in an enormous pine on a high mountain ridge, and away he flew. The boy found a comfortable seat in a cleft branch from which he could look down over Angermanland. It was a glorious morning. The sunshine gilded the treetops. A soft breeze played in the pine needles. The sweetest fragrance was wafted through the forest. A beautiful landscape spread before him, and the boy himself was happy and carefree. He felt that no one could be better off. He had a perfect outlook in every direction. The country west of him was all peaks and tableland, and the farther away they were, the higher and wilder they looked. To the east there were also many peaks, but these sank lower and lower toward the sea, where the land became perfectly flat. Everywhere he saw shining rivers and brooks, which were having a troublesome journey with rapids and falls, so long as they ran between mountains, but spread out clear and broad as they neared the shore of the coast. Bothnia Bay was dotted with islands and notched with points, but farther out was open blue water, like a summer sky. When the boy had had enough of the landscape, he unloosed his knapsack, took out a morsel of fine white bread, and began to eat. "'I don't think I've ever tasted such good bread,' said he, "'and how much I have left, there's enough to last me for a couple of days.' As he munched, he thought of how he had come by the bread. "'It must be because I got it in such a nice way that it tastes so good to me,' he said. The Golden Eagle had left Medalpat the evening before. He had hardly crossed the border into Engermanland when the boy caught a glimpse of a fertile valley and a river which surpassed anything of the kind he had seen before. As the boy glanced down at the rich valley, he complained of feeling hungry. He had had no food for two whole days, he said, and now he was famished. Gorgo did not wish to have it said that the boy had fared worse in his company than when he travelled with the wild geese, so he slackened his speed. "'Why haven't you spoken of this before?' he asked. "'You shall have all the food you want. There's no need of your starving when you have an eagle for a travelling companion.' Just then, the eagle sighted a farmer who was sowing a field near the river strand. The man carried the seeds in a basket suspended from his neck, and each time that it was emptied he refilled it from a seed sack which stood at the end of the furrow. The eagle reasoned it out, that the sack must be filled with the best food the boy could wish for, so he darted toward it. But before the bird could get there, a terrible clamour arose about him. Sparrows, crows and swallows came rushing up with wild shrieks, thinking that the eagle meant to swoop down upon some bird. Away! Away, robber! Away! Away, bird killer! They cried. They made such a racket that it attracted the farmer, who came running, so that Gorgo had to flee, and the boy got no seed. The small birds behaved in the most extraordinary manner. Not only did they force the eagle to flee, they pursued him a long distance down the valley, and everywhere the people heard their cries. Women came out and clapped their hands so that it sounded like a volley of musketry, and the men rushed out with rifles. The same thing was repeated every time the eagle swept toward the ground. The boy abandoned the hope that the eagle could procure any food for him. It had never occurred to him before that Gorgo was so much hated. He almost pitied him. In a little while they came to a homestead where the housewife had just been baking. She had set a platter of sugared buns in the backyard to cool and was standing beside it, watching, so that the cat and dog should not steal the buns. The eagle circled down to the yard, but dared not alight right under the eyes of the peasant woman. He flew up and down. Irresolute, twice he came down as far as the chimney, then rose again. The peasant woman noticed the eagle. She raised her head and followed him with her glance. "'How peculiar he acts!' she remarked. I believe he wants one of my buns. She was a beautiful woman, tall and fair, with a cheery open countenance. Laughing heartily, she took a bun from the platter and held it above her head. If you want it, come and take it, she challenged. While the eagle did not understand her language, he knew at once that she was offering him the bun. With lightning speed, he swooped to the bread, snatched it, and flew toward the heights. When the boy saw the eagle snatch the bread, he wept for joy not because he would escape suffering hunger for a few days, but because he was touched by the peasant woman's sharing her bread with a savage bird of prey. 
where he now sat on the pine branch, he could recall at will the tall fair woman as she stood in the yard and held up the bread. She must have known that the large bird was a golden eagle, a plunderer, who was usually welcomed with loud shots. Doubtless she had also seen the queer changeling he bore on his back, but she had not thought of what they were. As soon as she understood that they were hungry, she shared her good bread with them. "'If I ever become human again,' thought the boy, "'I shall look up the pretty woman who lives near the great river "'and thank her for her kindness to us.'" Part 2. The Forest Fire While the boy was still at his breakfast, he smelled a faint odour of smoke coming from the north. He turned and saw a tiny spiral, white as a mist, rise from a forest ridge, not from the one nearest him, but from the one beyond it. It looked strange to see smoke in the wild forest, but it might be that a mountain stock farm lay over yonder, and the women were boiling their morning coffee. It was remarkable the way that smoke increased and spread. It could not come from a ranch, but perhaps there were charcoal kilns in the forest. The smoke increased every moment. Now it curled over the mountain top. It was not possible that so much smoke could come from a charcoal kiln. There must be a conflagration of some sort, for many birds flew over to the nearest ridge. Hawks, grouse, and other birds, who were so small that it was impossible to recognise them at such a distance, fled from the fire. The tiny white spiral of smoke grew to a thick white cloud, which rolled over the edge of the ridge and sank toward the valley. Sparks and flakes of soot shot up from the clouds, and here and there one could see a red flame in the smoke. A big fire was raging over there, but what was burning? Surely there was no large farm hidden in the forest. The source of such a fire must be more than a farm. And now the smoke came not only from the ridge, but from the valley below it, which the boy could not see, because the next ridge obstructed his view. Great clouds of smoke ascended. The forest itself was burning. It was difficult for him to grasp the idea that the fresh green pines could burn, if it really were the forest that was burning, uh, perhaps the fire might spread all the way over to him. It seemed improbable, but he wished the eagle would soon return. It would be best to be away from this. The mere smell of the smoke which he drew in with every breath was a torture. All at once he heard a terrible crackling and sputtering. It came from the ridge nearest him. There, on the highest point, stood a tall pine, like the one in which he sat. A moment before... It had been a gorgeous red in the morning light. Now all the needles flashed and the pine caught fire. Never before had it looked so beautiful. But this was the last time it could exhibit any beauty, for the pine was the first tree on the ridge to burn. It was impossible to tell how the flames had reached it. Had the fire flown on red wings or crawled along the ground like a snake? It was not easy to say, but there it was at all events. The great pine burned like a birch stem. Ah, look, now smoke curled up in many places on the ridge. The forest fire was both bird and snake. It could fly in the air over wide stretches or steal along the ground. The whole ridge was ablaze. There was a hasty flight of birds that circled up through the smoke like big flakes of soot. They flew across the valley and came to the ridge where the boy sat. A horned owl perched beside him, and on a branch just above him, a henhawk alighted. These would have been dangerous neighbours at any other time, but now they did not even glance in his direction, only stared at the fire. Probably they could not make out what was wrong with the forest. A marten rang up the pine to the tip of a branch and looked at the burning heights. Close beside the marten sat a squirrel, but they did not appear to notice each other. Now the fire came rushing down the slope, hissing and roaring like a tornado. Through the smoke one could see the flames dart from tree to tree. Before a branch caught fire, it was first enveloped in a thin veil of smoke. Then all the needles grew red at one time, and it began to crackle and blaze. In the glen below ran a little brook, bordered by elms and small birches. It appeared as if the flaky trees are not so ready to take fire as fir trees. The fire did not pause, as if before a gate that could stop it. It glowed and crackled and tried to leap across the brook to the pine woods on the other side, but could not reach them. For a short time the fire was thus restrained. Then it shot a long flame over to the large, dry pine that stood on the slope, and this was soon ablaze. 
The fire had crossed the brook. The heat was so intense that every tree on the mountain was ready to burn. With the roar and rush of the maddest storm and the wildest torrent, the forest fire flew over to the ridge. Then the hawk and the owl rose and the marten dashed down the tree. In a few seconds more, the fire would reach the top of the pine and the boy, too, would have to be moving. It was not easy to slide down the long, straight pine trunk. He took as firm a hold of it as he could and slid in long stretches between the knotty branches. Finally, he tumbled headlong to the ground. He had no time to find out if he was hurt, only to hurry away. The fire raced down the pine like a raging tempest. The ground under his feet was hot and smouldering. On either side of him ran a lynx and an adder, and right beside the snake fluttered a mother grouse who was hurrying along with her little downy chicks. When the refugees descended the mountain to the glen, they met people fighting the fire. They had been there for some time, but the boy had been gazing so intently in the direction of the fire that he had not noticed them before. In this glen there was a brook, bordered by a row of leaf trees, and back of these trees the people worked. They felled the fir trees nearest the elms, dipped water from the brook, and poured it over the ground, washing away heather and myrtle, to prevent the fire from stealing up to the birch brush. They, too, thought only of the fire, which was now rushing towards them. The fleeing animals ran in and out among the men's feet without attracting attention. No one struck at the adder or tried to catch the mother grouse as she ran back and forth with her little peeping birdlings. They did not even bother about Thumbietot. In their hands they held great charred pine branches which had dropped into the brook, and it appeared as if they intended to challenge the fire with these weapons. There were not many men, and it was strange to see them stand there, ready to fight, when all other living creatures were fleeing. As the fire came roaring and rushing down the slope with its intolerable heat and suffocating smoke, ready to hurl itself over brook and leaf tree wall in order to reach the opposite shore without having to pause, the people drew back at first as if unable to withstand it. But they did not flee far before they turned back. The conflagration raged with savage force, sparks poured like a rain of fire over the leaf trees, and long tongues of flame shot hissingly out from the smoke as if the forest on the other side was sucking them in, but the leaf tree wall was an obstruction behind which the men worked. When the ground began to smoulder, they brought water in their vessels and dampened it. When a tree became wreathed in smoke, they felled it at once, threw it down, and put out the flames. Where the fire crept along the heather, they beat it with the wet pine branches and smothered it. The smoke was so dense that it enveloped everything. One could not possibly see how the battle was going, but it was easy enough to understand that it was a hard fight, and that several times the fire came near penetrating farther. But think, after a while the loud roar of the flames decreased, and the smoke cleared. By that time the leaf trees had lost all their foliage. The ground under them was charred. The faces of the men were blackened by smoke and dripping with sweat, but the forest fire was conquered. It had ceased to flame up. Soft white smoke crept along the ground, and from it peeped out a lot of black stumps. This was all there was left of the beautiful forest. The boy scrambled up on a rock so that he might see how the fire had been quenched. But now the forest was saved, his peril began. The owl and the hawk simultaneously turned their eyes toward him. Just then he heard a familiar voice calling to him. Gorgo, the golden eagle, came sweeping through the forest, and soon the boy was soaring among the clouds, rescued from every peril. Chapter 34 West Bottom and Lapland Part 1. The Five Scouts Once at Skansen, the boy had sat under the steps at Bolness Cottage and had overheard Clement Larsen and the old Laplander talk about Norland. Both agreed that it was the most beautiful part of Sweden. Clement thought that the southern part was the best, while the Laplander favoured the northern part. As they argued, it became plain that Clement had never been farther north than Harnesand. The Laplander laughed at him for speaking with such assurances of places that he had never seen. "'I think I shall have to tell you a story, Clement, to give you some idea of Lapland, since you have not seen it,' volunteered the Laplander. 
"'It shall not be said of me that I refuse to listen to a story,' retorted Clement, and the old Laplander began. "'It once happened that the birds who lived down in Sweden, south of the Great Samelin, thought that they were overcrowded there, and suggested moving northward. They came together to consider the matter. The young and eager birds wished to start at once, but the older and wiser ones passed a resolution to send scouts to explore the new country.' "'Let each of the five great bird families send out a scout,' said the old and wise birds, "'to learn if there's a room for us all up there, food and hiding places.' Five intelligent and capable birds were immediately appointed by the five great bird families. The forest birds selected a grouse, the field birds a lark, the sea birds a gull, the freshwater birds a loon, and the cliff birds a snow sparrow. When the five chosen ones were ready to start, the grouse, who was the largest and most commanding, said, "'There are great stretches of land ahead. If we travel together, it will be long before we cover all the territory that we must explore. If, on the other hand, we travel singly, each one exploring his special portion of the country, the whole business can be accomplished in a few days.' The other scouts thought the suggestion a good one and agreed to act upon it. It was decided that the grouse should explore the Midlands. The lark was to travel to the eastward. The seagull, still farther east, where the land bordered on the sea, while the loon would fly over the territory west of the Midlands and the snow sparrow to the extreme west. In accordance with this plan, the five birds flew over the whole Northland. Then they turned back and told the assembly of birds what they discovered. The gull, who had travelled along the sea coast, spoke first. The North is a fine country, he said. The sounds are full of fish, and there are points and islands without number. Most of those are uninhabited, and the birds will find plenty of room there. The humans do a little fishing and sailing in the sounds, but not enough to disturb the birds. If the sea birds follow my advice, they will move north immediately. When the gull had finished, the lark, who had explored the land back from the coast, spoke. I don't know what the gull means by his islands and points, said the lark. I have travelled only over great fields and flowery meadows. I have never before seen a country crossed by some large streams. Their shores are dotted with homesteads, and the mouth of the rivers are cities. Uh, but for the most part, the country is very desolate. If the field birds follow my advice, they will move north immediately. After the lark came the grouse, who had flown over the Midlands. I know neither what the lark means with his meadows nor the gull with his islands and points, said he. I have only seen pine forests on this whole trip. There are also many rushing streams and great stretches of moss-grown swampland. But all that is not river or swamp is forest. If the forest birds follow my advice, they will move north immediately. After the grouse came the loon who had explored the borderland to the west. I don't know what the grouse means by his forests, nor do I know where the eyes of the lark and the gull could have been, remarked the loon. There's hardly any land out there, only big lakes. Between beautiful shores glisten clear blue mountain lakes, which pour into roaring waterfalls. If the fresh water birds follow my advice, they will move north immediately. The last speaker was the snow sparrow, who had flown along the western boundary. I don't know what the loon means by his lakes, nor do I know what countries the grouse the lark, and the gull can have seen, he said. I found one vast mountainous region up north. It didn't run across any fields or any pine forests, but peak after peak and highlands. I have seen ice fields and snow and mountain brooks with water as white as milk. No farmers, nor cattle, nor homesteads have I seen, uh, but only laps and reindeer and huts met my eyes. If the cliff birds follow my advice, they will move north immediately. When the five scouts had presented their reports to the assembly, they began to call one another liars, and were ready to fly at each other to prove the truth of their arguments. But the old and wise birds who had sent them out listened to their accounts with joy, 
and calmed their fighting propensities. "'You mustn't quarrel among yourselves,' they said. "'We understand from your reports that up north there are large mountain tracts, "'a big lake region, great forest lands, a wide plain, and a big group of islands. "'This is more than we have expected, more than many a mighty kingdom can boast within its borders.' Part 2 the Moving Landscape Saturday, June 18th The boy had been reminded of the old Laplander's story because he himself was now travelling over the country of which he'd spoken. The eagle told him that the expanse of coast which spread beneath them was West Bottom and that the blue ridges far to the west were in Lapland. Only to be once more seated comfortably on Gorgo's back after all that he had suffered during the forest fire was a pleasure. Besides, they were having a fine trip. The flight was so easy that at times it seemed as if they were standing still in the air. The eagle beat and beat his wings without appearing to move from the spot. On the other hand, everything under them seemed in motion. The whole earth and all things on it moved slowly southward. The forests, the fields, the fences, the rivers, the cities, the islands, the sawmills, all were on the march. The boy wondered whither they were bound. Had they grown tired of standing so far north and wished to move toward the south? Amid all the objects in motion, there was only one that stood still. That was a railway train. It stood directly under them, for it was with the train as with Gorgo, it could not move from the spot. The locomotive sent forth smoke and sparks. The clatter of the wheels could be heard all the way up to the boy, but the train did not seem to move. The forests rushed by, the flag station rushed by, fences and telegraph poles rushed by, but the train stood still. A broad river with a long bridge came toward it, but the river and the bridge glided along under the train with perfect ease. Finally, a railway station appeared, the station master stood on the platform with his red flag and moved slowly toward the train. When he waved his little flag, the locomotive belched even darker smoke curls than before and whistled mournfully because it had to stand still. All of a sudden, it began to move toward the south, like everything else. The boy saw all the coach doors open and the passengers step out while both cars and people were moving southward. He glanced away from the earth and tried to look straight ahead. Staring at the queer railway train had made him dizzy, but after he'd gazed for a moment at a little white cloud, he was tired of that and looked down again, thinking all the while that the eagle and himself were quite still and that everything else was travelling on south. Fancy! Suppose the grain field just then running along under him, which must have been newly sown for he'd seen a green blade on it, were to travel all the way down to Skane, where the rye was in full bloom at this season. Up here, the pine forests were different, the trees were bare, the branches short, and the needles were almost black. Many trees were bald at the top and looked sickly. If a forest like that were to journey down to Colmarden and see a real forest, how inferior it would feel. The gardens which he now saw had some pretty bushes, but no fruit trees or lindens or chestnut trees, only mountain ash and birch. There were some vegetable beds, but they were not as yet hoed or planted. If such an apology for a garden were to come trailing into Sormland, the province of gardens, wouldn't it think itself a poor wilderness by comparison? Imagine an immense plain, like the one now gliding beneath him, coming under the very eyes of the poor Smallland peasants. They would hurry away from their meagre garden plots and stony fields to begin ploughing and sowing. There was one thing, however, of which this Northland had more than other lands, and that was light. Night must have set in, for the crane stood sleeping on the morass, but it was as light as day. The sun had not travelled southward like every other thing. Instead, it had gone so far north that it shone in the boy's face. To all appearance, it had no notion of setting that night. If this light and this sun were only shining on West Femenhog, it would suit the boy's father and mother to a dot to have a working day that lasted 24 hours. Sunday, June 19th. The boy raised his head and looked around, perfectly bewildered. It was mighty queer. Here he lay, sleeping in some place where he'd not been before. No, 
He'd never seen this glen, nor the mountains round about, and never had he noticed such puny and shrunken birches as those under which he now lay. Where was the eagle? The boy could see no sign of him. Gorgo must have deserted him. Well, here was another adventure. The boy lay down again, closed his eyes, and tried to recall the circumstances under which he had dropped asleep. He remembered that as long as he was travelling over Westbottom, he had fancied that the eagle and he were at a standstill in the air, and that the land under them was moving southward. Was the eagle turned northwest, the wind had come from that side, and again he had felt a current of air, so that the land below had stopped moving, and he had noticed that the eagle was bearing him onward with terrific speed. "'Now we're flying into Lapland,' Gorgo had said, and the boy had bent forward, so that he might see the country of which he had heard so much. But he had felt rather disappointed at not seeing anything but great tracts of forest land and wide marshes. Forest followed marsh, and marsh followed forest. The monotony of the hole finally made him sleepy, and he had nearly dropped to the ground. He said to the eagle that he could not stay on his back another minute, but must sleep a while. Gorgo had promptly swooped to the ground, where the boy had dropped down on a moss tuft. Then Gorgo put a talon around him and soared into the air with him again. "'Go to sleep, Thumbietot!' he cried. "'The sunshine keeps me awake, and I want to continue the journey.' Although the boy hung in this uncomfortable position, he actually dozed and dreamed. He dreamed that he was on a broad road in southern Sweden, hurrying along as fast as his little legs would carry him. He was not alone. Many wayfarers were tramping in the same direction. Close beside him marched grain-filled rye blades, blossoming cornflowers and yellow daisies. Heavily laden apple trees were puffing along, followed by vine-covered beanstalks, big clusters of white daisies and masses of berry bushes. Tall beeches and oaks and lindens strolled leisurely in the middle of the road, their branches swaying, and they stepped aside for none. Between the boy's tiny feet darted the little flowers, wild strawberry blossoms, white anemones, clover and forget-me-nots. At first he thought that only the vegetable family was on the march, but presently he saw that animals and people accompanied them. The insects were buzzing around advancing bushes, the fishes were swimming in moving ditches, and the birds were singing in strolling trees. Both tame and wild beasts were racing, and amongst all this people moved along, some with spades and scythes, others with axes, and others again with fishing nets. The procession marched with gladness and gaiety, and he did not wonder at that when he saw who was leading it. It was nothing less than the sun itself that rolled on like a great shining head with hair of many-hued rays, and a countenance beaming with merriment and kindliness. A forward march, it kept calling out. None need feel anxious whilst I'm here. A forward march. I wonder where the sun wants to take us to, remarked the boy. A rye blade that walked beside him had heard him, and immediately answered, "'He wants to take us up to Lapland to fight the ice witch.' Presently the boy noticed that some of the travellers hesitated, slowed up, and finally stood quite still. He saw that the tall beech tree stopped, and that the roebuck and the wheat blade tarried by the wayside. Likewise the blackberry bush, the little yellow buttercup, the chestnut tree, and the grouse. He glanced about him and tried to reason out why so many stopped. Then he discovered that they were no longer in southern Sweden. The march had been so rapid that they were already in Zvealand. Up there the oak began to move more cautiously. It paused a while to consider, took a few faltering steps, then came to a standstill. "'Why doesn't the oak come along?' asked the boy. "'It's afraid of the ice witch,' said a fair young birch, that tripped along so boldly and cheerfully that it was a joy to watch it. The crowd hurried on as before. In a short time they were in Norland, and now it mattered not how much the sun cried and coaxed. The apple tree stopped. The cherry tree stopped. The rye blade stopped. The boy turned to them and asked, "'Why don't you come along? Why do you desert the sun?' "'We dare not!' "'We're afraid of the ice witch who lives in Lapland,' they answered. The boy comprehended that they were far north as the procession grew thinner and thinner. The rye blade, the barley, the wild strawberry, the blueberry bush, the pea stalk, the currant bush had come along as far as this. The elk and the domestic cow had been walking side by side. 
but now they stopped. The sun, no doubt, would have been almost deserted if new followers had not happened along. Osier bushes and a lot of brushy vegetation joined the procession. Laps and reindeer, mountain owl and mountain fox, and willow grouse followed. Then the boy heard something coming toward them. He saw great rivers and creeks sweeping along with terrible force. Why are they in such a hurry? he asked. They are running away from the ice witch who lives up in the mountains. All of a sudden, the boy saw before him a high, dark, turreted wall. Instantly, the sun turned its beaming face toward this wall and flooded it with light. Then it became apparent that it was no wall, but the most glorious mountains, which loomed up, one behind another. Their peaks were rose-coloured in the sunlight, their slopes azure and gold-tinted. Onward, onward, urged the sun as it climbed the steep cliffs. There's no danger, so long as I am with you. But halfway up, the bold young birch deserted, also the sturdy pine and the persistent spruce, and there, too, the Laplander and the willow brush deserted. At last, when the sun reached the top, there was no one but the little tot, Nils Holgersen, who had followed it. The sun rolled into a cave where the walls were bedecked with ice, and Nils Holgersen wanted to follow, but farther than the opening of the cave, he dared not venture, for in there he saw something dreadful. Far back in the cave sat an old witch with an ice body, hair of icicles and a mantle of snow. At her feet lay three black wolves, who rose and opened their jaws when the sun approached. From the mouth of one came a piercing cold, from the second a blustering north wind, and from the third came impenetrable darkness. That must be the ice witch and her tribe, thought the boy. He understood that now was the time for him to flee, but he was so curious to see the outcome of the meeting between the sun and the ice witch that he tarried. The ice witch did not move, only turned her hideous face toward the sun. This continued for a short time. It appeared to the boy that the witch was beginning to sigh and tremble. Her snow mantle fell, and the three ferocious wolves howled less savagely. Suddenly, the sun cried, Now my time is up, and rolled out of the cave. Then the ice witch let loose her three wolves. Instantly the north wind, cold, and darkness rushed from the cave and began to chase the sun. Drive him out! Drive him back! shrieked the ice witch. Chase him so far that he can never come back! Teach him that Lapland is mine! But Nils Holgersen felt so unhappy when he saw that the sun was to be driven from Lapland that he awakened with a cry. When he recovered his senses, he found himself at the bottom of a ravine. But where was Gorgo? How was he to find out where he himself was? He arose and looked all around him. Then he happened to glance upward and saw a peculiar structure of pine twigs and branches that stood on a cliff ledge. That must be one of those eagle nests that Gorgo... But this was as far as he got. He tore off his cap waved it in the air and cheered. Now he understood where Gorgo had brought him. This was the very glen where the wild geese lived in summer, and just above it was the eagle's cliff. He had arrived. He would meet Morton Goosey Gander and Akka and all the other comrades in a few moments. Hurrah! Part 3. The Meeting All was still in the glen. The sun had not yet stepped above the cliffs, and Nils Holgersen knew that it was too early in the morning for the geese to be awake. The boy walked along leisurely and searched for his friends. And before he had gone very far, he paused with a smile, for he saw such a pretty sight. A wild goose was sleeping in a neat little nest, and beside her stood her goosey gander. He too slept, but it was obvious that he had stationed himself thus near her that he might be on hand in the possible event of danger. The boy went on without disturbing them and peeped into the willow brush that covered the ground. It was not long before he spied another goose couple. These were strangers, not of his flock, but he was so happy that he began to hum, just because he had come across wild geese. He peeped into another bit of brushwood. There, at last, he saw two that were familiar. It was certainly Nelia that was nesting there, and the goosey gander who stood beside her was surely Colm. Why, of course, the boy had a good mind to awaken them, 
but he let them sleep on and walked away. In the next brush he saw Visi and Kusi, and not far from them he found Ixi and Kaxi. All four were asleep, and the boy passed by without disturbing them. As he approached the next brush, he thought he saw something white shimmering among the bushes, and the heart of him thumped with joy. Yes, it was as he expected. In there sat the dainty Dunfin on an egg-filled nest. Beside her stood her white goosey gander. Although he slept, it was easy to see how proud he was to watch over his wife up here among the Lapland mountains. The boy did not care to waken the goosey gander, so he walked on. He had to seek a long time before he came across any more wild geese. Finally, he saw on a little hillock something that resembled a small grey moss tuft, and he knew that there was Akka from Kebna Kays. She stood wide awake, looking about as if she were keeping watch over the whole glen. "'Good morning, Mother Akka,' said the boy. "'Please don't waken the other geese yet a while, for I wish to speak with you in private.' The old leader goose came rushing down the hill and up to the boy. First she seized hold of him and shook him. Then she stroked him with her bill before she shook him again. But she did not say a word, since he asked her not to waken the others. Thumbitot kissed old mother Akka on both cheeks. Then he told her how he'd been carried off to Skansen and held captive there. Now, I must tell you that Smur Fox, short of an ear, sat imprisoned in the fox's cage at Skansen, said the boy. Although he was very mean to us, I couldn't help feeling sorry for him. There were many other foxes in the cage, and they seemed quite contented there. But Smur sat all the while looking dejected, longing for liberty. I made many good friends at Skansen, and I learned one day from the lapdog that a man had come to Skansen to buy foxes. He was from some island far out in the ocean. All the foxes had been exterminated there, and the rats were about to get the better of the inhabitants, so they wished the foxes back again. As soon as I learned of this, I went to Smur's cage, and I said to him, "'Tomorrow some men are coming here to get a pair of foxes. Don't hide, Smur, but keep well in the foreground, and see to it you are chosen. Then you'll be free again.' He followed my suggestion, and now he is running at large on the island. What you say to this, Mother Acker? If you had been in my place, would you have done likewise? You have acted in a way that makes me wish I had done that myself, said the leader goose proudly. It's a relief to know that you approve, said the boy. Now, there is one thing more I wish to ask you about. One day I happened to see Gorgo the eagle, the one that fought with Morton Goosey Gander, a prisoner at Skansen. He was in the eagle's cage and looked perfectly forlorn, I was thinking of filing down the wire roof over him and letting him out, but I also thought of his being a dangerous robber and bird-eater, and wondered if I should be doing right in letting loose such a plunderer, and if it were not better, perhaps, to let him stay where he was. What you say, Mother Akka? Was it right to think thus? No, it was not right, retorted Akka. Say what you will about the eagles. They are proud birds, and greater lovers of freedom than all others. It is not right to keep them in captivity. Do you know what I would suggest? This, that as soon as you are well rested, we two make the trip together to the big bird prison and liberate Gorgo. That is just the word I was expecting from you, Mother Akka, returned the boy eagerly. There are those who say that you no longer have any love in your heart for the one you reared so tenderly, because he lives as eagles must live. But I know now that isn't true, and now I want to see if Morton Goosey Gander is awake. Meanwhile, if you wish to say a thank you to the one who brought me here to you, I think you'll find him up there on the cliff ledge, where once you found a helpless eaglet. Chapter 35 Osa the Goose Girl and Little Mats The year that Nils Holgersen travelled with the wild geese, everybody was talking about two little children, a boy and a girl who tramped through the country. They were from Sonnebo Township in Smolland, and had once lived with their parents and four brothers and sisters in a little cabin on the heath. While the two children, Osa and Mats, were still small, a poor homeless woman came to their cabin one night and begged for shelter. Although the place could hardly hold the family, she was taken in, and the mother spread a bed for her on the floor. In the night she coughed so hard that the children fancied the house shook. By morning she was too ill to continue her wanderings. 
The children's father and mother were as kind to her as could be. They gave up their bed to her and slept on the floor, while the father went to the doctor and brought her medicine. The first few days the sick woman behaved like a savage. She demanded constant attention and never uttered a word of thanks. Later she became more subdued and finally begged to be carried out to the heath and left there to die. When her hosts would not hear of this, she told them that the last few years she had roamed about with a band of gypsies. She herself was not of gypsy blood, but was the daughter of a well-to-do farmer. She had run away from home and gone with the nomads. She believed that a gypsy woman who was angry at her had brought this sickness upon her. Nor was that all. The gypsy woman had also cursed her, saying that all who took her under their roof or were kind to her should suffer a like fate. She believed this, and therefore begged them to cast her out of the house and never to see her again. She did not want to bring misfortune down upon such good people. But the peasants refused to do her bidding. It was quite possible that they were alarmed, but they were not the kind of folk who could turn out a poor, sick person. Soon after that she died, and then along came the misfortunes. Before there had never been anything but happiness in that cabin. Its inmates were poor, yet not so very poor. The father was a maker of weaver's combs, and mother and children helped him with the work. Father made the frames, mother and the older children did the binding, while the smaller ones planed the teeth and cut them out. They worked from morning until night. But the time passed pleasantly, especially when father talked of the days when he travelled about in foreign lands and sold weaver's combs. Father was so jolly that sometimes mother and the children would laugh until their sides ached at his funny quips and jokes. The weeks following the death of the poor vagabond woman lingered in the minds of the children like a horrible nightmare. They knew not if the time had been long or short, but they remembered that they were always having funerals at home. One after another, they lost their brothers and sisters. At last it was very still and sad in the cabin. The mother kept up some measure of courage, but the father was not a bit like himself. He could no longer work, nor jest, but sat from morning till night, his head buried in his hands, and only brooded. Once, that was after the third burial, the father had broken out into wild talk which frightened the children. He said that he could not understand why such misfortunes should come upon them. They had done a kindly thing in helping the sick woman. Could it be true, then, that the evil in this world was more powerful than the good? The mother tried to reason with him, but she was unable to soothe him. A few days later, the eldest was stricken. She had always been the father's favourite, so when he realised that she too must go, he fled from all the misery. The mother never said anything, but she thought it was best for him to be away, as she feared that he might lose his reason. He had brooded too long over this one idea, that God had allowed a wicked person to bring about so much evil. After the father went away, they became very poor. For a while he sent them money, but afterward things must have gone badly with him, for no more came. The day of the eldest daughter's burial, the mother closed the cabin and left home with the two remaining children, Osa and Mats. She went down to Skane to work in the beet fields and found a place at the Jordberger sugar refinery. She was a good worker and had a cheerful and generous nature. Everybody liked her. Many were astonished because she could be so calm after all that she had passed through. But the mother was very strong and patient. When anyone spoke to her of her two sturdy children, she only said, I shall soon lose them also, without a quaver in her voice or a tear in her eye. She had accustomed herself to expect nothing else. But it did not turn out as she feared. Instead, the sickness came upon herself. She had gone to Skane in the beginning of summer, before autumn she was gone, and the children were left alone. While their mother was ill, she had often said to the children they must remember that she never regretted having let the sick woman stop with them. It was not hard to die when one had done right, she said, for then one could go with a clear conscience. Before the mother passed away, she tried to make some provision for her children. She asked the people with whom she lived to let them remain in the room which she had occupied. If the children only had a shelter, they would not become a burden to anyone. She knew that they could take care of themselves. Osa and Mats were allowed to keep the room on condition that they would tend the geese, as it was always hard to find children willing to do that work. It turned out as the mother expected. They did maintain themselves. 
The girl made candy, and the boy carved wooden toys, which they sold at the farmhouses. They had a talent for trading, and soon began buying eggs and butter from the farmers, which they sold to the workers at the sugar refinery. Osa was the older, and by the time she was thirteen, she was as responsible as a grown woman. She was quiet and serious, while Matt was lively and talkative. His sister used to say to him that he could out-cackle the geese. When the children had been at Jordburger for two years, there was a lecture given one evening at the schoolhouse. Evidently, it was meant for grown-ups, but the two Smallland children were in the audience. They did not regard themselves as children, and few persons thought of them as such. The lecturer talked about the dread disease called the White Plague, which every year carried off so many people in Sweden. He spoke very plainly, and the children understood every word. After the lecture, they waited outside the schoolhouse. When the lecturer came out, they took hold of hands and walked gravely up to him, asking if they might speak to him. The stranger must have wondered at the two rosy, baby-faced children standing there, talking with an earnestness more in keeping with people thrice their age, but he listened graciously to them. They related what had happened in their home, and asked the lecturer if he thought their mother and their sisters and brothers had died of the sickness he had described. "'Very likely,' he answered. "'It could hardly have been any other disease.' If only the mother and father had known what the children learned that evening, they might have protected themselves. If they had burned the clothing of the vagabond woman, if they had scoured and aired the cabin and had not used the old bedding, all whom the children mourned might have been living yet. The lecturer said he could not say positively, but he believed that none of their dear ones would have been sick had they understood how to guard against the infection. Osa and Mats waited a while before putting the next question, for that was the most important of all. It was not true, then, that the gypsy woman had sent the sickness because they had befriended the one with whom she was angry. It was not something special that had stricken only them. The lecturer assured them that no person had the power to bring sickness upon another in that way. Thereupon the children thanked him and went to their room. They talked until late that night. The next day they gave notice that they could not tend geese another year but must go elsewhere. Where were they going? Why, to try to find their father. They must tell him that their mother and the other children had died of a common ailment and not something special brought upon them by an angry person. They were very glad that they had found out about this, and now it was their duty to tell their father of it, for probably he was still trying to solve the mystery. Osa and Mats set out for their old home on the heath. When they arrived, they were shocked to find the little cabin in flames. They went to the parsonage, and there they learned that a railroad workman had seen their father at a Malmbeget far up in Lapland. He had been working in a mine, and possibly was still there. When the clergyman heard that the children wanted to go in search of their father, he brought forth a map and showed them how far it was to Malmbeget, and tried to dissuade them from making the journey, but the children insisted that they must find their father. He had left home, believing something that was not true. They must find him and tell him that it was all a mistake. They did not want to spend their little savings buying railway tickets. Therefore, they decided to go all the way on foot, which they never regretted, as it proved to be a remarkably beautiful journey. Before they were out of Smolland, they stopped at a farmhouse to buy food. The housewife was a kind, motherly soul who took an interest in the children. She asked them who they were and where they came from, and they told her their story. Oh, dear, 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 she interpolated time and time again when they were speaking. Later, she petted the children and stuffed them with all kinds of goodies, for which she would not accept a penny. When they rose to thank her and go, the woman asked them to stop at her brother's farm in the next township. Of course, the children were delighted. Give him my greetings and tell him what has happened to you, said the peasant woman. This the children did, and were well treated. From every farm after that, it was always, if you happen to go in such and such a direction, stop there or there and tell them what has happened to you. In every farmhouse to which they were sent, there was always a consumptive. So Osa and Mats went through the country, unconsciously teaching the people how to combat that dreadful disease. Long, long ago, when the Black Plague was ravaging the country, it was said that a boy and a girl were seen wandering from house to house. The boy carried a rake, and he stopped and raked in front of a house. It meant that their many should die, but not all, for the rake had coarse teeth and does not take everything with it. The girl carried a broom, and if she came along and swept before a door, it meant that 
all who lived within must die, for the broom is an implement that makes a clean sweep. It seems quite remarkable that in our time two children should wander through the land because of a cruel sickness. But these children did not frighten people with the rake and the broom. They said rather, We will not content ourselves with merely raking the yard and sweeping the floors. We will use mop and brush, water and soap. We will keep clean inside and outside of the door, and we ourselves will be clean in both mind and body. In this way we will conquer the sickness. One day, while stood in Lapland, Akka took the boy to Malmberget, where they discovered little Mats lying unconscious at the mouth of the pit. He and Osa had arrived there a short time before. That morning he'd been roaming about, hoping to come across his father. He had ventured too near the shaft and been hurt by flying rocks after the setting off of a blast. Thumbietot ran to the edge of the shaft and called down to the miners that a little boy was injured. Immediately a number of labourers came rushing up to little Mats. Two of them carried him to the hut where he and Osa were staying. They did all they could to save him, but it was too late. Thumbietot felt so sorry for poor Osa. He wanted to help and comfort her, but he knew that if he were to go to her now he would only frighten her, such as he was. The night after the burial of little Mats, Osa straightway shut herself in her hut. She sat alone, recalling one after another things her brother had said and done. There was so much to think about that she did not go straight to bed, but sat up most of the night. The more she thought of her brother, the more she realised how hard it would be to live without him. At last she dropped her head on the table and wept. "'What shall I do now that little Mats is gone?' she sobbed. It was far along toward morning, and Osa, spent by the strain of her hard day, finally fell asleep. She dreamed that little Mats softly opened the door and stepped into the room. "'Osa, you must go and find father,' he said. "'How can I when I don't even know where he is?' she replied in her dream. "'Don't worry about that,' returned little Mats in his usual cheery way. "'I'll send someone to help you.' Just as Osa the Goose Girl dreamed that little Mats had said this, there was a knock at the door. It was a real knock, not something she heard in the dream. But she was so held by the dream that she could not tell the real from the unreal. As she went on to open the door, she thought, "'This must be the person little Mats promised to send me.' She was right, for it was Thumbietot come to talk to her about her father. When he saw that she was not afraid of him, he told her in a few words where her father was and how to reach him. While he was speaking, Osa the goose girl gradually regained consciousness. When he had finished, she was wide awake. Then she was so terrified at the thought of talking with an elf that she could not say thank you or anything else but quickly shut the door. As she did that, she thought she saw an expression of pain flash across the elf's face, but she could not help what she did, for she was beside herself with fright. She crept into bed as quickly as she could and drew the covers over her head. Although she was afraid of the elf, she had a feeling that he meant well by her. So the next day she made haste to do as he had told her. Chapter 36 With the Laplanders Part 1 One afternoon in July it rained frightfully up around Lake Luwasajor. The Laplanders, who lived mostly in the open during the summer, had crawled under the tent and were squatting round the fire drinking coffee. The new settlers on the east shore of the lake worked diligently to have their homes in readiness before the severe Arctic weather set in. They wondered at the Laplanders, who had lived in the far north for centuries, without even thinking that better protection was needed against cold and storm than thin tent covering. The Laplanders, on the other hand, wondered at the new settlers giving themselves so much needless hard work when nothing more was necessary to live comfortably than a few reindeer and a tent. They only had to drive the poles into the ground and spread the covers over them, and their abodes were ready. They did not have to trouble themselves about decorating or furnishing. The principal thing was to scatter some spruce twigs on the floor, spread a few skins and hang the big kettle in which they cooked their reindeer meat on a chain suspended from the top of the tent poles. While the Laplanders were chatting over their coffee cups, a rowboat coming from the Karuna side pulled ashore at the Laps' quarters. A workman and a young girl between 13 and 14 stepped from the boat. The girl was Osa. 
The lap dogs bounded down to them, barking loudly, and a native poked his head out of the tent opening to see what was going on. He was glad when he saw the workman, for he was a friend of the Laplanders, a kindly and sociable man, who could speak their native tongue. The Lap called to him to crawl under the tent. "'You're just in time, Soderberg,' he said. "'The coffee pot is on the fire. No one can do any work in this rain, so come in and tell us the news.' The workman went in, and with much ado, and amid a great deal of laughter and joking, places were made for Soderberg and Osa, though the tent was already crowded to the limit with natives. Osa understood none of the conversation. She sat dumb and looked in wonderment at the kettle and coffee pot, at the fire and smoke, at the lap men and lap women, at the children and dogs, the walls and floor, the coffee cups and tobacco pipes, the multicoloured costumes and grooved implements. All this was new to her. Suddenly she lowered her glance, conscious that everyone in the tent was looking at her. Soderberg must have said something about her, for now both lap men and lap women took the short pipes from their mouths and stared at her in open-eyed wonder and awe. The Laplander at her side patted her shoulder and nodded, saying in Swedish, Bra, bra, good, good. A lap woman filled a cup to the brim with coffee and passed it under difficulties, while a lap boy who was about her own age wriggled and crawled between the squatters over to her. Osa felt that Soderberg was telling the Laplanders that she had just buried her little brother Mats. She wished he would find out about her father instead. The elf had said that he lived with the Laps, who camped west of Lake Luasajor, and she had begged leave to ride up on a sand truck to see him, as no regular passenger trains came so far. Both labourers and foremen had assisted her as best they could. An engineer had sent Soderberg across the lake with her, as he spoke Lapish. She had hoped to meet her father as soon as she arrived. Her glance wandered anxiously from face to face, but she saw only natives. Her father was not there. She noticed that the Laps and the Swede Soderberg grew more and more earnest as they talked among themselves. The Laps shook their heads and tapped their foreheads, as if they were speaking of someone that was not quite right in his mind. She became so uneasy that she could no longer endure the suspense and asked Soderberg what the Laplanders knew of her father. They say he's gone fishing, said the workman. They're not sure that he can get back to the camp tonight, but as soon as the weather clears, one of them will go in search of him. Thereupon he turned to the Laps and went on talking to them. He did not wish to give Osa an opportunity to question him further about John Esserson. Part 2. The Next Morning Ola Serka himself, who was the most distinguished man among the Laps, had said that he would find Osa's father, but he appeared to be in no haste, and sat huddled outside the tent, thinking of John Esserson, and wondering how best to tell him of his daughter's arrival. It would require diplomacy in order that John Esserson might not become alarmed and flee. He was an odd sort of man who was afraid of children. He used to say that the sight of them made him so melancholy that he could not endure it. While Ola Serka deliberated, Osa, the goose girl, and Aslak, the young lap boy, who had stared so hard at her the night before, sat on the ground in front of the tent and chatted. Aslak had been to school and could speak Swedish. He was telling Osa about the life of the same folk, assuring her that they fared better than any other people. Osa thought that they lived wretchedly, and told him so. "'You don't know what you're talking about,' said Aslak curtly. "'Only stop with us a week, and you shall see that we are the happiest people on earth.' "'If I were to stop here a whole week, I should be choked by all the smoke in the tent,' Osa retorted. Oh, "'Don't say that,' protested the boy. "'You know nothing of us. Let me tell you something which will make you understand, that the longer you stay with us, the more contented you will become.' And thereupon, Aslak began to tell Osa how a sickness called the Black Plague once raged throughout the land. He was not certain as to whether it had swept through the real sameland where they were now, but in Jamsland it had raged so brutally that among the same folk who lived in the forests and mountains there, all had died except a boy of fifteen. Among the Swedes who lived in the valleys, none was left but a girl who was also fifteen years old. The boy and girl separately tramped the desolate country all winter in search of other human beings. Finally, toward the spring the two met. Aslak continued, 
The Swedish girl begged the lap boy to accompany her southward where she could meet people of her own race. She did not wish to tarry longer in Jemkland, where there were only vacant homesteads. I'll take you wherever you wish to go, said the boy, but not before winter. It's spring now, and my reindeer go westward toward the mountains. You know that we, who are of the same folk, must go where our reindeer take us. The Swedish girl was the daughter of wealthy parents. She was used to living under a roof, sleeping in a bed and eating at a table. She had always despised the poor mountaineers who thought that those who lived under the open sky were most unfortunate. But she was afraid to return to her home, where there were none but the dead. At least let me go with you to the mountains, she said to the boy, so that I shan't have to tromp about here all alone and never hear the sound of a human voice. And the boy willingly assented, so the girl went with the reindeer to the mountains. The herd yearned for the good pastures there, and every day tramped long distances to feed on the moss. There was not time to pitch tents, and the children had to lie on the snowy ground and sleep when the reindeer stopped to graze. The girl often sighed and complained of being so tired that she must turn back to the valley. Nevertheless, she went along to avoid being left without human companionship. When they reached the highlands, the boy pitched a tent for the girl on a pretty hill that sloped toward a mountain brook. In the evening, he lassoed and milked the reindeer and gave the girl milk to drink. He brought forth dried reindeer meat and reindeer cheese, which his people had stowed away on the heights when they were there the summer before. Still, the girl grumbled all the while and was never satisfied. She would eat neither reindeer meat nor reindeer cheese, nor would she drink reindeer milk. She could not accustom herself to squatting in the tent or to lying on the ground with only a reindeer skin and some spruce twigs for a bed. The son of the mountains laughed at her woes and continued to treat her kindly. After a few days, the girl went up to the boy when he was milking and asked if she might help him. She next undertook to make the fire under the kettle in which the reindeer meat was to be cooked and then to carry water and to make cheese. So the time passed pleasantly. The weather was mild and food was easily procured. Together they set snares for game, fished for salmon trout in the rapids, and picked cloudberries in the swamp. When the summer was gone, they moved farther down the mountains where pine and leaf forests meet, and there they pitched their tent. They had to work hard every day, but fared better, for food was even more plentiful than in the summer because of the game. When the snow came, and the lakes began to freeze, they drew farther east toward the dense pine forests. As soon as the tent was up, the winter's work began. The boy taught the girl to make twine from reindeer sinews, to treat skins, to make shoes and clothing of hides, to make combs and tools of reindeer horn, to travel on skis, and to drive a sledge drawn by reindeer. When they had lived through the dark winter and the sun began to shine all day and most of the night, the boy said to the girl that now he would accompany her southward so that she might meet some of her own race. Then the girl looked at him, astonished. Why do you want to send me away? she asked. Do you long to be alone with your reindeer? I thought you were the one that longed to get away, said the boy. I have lived the life of the same folk almost a year now, replied the girl. I can't return to my people and live the shut-in life after having wandered freely on mountains and in forests. Don't drive me away, but let me stay here. Your way of living is better than ours. Aslak continued. The girl stayed with the boy for the rest of her life, and never again did she long for the valleys. And you, Osa, if you were to stay with us only one month, you could never again part from us. With these words, Aslak, the lap boy, finished his story. And just then his father, Ola Serka, took the pipe from his mouth and rose. Old Ola understood more Swedish than he was willing to have anyone know, and he had overheard his son's remarks. While he was listening, it had suddenly flashed on him how he should handle this delicate matter of telling John Esserson that his daughter had come in search of him. Ola Serka went down to Lake Loasajor and had walked a short distance along the strand when he happened upon a man who sat on a rock fishing. The fisherman was grey-haired and bent. His eyes blinked wearily, and there was something slack and helpless about him. He looked like a man who had tried to carry a burden too heavy for him, or to solve a problem too difficult for him, who had become broken and despondent over his failure. "'You must have had luck with your fishing, John, since you've been at it all night,' said the mountaineer in Lapish as he approached. The fisherman gave a start 
then glanced up. The bait on his hook was gone, and not a fish lay on the strand beside him. He hastened to rebait the hook and throw out the line. In the meantime, the mountain is squatted on the grass beside him. "'There's a matter that I wanted to talk over with you,' said Ola. "'You know that I had a little daughter who died last winter, and we have always missed her in the tent.' "'Yes, I know.' said the fisherman abruptly, a cloud passing over his face, as though he disliked being reminded of a dead child. "'It's not worth while to spend one's life grieving,' said the Laplander. "'I suppose it isn't. Now, I'm thinking of adopting another child. Don't you think it would be a good idea?' Oh, "'That depends on the child, Ola.' "'I will tell you what I know of the girl,' said Ola. And then he told the fisherman that around midsummer time two strange children, a boy and a girl, had come to the mines to look for their father. But as their father was away, they had stayed to await his return. While there, the boy had been killed by a blast of rock. Thereupon Ola gave a beautiful description of how brave the little girl had been and how she had won the admiration and sympathy of everyone. "'Is that the girl you want to take into your tent?' asked the fisherman. "'Yes,' returned the Lap. "'When we heard her story, we were all deeply touched and said among ourselves that so good a sister would also make a good daughter, and we hoped that she would come to us.' The fisherman sat quietly thinking a moment. It was plain that he continued the conversation only to please his friend, the Lap. "'I presume the girl is one of your race?' "'No,' said Ola. "'She doesn't belong to the same folk.' Uh, "'Perhaps she's the daughter of some new settler and is accustomed to the life here.' "'No, she's from the far south,' replied Ola, as if this was of small importance. The fisherman grew more interested. "'Then I don't believe you can take her,' he said. "'It's doubtful if she could stand living in a tent in winter, since she was not brought up that way.' "'She will find kind parents and kind brothers and sisters in the tent,' insisted Ola Serka. "'It's worse to be alone than to freeze.' The fisherman became more and more zealous to prevent the adoption. It seemed as if he could not bear the thought of a child of Swedish parents being taken in by Laplanders. "'You said just now that she had a father in the mine.' "'He's dead,' said the lap abruptly. "'I suppose you've thoroughly investigated this matter, Ola.' Uh, "'What's the use of going to all that trouble?' disdained the lap. "'I ought to know. Would the girl and her brother have been obliged to roam about the country if they had a father living?' "'Would two children have been forced to take care for themselves if they had a father? "'The girl herself thinks he's alive, but I say that he must be dead.' "'The man with the tired eyes turned to Ola. "'What's the girl's name, Ola?' he asked. "'The mountaineer thought a while, and then he said, "'I can't remember it. I must ask her.' "'Ask her? Is she already here?' "'She's down at the camp. What? Ola?' "'You've taken her in before knowing her father's wishes. "'What do I care for her father? "'If he isn't dead, he's probably the kind of man who cares nothing for his child. "'He may be glad to have another taker in hand.' "'The fisherman threw down his rod and rose with an alertness in his movements that bespoke new life. "'I don't think her father can be like other folk,' continued the mountaineer. "'I dare say he's a man who's haunted by gloomy forebodings and therefore cannot work steadily. "'What kind of a father would that be for the girl?' While Ola was talking, the fisherman started up the strand. "'Where are you going?' queried the Lap. "'I'm going to have a look at your foster daughter, Ola.' "'Good,' said the Lap. "'Come along and meet her. I think you'll say she'll be a good daughter to me.' The Swede rushed on so rapidly that the Laplander could hardly keep pace with him. After a moment, Ola said to his companion, "'Now I recall that her name is Oza, this girl I'm adopting.' The other man only kept hurrying along, and old Ola Serka was so well pleased that he wanted to laugh aloud. When they came in sight of the tents, Ola said a few words more. She came here to us same folk to find her father, and not to become my foster child, but if she doesn't find him, I shall be glad to keep her in my tent. The fisherman hastened all the faster. I might have known that he would be alarmed when I threatened to take his daughter into the lap's quarters, laughed Ola to himself. When the man from Karuna, who had brought Oza to the tent, turned back later in the day, he had two people with him in the boat, who sat close together holding hands, as if they never again wanted to part. 
They were John Essison and his daughter. Both were unlike what they had been a few hours earlier. The father looked less bent and weary, and his eyes were clear and good, as if, at last, he had found the answer to that which had troubled him so long. Osa, the goose girl, did not glance longingly about, for she had found someone to care for her, and now she could be a child again. Chapter 37 Homeward Bound The First Travelling Day Saturday, October 1st The boy sat on the goosey gander's back and rode up amongst the clouds. Some thirty geese in regular order flew rapidly southward. There was a rustling of feathers and the many wings beat the air so noisily that one could scarcely hear one's own voice. Acker from Kebna Kays flew in the lead. After her came Ixy and Caxi, Colm and Nelia, Vissy and Cussy, Morton Goosey Gander and Dunfin. The six goslings which had accompanied the flock the autumn before had now left to look after themselves. Instead, the old geese were taking with them twenty-two goslings that had grown up in the glen that summer. Eleven flew to the right, eleven to the left, and they did their best to fly at even distances, like the big birds. The poor youngsters had never before been on a long trip, and at first they had difficulty in keeping up with the rapid flight. Acca from Kebnikays! Acca from Kebnikays! they cried in plaintive tones. What's the matter? said the leader goose sharply. Our wings are tired of moving! Our wings are tired of moving! wailed the young ones. The longer you keep it up, the better it will go, answered the leader goose without slackening her speed. And she was quite right, for when the goslings had flown two hours longer, they complained no more of being tired. But in the mountain glen they had been in the habit of eating all day long, and very soon they began to feel hungry. Acca, Acca, Acca from Kebna Kays, wailed the goslings pitifully. Oh, what's the trouble now? asked the leader goose. We're so hungry, we can't fly any more, whimpered the goslings. We're so hungry, we can't fly any more. Wild geese must learn to eat air and drink wind, said the leader goose, and kept right on flying. It actually seemed as if the young ones were learning to live on wind and air, for when they had flown a little longer, they said nothing more about being hungry. The goose flock was still in the mountain regions, and the old geese called out the names of all the peaks as they flew past, so that the youngsters might learn them. When they had been calling out a while, This is poor Sochiko, this is Sarjachiko, this is Solitelma, and so on, and the goslings became impatient again. Acca, 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 they shrieked in heart-rending tones. What's wrong? said the leader goose. We haven't room in our heads for any more of these awful names, shrieked the goslings. The more you put into your heads, the more you can get into them, retorted the leader goose, and continued to call out the queer names. The boy sat thinking that it was about time the wild geese betook themselves southward, for so much snow had fallen that the ground was white as far as the eye could see. There was no use denying that it had been rather disagreeable in the glen toward the last. Rain and fog had succeeded each other without any relief, and even if it did clear up once in a while, immediately frost set in. Berries and mushrooms upon which the boy had subsisted during the summer were either frozen or decayed. Finally, he'd been compelled to eat raw fish, which was something he disliked. The days had grown short, and the long evenings and late mornings were rather tiresome for one who could not sleep the whole time that the sun was away. Now, at last, the gosling's wings had grown, so that the geese could start for the south. The boy was so happy that he laughed and sang as he rode on the goose's back. It was not only on account of the darkness and cold that he longed to get away from Lapland, there were other reasons, too. The first weeks of his sojourn there, the boy had not been the least bit homesick. He thought he'd never before seen such a glorious country. The only worry he had had was to keep the mosquitoes from eating him up. The boy had seen very little of the goosey gander, because the big white gander thought only of his dunfin and was unwilling to leave her for a moment. On the other hand, Thumbitot had stuck to Acker and Gorgo the eagle, and the three of them had passed many happy hours together. The two birds had taken him with them on long trips. He had stood on snow-capped Mount Kebna Kays. He had looked down at the glaciers and visited many high cliffs, seldom tramped by human feet. Acker 
had shown him deep hidden mountain dales and had let him peep into caves where mother wolves brought up their young. He had also made the acquaintance of the tame reindeer that grazed in herds along the shores of the beautiful Torn Lake. And he had been down to the great falls and brought greetings to the bears that lived thereabouts from their friends and relatives in Westmanland. Ever since he had seen Osa the goose gull, he longed for the day when he might go home with Morton Goosey Gander and be a normal human being once more. He wanted to be himself again, so that Osa would not be afraid to talk to him and would not shut the door in his face. Yes, indeed, he was glad that at last they were speeding southward. He waved his cap and cheered when he saw the first pine forest. In the same manner, he greeted the first grey cabin, the first goat, the first cat, and the first chicken. They were continually meeting birds of passage, flying now in greater flocks than in the spring. "'Where are you bound for, wild geese?' called the passing birds. "'Where are you bound for?' "'We, like yourselves, are going abroad,' answered the geese. "'These goslings of yours aren't ready to fly,' screamed the others. "'They'll never cross the sea with those puny wings!' Laplander and reindeer were also leaving the mountains. When the wild geese sighted the reindeer, they circled down and called up, "'Thanks for your company this summer!' "'A pleasant journey to you and a welcome back,' returned the reindeer. But... When the bears saw the wild geese, they pointed them out to the cubs and growled. Just look at those geese. They're so afraid of a little cold, they don't dare to stay at home in winter. But the old geese were ready with a retort and cried to their goslings. Look at those beasts that stay at home and sleep half the year rather than go to the trouble of travelling south. Down in the pine forest, the young grouse sat huddling together and gazed longingly after the big bird flocks which, amid joy, and merriment proceeded southward. "'When will our turn come?' they asked the mother grouse. "'You will have to stay at home with Mamma and Papa,' she said. Chapter 38 Legends from Hargedalen Tuesday, October 4th the boy had had three days' travel in the rain and mist and longed for some sheltered nook where he might rest a while. At last the geese alighted to feed and ease their wings a bit. To his great relief, the boy saw an observation tower on a hill close by and dragged himself to it. When he had climbed to the top of the tower, he found a party of tourists there, so he quickly crawled into a dark corner and was soon sound asleep. When the boy awoke, he began to feel uneasy because the tourists lingered there so long in the tower telling stories. He thought they would never go. Morton Goosey Gander could not come for him while they were there, and he knew, of course, that the wild geese were in a hurry to continue the journey. In the middle of a story, he thought he heard honking and the beating of wings, as if the geese were flying away, but he did not dare to venture over to the balustrade to find out if it was so. At last, when the tourists were gone and the boy could crawl from his hiding place, he saw no wild geese and no Morton Goosey Gander came to fetch him. He called, Here I am, where are you? as loud as he could, but his travelling companions did not appear. Not for a second did he think they'd deserted him, but he feared that they had met with some mishap and was wondering what he should do to find them when Bataki the raven lit beside him. The boy never dreamed that he should greet Bataki with such a glad welcome as he now gave him. Oh, dear Bataki, he burst forth, how fortunate that you are here. Maybe you know what has become of Morton Goosey Gander and the wild geese. I've just come from a greeting with them, replied the raven. Akka saw a hunter prowling about on the mountain and therefore dared not to stay to wait for you, but has gone on ahead. Get up on my back and you shall soon be with your friends. The boy quickly seated himself on the raven's back and Bataki would soon have caught up with the geese had he not been hindered by a fog. It was as if the morning sun had awakened it to life. Little light veils of mist rose suddenly from the lake, from fields and from the forest. They thickened and spread with marvellous rapidity, and soon the entire ground was hidden from sight by white rolling mists. Bataki flew along above the fog in clear air and sparkling sunshine, but the wild geese must have circled down among the damp clouds, for it was impossible to sight them. The boy and the raven called and shrieked, but got no response. Well, this is a stroke of ill luck, said Bataki finally, but we know that they're travelling towards south, and of course I'll find them as soon as the mist clears. 
The boy was distressed at the thought of being parted from Morton Goosey Gander just now, when the geese were on the wing, and the big white one might meet with all sorts of mishaps. After Thumbietot had been sitting worrying for two hours or more, he remarked to himself that thus far there had been no mishap, and it was not worth while to lose heart. Just then he heard a rooster crowing down on the ground, and instantly he bent forward on the raven's back and called out, "'What's the name of the country I'm travelling over?' "'Bup, bup, bup, it's called Hardedalen, Hardedalen, bup, bup, Hardedalen,' cried the rooster. "'How does it look down there where you are?' the boy asked. "'Cliffs in the west, bup, 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 woods in the east, broad valleys across the whole bup, 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 country,' replied the rooster. "'Thank you,' cried the boy. "'You give a clear account of it.' When they travelled a little further, he heard a crow cawing down in the mist. "'What kind of people live in this country?' shouted the boy. "'Good, thrifty peasants,' answered the crow. "'Good, thrifty peasants!' Uh, "'What do they do?' asked the boy. "'What, what do they do?' Uh, "'They raise cattle and fell forests,' called the crow. "'Thanks,' replied the boy. "'You answer well.' A bit farther on, he heard a human voice yodelling and singing down in the mist. "'Is there any large city in this part of the country?' the boy asked. "'What?' Well, "'Who is it that calls?' cried the human voice. "'Is there any large city in this region?' the boy repeated. "'I want to know who it is that calls,' shouted the human voice. "'I might have known that I could get no information when I asked a human being a civil question,' the boy retorted. It was not long before the mist went away as suddenly as it had come. Then the boy saw a beautiful landscape, with high cliffs as in Jamtland, but there were no large flourishing settlements on the mountain slopes. The villages lay far apart, and the farms were small. Bataki followed the stream southward till they came within sight of a village, and there they alighted in a stubble field and let the boy dismount. "'In the summer grain grew on the ground,' said Bataki. "'Look around and see if you can't find something eatable.' The boy acted upon the suggestion, and before long he found a blade of wheat. As he picked out the grains and ate them, Bataki talked to him. "'Do you see that mountain towering directly south of us?' he asked. "'Yes, of course I see it,' said the boy. "'It is called Sonfuliet,' continued the raven. "'You can imagine that wolves were plentiful there once upon a time.' "'It must have been an ideal place for wolves,' said the boy. "'The people who lived here in the valley were frequently attacked by them,' remarked the raven. "'Perhaps you remember a good wolf story you could tell me,' said the boy. I've been told that a long, long time ago the wolves from Sunfulyet, as opposed to have waylaid a man who had gone out to peddle his wares, began Bataki. He was from Heed, he continued, a village a few miles down in the valley. Then Bataki proceeded to tell the boy how it was winter time and the wolves made for him as he was driving over the ice on Lake Lyusna. There were about nine or ten, and the man from Heed had a poor old horse, so there was very little hope of his escaping. When the man heard the wolves howl and saw how many there were after him, he lost his head, and it did not occur to him that he ought to dump his casks and jugs out of the sledge to lighten the load. He only whipped up the horse and made the best speed he could, but he soon observed that the wolves were gaining on him. The shores were desolate, and he was fourteen miles from the nearest farm. He thought that his final hour had come, and was paralysed with fear. While he sat there terrified, he saw something move in the brush, which had been set in the ice to mark out the road, and when he discovered who it was that walked there, his fear grew more and more intense. Wild beasts were not coming toward him, but a poor old woman named Finn Malin, who was in the habit of roaming about on highways and byways. She was a hunchback, and slightly lame, so he recognised her at a distance. The old woman was walking straight toward the wolves. The sledge had hidden them from her view, and the man comprehended at once that if he were to drive on without warning her, she would walk right into the jaws of the wild beasts, and while they were rending her, he would have time enough to get away. The old woman walked slowly, bent over a cane. It was plain that she was doomed if he did not help her, but even if he were to stop and take her into the sledge, it was by no means certain that she would be safe. More than likely, the wolves would catch up with them, and he and she and the horse would all be killed. He wondered if it were not better to sacrifice one life in order that two might be spared. This flashed upon him the minute he saw the old woman. He had also time to think how it would be with him afterward, if, perchance, he might not regret that he had not succoured her, 
or if people should someday learn of the meeting and that he had not tried to help her. It was a terrible temptation. I would rather not have seen her, he said to himself. Just then the wolves howled savagely, and the horse reared, plunged forward, and dashed past the old beggar woman. She too had heard the howling of the wolves, and as the man from Heed drove by, he saw that the old woman knew what awaited her. She stood motionless, her mouth open for a cry, her arms stretched out for help. But she neither cried nor tried to throw herself into the sledge. Something seemed to have turned her to stone. It was I, thought the man. I must have looked like a demon as I passed. He tried to feel satisfied now that he was certain of escape, but at that very moment his heart reproached him. Never before had he done a dastardly thing, and he felt now that his whole life was blasted. Uh, let come what may, he said, and reined in the horse. I cannot leave her alone with the wolves. It was with great difficulty that he got the horse to turn, but in the end he managed it and promptly drove back to her. Be quick and get into the sledge, he said gruffly, for he was mad with himself for not leaving the old woman to her fate. You might stay at home once in a while, you old hag, he growled. Now, both my horse and I will come to grief on your account. The old woman did not say a word, but the man from Heed was in no mood to spare her. The horse has already tramped thirty-five miles today, and the load hasn't lightened any since you got up on it, he grumbled, so you must understand he'll soon be exhausted. The sledge runners crunched on the ice, but for all that he heard how the wolves panted, and knew that the beasts were almost upon him. It's all up with us, he said. Much good it was, either to you or to me this attempt to save you, Finn Malin. Up to this point the old woman had been silent, like one who was accustomed to take abuse. But now she said a few words. I can't understand why you don't throw out your wares and lighten the load. You can come back again tomorrow and gather them up. The man realised that this was sound advice, and was surprised that he had not thought of it before. He tossed the reins to the old woman, loosed the ropes that bound the casks, and pitched them out. The wolves were right upon them, but now they stopped to examine that which was thrown on the ice and the travellers again had the start of them. "'If this does not help you,' said the old woman, "'you understand, of course, that I will give myself up to the wolves voluntarily, that you may escape.' While she was speaking, the man was trying to push a heavy brewer's vat from the long sledge. As he tugged at this, he paused, as if he could not quite make up his mind to throw it out, but in reality his mind was taken up with something altogether different.' Surely a man and a horse who have no infirmities need not let a feeble old woman be devoured by wolves for their sakes, he thought. There must be some other way of salvation. Why, of course, there is. It's only my stupidity that hinders me from finding the way. Again, he started to push the vat, then paused once more and burst out laughing. The old woman was alarmed and wondered if he'd gone mad. But the man from Heed was laughing at himself because he had been so stupid all the while. It was the simplest thing in the world to save all three of them. He could not imagine why he'd not thought of it before. "'Listen to what I say of you, Malin,' he said. "'It was splendid of you to be willing to throw yourself to the wolves, but you won't have to do that because I know how we can all three be helped without endangering the life of any. Remember, whatever I may do, you are to sit still and drive down to Linsel.' There you must waken the townspeople and tell them that I'm alone out here on the ice, surrounded by wolves, and ask them to come and help me. The man waited until the wolves were almost upon the sledge. Then he rolled out the big brewer's vat, jumped down, and crawled in under it. It was a huge vat, large enough to hold a whole Christmas brew. The wolves pounced upon it and bit at the hoops, but the vat was too heavy for them to move. They could not get the man inside. He knew that he was safe and laughed at the wolves. After a bit, he was serious again. For the future, when I get into a tight place, I shall remember this fact, and I shall bear in mind that I need never wrong either myself or others, for there is always a third way out of a difficulty if only one can hit upon it. With this, Bataki closed his narrative. The boy noticed that the raven never spoke unless there was some special meaning back of his words, and the longer he listened to him, the more thoughtful he became. "'I wonder why you told me that story,' remarked the boy. "'I just happened to think of it as I stood there, gazing up at the sonfulette,' replied the raven. Now they had travelled farther down Lake Grisana, and in an hour or so they came to Colsat, close to the border of Helsingland. 
Here, the raven alighted near a little hut that had no windows, only a shutter. From the chimney rose sparks and smoke, and from within the sound of heavy hammering was heard. Whenever I see this smithy, observed the raven, I'm reminded that in former times there were such skilled blacksmiths here in Hardedillon, and more especially in this village, that they couldn't be matched in the whole country. Perhaps you also remember a story about them, said the boy. Yes, returned Mataki. I remember one about a smith from Hardedillon who once invited two other blacksmiths, one from Dalicalia and one from Vimland, to compete with him at nail-making. Bataki continued with his narration, telling how the challenge was accepted, and the three blacksmiths met here at Colsat. The Dalicalian began. He forged a dozen nails so even and smooth and sharp that they couldn't be improved upon. After him came the Vermlander. He too forged a dozen nails which were quite perfect, and moreover, he finished them in half the time that it took the Dalicalian. When the judges saw this, they said to the Hargidal smith that it wouldn't be worth while for him to try, since he could not forge better than the Dalicalian or faster than the Vermlander. I shan't give up. There must still be another way of excelling, insisted the Hargidal smith. He placed the iron on the anvil. Without heating it at the forge, he simply hammered it hot and forged nail after nail, without the use of either anvil or bellows. None of the judges had ever seen a blacksmith wield a hammer more masterfully, and the hardy smith was proclaimed the best in the land. With these remarks, Bataki subsided, and the boy grew even more thoughtful. I wonder what your purpose was in telling me that, he queried. The story dropped into my mind when I saw the old smithy again, said Bataki in an offhand manner. The two travellers rose again into the air, and the raven carried the boy southward till they came to Lilhardle Parish, where he alighted on a leafy mound at the top of a ridge. "'I wonder if you know upon what mound you are standing,' said Bataki. The boy had to confess that he did not know. "'This is a grave,' said Bataki. "'Beneath this mound lies the first settler in Hargidalan. "'Perhaps you have a story to tell of him, too,' said the boy." I haven't heard much about him, but I think he was a Norwegian. He had served with a Norwegian king, got into his bad graces and had to flee the country. Bataki continued to relate how later the Norwegian went over to the Swedish king, who lived at Uppsala, and took service with him. But after a time he asked for the hand of the king's sister in marriage, and when the king wouldn't give him such a high-born bride, he eloped with her. By that time he had managed to get himself into such disfavour that it wasn't safe for him to live either in Norway or Sweden, and he did not wish to move to a foreign country. But there must still be a course open to me, he thought. With his servants and treasures he journeyed through Delicalia until he arrived in the desolate forests beyond the outskirts of the province, and there he settled built houses, and broke up land. Thus you see, said Bataki, he was the first man to settle in this part of the country. As the boy listened to the last story, he looked very serious. I wonder what your object is in telling me all this, he repeated. Bataki twisted and turned and screwed up his eyes, and it was some time before he answered the boy. Since we are here alone, he said finally, I shall take this opportunity to question you regarding a certain matter. Have you ever tried to ascertain upon what terms the elf who transformed you was to restore you to a normal human being. The only stipulation I've heard anything about was that I should take the white goosey gander up to Lapland and bring him back to Skane safe and sound. I thought as much, said Bataki, for when last we met you talked confidently of there being nothing more contemptible than deceiving a friend who trusts one. You'd better ask Akka about the terms. You know, I dare say that she was at your home and talked with the elf. Akka hasn't told me of this, said the boy, wonderingly. She must have thought that it was best for you not to know just what the elf did say. Naturally, she would rather help you than Morton Goosey Gander. It is singular, Bataki, that you always have a way of making me feel unhappy and anxious, said the boy. I dare say it might seem so, continued the raven, but this time I believe that you will be grateful to me for telling you that the elf's words were to this effect. You would to become a normal human being again if you would bring back Morton Goosey Gander that your mother might lay him on the block and chop his head off. The boy leaped up. That's only one of your base fabrications, he cried indignantly. You can ask Akka yourself, said Bataki. I see her coming up there with her whole flock. And don't forget what I've told you today. There is usually a way out of all difficulties if only one can find it. 
I shall be very interested to see what success you have. Chapter 39 Vermland and Dalsland Part 1 Wednesday, October 5th Today the boy took advantage of the rest hour, when Akka was feeding apart from the other wild geese, to ask her if that which Pataki had related was true, and Akka could not deny it. The boy made the leader goose promise that she would not divulge the secret to Morton Goosey Gander. The big white gander was so brave and generous that he might do something rash were he to learn of the elf's stipulations. Later the boy sat on the gooseback, glum and silent, and hung his head. He heard the wild geese call out to the goslings that now they were in Dalarn, they could see Stagion in the north, and now they were flying over Osterdal River to Hormund Lake, and were coming to Vestadal River. But the boy did not care even to glance at all this. I shall probably travel around with the wild geese the rest of my life, he remarked to himself, and I am likely to see more of this land than I wish. He was quite as indifferent when the wild geese called out to him that now they had arrived in Vermland, and that the stream they were following southward was Clarelven. I've seen so many rivers already, thought the boy. Why bother to look at one more? Even had he been more eager for sightseeing, there was not very much to be seen, for northern Vermland is nothing but vast, monotonous forest tracts, through which Clarelven winds, narrow and rich in rapids. Here and there one can see a charcoal kiln, a forest clearing or a few low chimneyless huts occupied by fins. But the forest as a whole is so extensive one might fancy it was far up in Lapland. Chapter 40 The Treasure on the Island Part 1 On Their Way to the Sea Friday, October 7th From the very start of the autumn trip the wild geese had flown straight south, but when they left Frigstarland they veered in another direction, travelling over western Vermland and Dalsland towards Bohuslan. That was a jolly trip. The goslings were now so used to flying that they complained no more of fatigue, and the boy was fast recovering his good humour. He was glad that he had talked with a human being. He felt encouraged when she said to him that if he were to continue doing good to all whom he met, as heretofore, it could not end badly for him. She was not able to tell him how to get back to his natural form, but she had given him a little hope and assurance, which inspired the boy to think out a way to prevent the big white gander from going home. Do you know, Morton Goosey Gander, that it will be rather monotonous for us to stay at home all winter after having been on a trip like this, he said, as they were flying far up in the air. I'm sitting here thinking that we ought to go abroad with the geese. Surely you are not in earnest, said the Goosey Gander, since he had proved to the wild geese his ability to travel with them all the way to Lapland. He was perfectly satisfied to get back to the goose pen in Holger Nilsson's cowshed. The boy sat silently a while and gazed down on Vermland, where the birch woods and leafy groves and gardens were clad in red and yellow autumn colours. I don't think I've ever seen the earth beneath us as lovely as it is today, he finally remarked. The lakes are like blue satin bands. Don't you think it would be a pity to settle down in West Vemminghog and never see any more of the world? I thought you wanted to go home to your mother and father and show them what a splendid boy you had become, said the Goosey Gander. All summer he had been dreaming of what a proud moment it would be for him when he should alight in the house yard before Holger Nilsson's cabin and show Dunfin and the six goslings to the geese and chickens, the cows and the cat, and to Mother Holger Nilsson herself, so that he was not very happy over the boy's proposal. And now, Morton Goosey Gander, don't you think yourself that it would be hard never to see anything more that is beautiful, said the boy. I would rather see the fat grain fields of Sodoslat than these lean hills, answered the Goosey Gander. But you must know very well that if you really wish to continue the trip, I can't be parted from you. That is just the answer I had expected from you said the boy, and his voice betrayed that he was relieved of a great anxiety. Later, when they travelled over Bohuslan, the boy observed that the mountain stretches were more continuous, the valleys were more like ravines blasted in the rock foundation, while the long lakes at their base were as black as if they had come from the underworld. 
This, too, was a glorious country, and as the boy saw it, with now a strip of sun, now a shadow, he thought that there was something strange and wild about it. He knew not why, but the idea came to him that once upon a time there were many strong and brave heroes in these mystical regions who had passed through many dangerous and daring adventures. The old passion of wanting to share in all sorts of wonderful adventures awoke in him. I might possibly miss not being in danger of my life at least once every day or two, he thought. Anyhow, it's best to be content with things as they are. He did not speak of this idea to the big white gander because the geese were now flying over Bohuslan with all the speed they could muster, and the goosey gander was puffing so hard that he would not have had the strength to reply. The sun was far down on the horizon and disappeared every now and then behind a hill. Still, the geese kept forging ahead. Finally, in the west, they saw a shining strip of light which grew broader and broader with every wing stroke. Soon the sea spread before them, milk white, with a shimmer of rose red and sky blue, and when they had circled past the coast cliffs, they saw the sun again as it hung over the sea, big and red, and ready to plunge into the waves. As the boy gazed at the broad, endless sea and the red evening sun, which had such a kindly glow that he dared not look straight at it. He felt a sense of peace and calm penetrate his soul. "'It's not worth while to be sad, Nils Holgersen,' said the sun. "'This is a beautiful world to live in, both for big and little. It is also good to be free and happy, and have a great dome of open sky above you.'" Part 2 The Gift of the Wild Geese the geese stood sleeping on a little rock islet just beyond Fjallbaka. When it drew on toward midnight and the moon hung high in the heavens, old Akka shook the sleepiness out of her eyes. After that she walked around and awakened Ixie and Kaxi, Colm and Nelia, Vissi and Cussy, and, last of all, she gave Thumbietot a nudge with her bill that startled him. "'What is it, Mother Akka? he asked, springing up in alarm. "'Nothing serious.' assured the leader goose. It's just this. We seven who have been long together want to fly a short distance out to sea tonight, and we wondered if you could care to come with us. The boy knew that Akka would not have proposed this move had there not been something important on foot. So he promptly seated himself on her back. The flight was straight west. The wild geese first flew over a belt of large and small islands near the coast, then over a broad expanse of open sea, till they reached the large cluster known as the Veda Islands. All of them were low and rocky, and in the moonlight one could see that they were rather large. Akka looked at one of the smallest islands and alighted there. It consisted of a round grey stone hill with a wide cleft across it, into which the sea had cast fine white sea sand and a few shells. As the boy slid from the goose's back he noticed something quite close to him, that looked like a jagged stone. But almost at once he saw that it was a big vulture which had chosen the rock island for a night harbour. Before the boy had time to wonder at the geese recklessly alighting so near a dangerous enemy, the bird flew up to them, and the boy recognised Gorgo, the eagle. Evidently, Acker and Gorgo had arranged the meeting, for neither of them was taken by surprise. "'This was good of you, Gorgo,' said Acker. "'I didn't expect that you would be at the meeting place ahead of us.' "'Have you been here long?' "'I came early in the evening,' replied Gorgo. "'But I fear that the only praise I deserve is for keeping my appointment with you. "'I have not been very successful in carrying out the orders you gave me.' "'I am sure, Gorgo, that you have done more than you care to admit,' assured Akka. "'But before you relate your experiences on the trip, "'I shall ask Thumbietot to help me find something which is supposed to be buried on this island.' The boy stood gazing admiringly at two beautiful shells, but when Akka spoke his name, he glanced up. "'You must have wondered, Thumbietot, why we turned out of our course to fly here to the West Sea,' said Akka. "'To be frank, I did think it strange,' answered the boy, "'but I knew, of course, that you always have some reason for whatever you do.' "'You have a good opinion of me,' returned Akka, "'but I almost fear you will lose it now, for it is very probable.' that we have made this journey in vain. Many years ago it happened that two of the other old geese and myself encountered frightful storms during a spring flight and were wind-driven to this island. 
When we discovered that there was only open sea before us, we feared we should be swept so far out that we should never find our way back to land. So we lay down on the waves between these bare cliffs where the storm compelled us to remain for several days. We suffered terribly from hunger. Once we ventured up to the cleft on the island in search of food, we couldn't find a green blade. We saw a number of security tied bags half buried in the sand. We hoped to find grain in the bags and pulled and tugged at them till we tore the cloth. However, no grain poured out but shining gold pieces. For such things we wild geese have no use, so we left them where they were. We haven't thought of the find in all these years, but this autumn something has come up to make us wish for gold. We do not know that the treasure is still here, but we have travelled all this way to ask you to look into the matter. With a shell in either hand, the boy jumped down into the cleft and began to scoop up the sand. He found no bags, but when he had made a deep hole, he heard the clink of metal and saw that he had come upon a gold piece. Then he dug with his fingers and felt many coins in the sand, so he hurried back to Acker. The bags have rotted and fallen apart, he exclaimed, and the money lies scattered all through the sand. That's well, said Acker. Now fill in the hole and smooth it over, so no one will notice the sand has been disturbed. The boy did as he was told, but when he came up from the cleft he was astonished to see that the wild geese were lined up with Acker in the lead and were marching toward him with great solemnity. The geese paused in front of him and all bowed their heads many times, looking so grave that he had to doff his cap and make an obeisance to them. The fact is, said Acker, we old geese have been thinking that if Thumbietot had been in the service of human beings and had done as much for them as he has for us, they would not let him go without rewarding him well. I haven't helped you. It was you who have taken good care of me, returned the boy. We think also, continued Acker, that when a human being has attended us on a whole journey, he shouldn't be allowed to leave us as poor as when he came. I know that what I've learnt this year with you is worth more to me than gold or lands, said the boy. Since these gold coins have been lying unclaimed in the cleft all these years, I think you ought to... I thought you said something about needing this money yourselves, reminded the boy. We do need it, so as to be able to give you such recompense as will make your mother and father think you have been working as a goose boy with worthy people. The boy turned half round and cast a glance towards the sea, then faced about and looked straight into Acker's bright eyes. I think it's strange, Mother Acker, that you turn me away from your service like this and pay me off before I have given you notice, he said. As long as we wild geese remain in Sweden, I trust that you will stay with us, said Acker. I only wanted to show you where the treasure was while we could get to it without going too far out of our course. All the same, it looks as if you wish to be rid of me before I want to go, argued Thumbietot. After all the good times we've had together, I think you ought to let me go abroad with you. When the boy said this, Acker and the other wild geese stretched their long necks straight up and stood a moment with bills half open, drinking in air. That is something I haven't thought about, said Acker, when she recovered herself. Before you decide to come with us, we had better hear what Gorgo has to say. You may as well know that when we left Lapland, the agreement between Gorgo and myself was that he should travel to your hometown down in Skane to try and make better terms for you with the elf. That is true, affirmed Gorgo, but as I've already told you, luck was against me. I soon hunted up Holger Nilsson's croft, and after circling up and down over the place a couple of hours, I caught sight of the elf skulking between the sheds. Immediately, I swooped down upon him and flew off with him to the meadow where we could talk together without interruption. I told him that I'd been sent by Acker from Keb Kenes to ask if he couldn't give Nils Holger some easier terms. I only wish I could, he answered, for I've heard that he has conducted himself well on the trip, but it is not in my power to do so. And then I was wrathy and said that I would bore out his eyes unless he gave in. You may do as you like, he retorted, but as to Nils Holgersen, it will turn out exactly as I have said. You can tell him from me that he would do well to return soon with his goose, for matters on the farm are in bad shape. His father has had to forfeit a bond for his brother, whom he trusted. He has bought a horse with borrowed money, and the beast went lame the first time he drove it. Since then it has been no earthly use to him. Tell Nils Holgersen that his parents have had to sell two of the cows and that they must give up the croft unless they receive help from somewhere. 
When the boy heard this, he frowned and clenched his fists so hard that the nails dug into his flesh. It is cruel of the elf to make the conditions so hard for me that I cannot go home and relieve my parents, but he shan't turn me into a traitor to a friend. My father and mother are square and upright folk. I know they would rather forfeit my help than have me come back to them with a guilty conscience. Chapter 41 The Journey to Vemminghog Thursday, November 3rd one day in the beginning of November, the wild geese flew over Halland Ridge and into Skane. For several weeks they had been resting on the wild plains around Falkoping. As many other wild goose flocks also stopped there, the grown geese had had a pleasant time visiting with old friends and there had been all kinds of games and races between the younger birds. Nils Holgersson had not been happy over the delay in Wester Gotland. He had tried to keep a stout heart but it was hard for him to reconcile himself to his fate. If I were only well out of Skane and in some foreign land, he had thought, I should know for certain that I had nothing to hope for, and I would feel easier in my mind. Finally, one morning, the geese started out and flew toward Halland. In the beginning, the boy took very little interest in that province. He thought there was nothing new to be seen there. But when the wild geese continued the journey farther south along the narrow coastlands, the boy leaned over the goose's neck and did not take his glance from the ground. He saw the hills gradually disappear and the plains spread under him. At the same time, he noticed that the coast became less rugged, while the group of islands beyond thinned and finally vanished, and the broad, open sea came clear up to firm land. Here there were no more forests. Here the plain was supreme. It spread all the way to the horizon. A land that lay so exposed with field upon field reminded the boy of Skane. He felt both happy and sad as he looked at it. I can't be very far from home, he thought. Many times during the trip, the goslings had asked the old geese, How does it look in foreign lands? Wait, wait, you shall soon see, the old geese had answered. When the wild geese had passed Halland Ridge and gone a distance into Skane, Acca called out, Now look down, look all around, it is like this in foreign lands. Just then they flew over Soda Ridge. The whole long range of hills was clad in beechwoods, and beautiful turreted castles peeped out here and there. Among the trees grazed roebuck, and on the forest meadow romped the hares. Hunter's horn sounded from the forests. The loud baying of dogs could be heard all the way up to the wild geese. Broad avenues wound through the trees, and on these ladies and gentlemen were driving in polished carriages or riding fine horses. At the foot of the ridge lay Ring Lake, with the ancient Bostio cloister in a narrow peninsula. "'Does it look like this in foreign lands?' asked the goslings. "'It looks exactly like this wherever there are forest-clad ridges,' replied Acker. Only one doesn't see many of them. Wait, you shall see how it looks in general. Acker led the geese farther south to the great Skane Plain. There it spread with grain fields, with acres and acres of sugar beets, where the beet pickers were at work, with low whitewashed farm and outhouses, with numberless little white churches, with ugly grey sugar refineries and small villages near the railway stations. Little beech encircled meadow lakes, each of them adorned by its own stately manner, shimmered here and there. Now look down, look carefully, called the leader goose. Thus it is in foreign lands, from the Baltic coast all the way down to the high Alps. Farther than that, I have never travelled. When the goslings had seen the plain, the leader goose flew down to the Orinson coast. Swampy meadows sloped gradually toward the sea. In some places were high, steep banks, in others, drift sand fields, where the sand lay heaped in banks and hills. Fishing hamlets stood all along the coast, with long rows of low, uniform brick houses, with a lighthouse at the edge of the breakwater, and brown fishing nets hanging in the drying yard. Now look down, look well. This is how it looks along the coasts in foreign lands. After Acker had been flying about in this manner a long time, she alighted suddenly on a marsh in Vemminghog Township, 
and the boy could not help thinking that she had travelled over Skane just to let him see that his was a country which could compare favourably with any in the world. This was unnecessary, for the boy was not thinking of whether the country was rich or poor. From the moment he had seen the first willow grove, his heart ached with homesickness. Chapter 42 Home at Last Tuesday, November 8th The atmosphere was dull and hazy. The wild geese had been feeding on the big meadow around Scarab Church and were having their noonday rest when Akka came up to the boy. "'It looks as if we should have calm weather for a while,' she remarked, "'and I think we'll cross the Baltic tomorrow.' "'Indeed,' said the boy abruptly, for his throat contracted so that he could hardly speak. All along he had cherished the hope that he would be released from the enchantment when he was still in Skane. "'We are quite near West Vemminghog now,' said Akka, "'and I thought that perhaps you might like to go home for a while. "'It may be some time before you have another opportunity to see your people.' "'Perhaps I'd better not,' said the boy hesitatingly, "'but something in his voice betrayed that he was glad of Akka's proposal. "'If the goosey gander remains with us, no harm can come to him,' Akka assured. "'I think you'd better find out how your parents are getting along. "'You might be of some help to them even if you are not a normal boy.' "'You are right, Mother Akka. "'I should have thought of that long ago,' said the boy impulsively. The next second he and the leader goose were on their way to his home. It was not long before Akka alighted behind the stone hedge, encircling the little farm. "'Strange how natural everything looks round here,' the boy remarked, quickly cambering to the top of the hedge so that he could look about. "'It seems to me only yesterday that I first saw you come flying through the air.' "'I wonder if your father has a gun,' said Akka suddenly. "'You may be sure he has,' returned the boy." It was just the gun that kept me at home that Sunday morning when I should have been at church. Then I don't dare to stand here and wait for you, said Akka. You had better meet us at Smigahog early tomorrow morning, so that you may stay at home overnight. Oh, don't go yet, Mother Akka, begged the boy, jumping from the hedge. He could not tell just why it was, but he felt as if something would happen, either to the wild goose or to himself, to prevent their future meeting. No doubt you see that I'm distressed because I cannot get back to my right form, but I want to say to you that I don't regret having gone with you last spring, he said. I would rather forfeit the chance of ever being human again than to have missed that trip. Akka breathed quickly before she answered. There's a little matter I should have mentioned to you before this, but since you are not going back to your home for good... I thought there was no hurry about it. Still, it may as well be said now. You know very well that I'm always glad to do your bidding, said the boy. If you have learned anything at all from us, Thumby Tot, you no longer think that the humans should have the whole earth to themselves, said the wild goose solemnly. Remember, you have a large country and you can easily afford to leave a few bare rocks, a few shallow lakes and swamps, a few desolate cliffs and remote forests to us poor dumb creatures, where we can be allowed to live in peace. All my days I have been hounded and hunted. It would be a comfort to know that there is a refuge somewhere for one like me. Indeed, I should be glad to help if I could, said the boy, but it's not likely that I shall ever again have any influence among human beings. Well, we're standing here talking as if we're never going to meet again, said Akka. But we shall see each other tomorrow, of course. Now I'll return to my flock. She spread her wings and started to fly, but came back and stroked Thumbitot up and down with her bill before she flew away. It was broad daylight, but no human being moved on the farm, and the boy could go where he pleased. He hastened to the cowshed because he knew that he could get the best information from the cows. It looked rather barren in their shed. In the spring there had been three fine cows there, but now there was only one, Mayrose. It was quite apparent that she yearned for her comrades. Her head drooped sadly, and she had hardly touched the feed in her crib. "'Good day, Mayrose,' said the boy, running fearlessly into her stall. 
How are mother and father? How are the cat and the chickens? What has become of Star and Gold Lily? When Mayrose heard the boy's voice, she started and appeared as if she were going to gore him, but she was not so quick-tempered now as formerly, and took time to look well at Nils Holgerson. He was just as little now as when he went away, and wore the same clothes, yet he was completely changed. The Nils Holgerson that went away in the spring had a heavy, slow gait, a drawling speech and sleepy eyes. The one that had come back was lithe and alert, ready of speech, and had eyes that sparkled and danced. He had a confident bearing that commanded respect, little as he was, although he himself did not look happy. He inspired happiness in others. Moo! bellowed Mayrose. They told me that he was changed, but I couldn't believe it. Welcome home, Nils Holgerson. Welcome home. This is the first glad moment I've known for ever so long. Thank you, Mayrose, said the boy, who was very happy to be so well received. Now, tell me about father and mother. They have had nothing but hardship ever since you went away, said Mayrose. The horse has been a costly care all summer, for he has stood in the stable the whole time and not earned his feed. Your father is too soft-hearted to shoot him, and he can't sell him. It was on account of the horse that both Star and Gold Lily had to be sold. There was something else the boy wanted badly to know, but he was diffident about asking the question point-blank, and therefore he said, Mother must have felt very sorry when she discovered that Morton Goosey Gander had flown. She wouldn't have worried much about Morton Goosey Gander had she known the way he came to leave. She grieves most at the thought of her son having run away from home with a goosey gander. Does she really think that I stole the goosey gander? said the boy. What else could she think? Father and mother must fancy that I've been roaming about the country like a common tramp. They think you've gone to the dogs, said Mayrose. They have mourned you as one mourns the loss of the dearest thing on earth. As soon as the boy heard this, he rushed from the cowshed and down to the stable. It was small, but clean and tidy. Everything showed that his father had tried to make the place comfortable for the new horse. In the stall stood a strong, fine animal that looked well fed and well cared for. Good day to you said the boy. I have heard there's a sick horse in here. Surely it can't be you who look so healthy and strong. The horse turned his head and stared fixedly at the boy. Are you the son? he queried. I've heard many bad reports of him, but you have such a good face. I couldn't believe that you were he. Did I not know that he was transformed into an elf? I know that I left a bad name behind me when I went away from the farm, admitted Nils Holgerson. My own mother thinks I'm a thief, but what matters it? I shan't tarry here long. Meanwhile, I want to know what ails you. Pretty you're not going to stay, said the horse, or I have the feeling that you and I might become good friends. I've got something in my foot, the point of a knife or something sharp. That's all that ails me. It's gone so far in the doctor can't find it, but it cuts so that I can't walk. If you would only tell your father what's wrong with me, I'm sure that he could help me. I should like to be of some use. I really feel ashamed to stand here and feed without doing any work. It's well that you have no real illness, remarked Nils Holgerson. I must attend to this at once, so that you will be all right again. You don't mind if I do a little scratching on your hoof with my knife, do you? Nils Holgerson had just finished, when he heard the sound of voices. He opened the stable door a little and peeped out. His father and mother were coming down the lane. It was easy to see that they were broken by many sorrows. His mother had many lines on her face, and his father's hair had turned grey. She was talking with him about getting a loan from her brother-in-law. "'No, I don't want to borrow any more money,' his father said as they were passing the stable. "'There's nothing quite so hard as being in debt. It would be better to sell the cabin.' If it were not for the boy, I shouldn't mind selling it, his mother demurred. But what will become of him if he returns some day, wretched and poor, 
as he's likely to be, uh, and we're not here. You're right about that, the father agreed. But we shall have to ask the folks who take the place to receive him kindly and to let him know that he's welcome back to us. We shan't say a harsh word to him, no matter what he may be, shall we, mother? No, indeed, if I only had him again so that I could be certain he's not starving and freezing on the highways, I'd ask nothing more. Then his father and mother went in, and the boy heard no more of their conversation. He was happy and deeply moved when he knew that they loved him so dearly, although they believed he'd gone astray. He longed to rush into their arms. But perhaps it would be an even greater sorrow were they to see me as I am now. While he stood there, hesitating, a cart drove up to the gate. The boy smothered a cry of surprise, for who should step from the cart and go into the house-yard but Osa, the goose-girl, and her father? They walked hand in hand toward the cabin. When they were about halfway there, Osa stopped her father and said, "'Now remember, father, you're not to mention the wooden shoe, or the geese, or the little brownie who was so like Nils Holgersen that if it was not himself, it must have had some connection with him.' "'Certainly not,' said John Esserson. "'I shall only say that their son has been of great help to you on several occasions when you were trying to find me, and that therefore we have come to ask if we can't do them a service in return, since I am a rich man now and have more than I need, thanks to the mine I discovered up in Lapland. "'I know, father, that you can say the right thing in the right way,' Osa commended. "'It is only that one particular thing that I don't wish you to mention.' They went into the cabin, and the boy would have liked to hear what they talked about in there, but he dared not venture near the house. It was not long before they came out again, and his father and mother accompanied them as far as the gate. His parents were strangely happy. They appeared to have gained a new hold on life. When the visitors were gone, the father and mother lingered at the gate, gazing after them. "'I don't feel unhappy any longer since I've heard so much that is good of our nils,' said his mother." Perhaps he got more praise than he really deserved, put in his father thoughtfully. Wasn't it enough for you that they came here specially to say they wanted to help us because our Nils had served them in many ways? I think, father, that you should have accepted their offer. No, mother, I don't wish to accept money from anyone, either as a gift or a loan. In the first place, I want to free myself from all debt. Then we will work our way up again. <laughs> We're not so very old, are we, mother? The father laughed heartily as he said this. "'I believe you think it will be fun to sell this place, upon which we've expended such a lot of time and hard work,' protested the mother. "'Oh, you know why I'm laughing,' the father retorted. "'It was the thought of the boys having gone to the bad that weighed me down until I had no strength or courage left in me. Now that I know he still lives and has turned out well, you'll see that Holger Nilsson has some grit left.' The mother went in alone, and the boy made haste to hide in a corner, for his father walked into the stable. He went over to the horse and examined its hoof, as usual, to try to discover what was wrong with it. "'What's this?' he cried, discovering some letters scratched on the hoof. "'Remove the sharp piece of iron from the foot,' he read, and glanced around inquiringly. However, he ran his fingers along the underside of the hoof and looked at it carefully. "'I verily believe there is something sharp there,' he said." While his father was busy with the horse and the boy sat huddled in a corner, it happened that other callers came to the farm. The fact was that when Morton Goosey Gander found himself so near his old home, he simply could not resist the temptation of showing his wife and children to his old companions on the farm. So he took Dunfin and the goslings along and made for home. There was not a soul in the barnyard when the Goosey Gander came along. He alighted, confidently walked all around the place, and showed Dunfin how luxuriously he had lived when he was a tame goose. When they had viewed the entire farm, he noticed that the door of the cowshed was open. "'Look in here a moment,' he said. "'Then you will see how I lived in former days. It was very different from camping in swamps and morasses as we do now.' The goosey gander stood in the doorway and looked into the cowshed. "'There's not a soul in here,' he said. Come along, Dunfin, and you shall see the goose pen. Don't be afraid, there's no danger. Forthwith, the goosey gander, Dunfin, and all six goslings waddled into the goose pen to have a look at the elegance and comfort in which the big white gander had lived before he joined the wild geese. This is the way it used to be, 
Here was my place, and over there was the trough, which was always filled with oats and water, explained the goosey gander. Wait, there's some fodder in it now. With that, he rushed to the trough and began to gobble up the oats. But Dunfin was nervous. Let's go out again, she said. Only two more grains, insisted the goosey gander. The next second, he let out a shriek and ran for the door, but it was too late. The door slammed. The mistress stood without and bolted it. They were locked in. The father had removed a sharp piece of iron from the horse's hoof and stood contentedly stroking the animal when the mother came running into the stable. Come, father, and see the capture I've made. No, wait a minute, said the father. Look here first. I've discovered what ailed the horse. I believe our luck has turned, said the mother. Only fancy, the big white goosey gander that disappeared last spring must have gone off with the wild geese. He's come back to us in company with seven wild geese. They walked straight into the goose pen, and I've shut them all in. That's extraordinary, remarked the father. But best of all is that we don't have to think any more that our boy stole the goosey gander when he went away. You're right, father, she said. But I'm afraid we'll have to kill him tonight. In two days is Morton Goose Day, and we must make haste if we expect to get them to market in time. In Sweden, the 10th of November is called Morton Goose Day, and corresponds to the American Thanksgiving Day. I think it would be outrageous to butcher the goosey gander now that he's returned to us with such a large family, protested Holger Nilsson. If times were easier, we'd let him live, but since we're going to move from here, we can't keep geese. Come along now, help me carry them into the kitchen, urged the mother. They went out together, and in a few moments the boy saw his father coming along with Morton goosey gander and Dunfin, one under each arm. He and his wife went into the cabin. The goosey gander cried. Thumby Tot, come and help me, as he always did when in peril, although he was not aware that the boy was at hand. Nils Holgerson heard him, yet he lingered at the door of the cowshed. He did not hesitate because he knew that it would be well for him if the goosey gander were beheaded. At that moment he did not even remember this, but because he shrank from being seen by his parents. They've had a hard enough time of it already, he thought. Must I bring them a new sorrow? But when the door closed on the goosey gander, the boy was aroused. He dashed across the house yard, sprang up on the boardwalk leading to the entrance door, and ran into the hallway, where he kicked off his wooden shoes in the old accustomed way and walked toward the door. All the while it went so much against the grain to appear before his father and mother that he could not raise his hand to knock. Oh, but this concerns the life of the goosey gander, he said to himself, he who has been my best friend ever since I last stood here. In a twinkling, the boy remembered all that he and the goosey gander had suffered on ice-bound lakes and stormy seas and among wild beasts of prey. His heart swelled with gratitude. He conquered himself and knocked on the door. "'Is there someone who wishes to come in?' asked the father, opening the door. "'Mother, you shan't touch the goosey gander!' cried the boy. Instantly, both the goosey gander and Dunfin, who lay on a bench with their feet tied, gave a cry of joy so that he was sure they were alive. Someone else gave a cry of joy. His mother. My, but have you grown tall and handsome, she exclaimed. The boy had not entered the cabin, but was standing on the doorstep like one who is not quite certain how he will be received. The Lord be praised that I have you back again, said his mother laughing and crying come in my boy come in welcome added his father and not another word could he utter but the boy still lingered at the threshold he could not comprehend why they were so glad to see him such as he was then his mother came and put her arms around him and drew him into the room and he knew that he was all right mother and father he cried i'm a big boy i am a human being again Chapter 43 The Parting with the Wild Geese Wednesday, November 9th The boy arose before dawn and wandered down to the coast. He was standing alone on the strand east of Smig Fishing Hamlet before sunrise. He'd already been in the pen with Morton Goosey Gander to try to rouse him, but the big white gander had no desire to leave home. He did not say a word, but only stuck his bill under his wing and went to sleep again. To all appearances, the weather promised to be almost as perfect as it had been that spring day when the wild geese came to Skane. 
there was hardly a ripple on the water. The air was still, and the boy thought of the good passage the geese would have. He himself was as yet in a kind of a daze, sometimes thinking he was an elf, sometimes a human being. When he saw a stone hedge alongside the road, he was afraid to go farther until he'd made sure that no wild animal or vulture lurked behind it. Very soon he laughed to himself and rejoiced because he was big and strong and did not have to be afraid of anything. When he reached the coast, he stationed himself, big as he was, at the very edge of the strand, so that the wild geese could see him. It was a busy day for the birds of passage. Bird calls sounded on the air continuously. The boy smiled as he thought that no one but himself understood what the words were saying to one another. Presently, wild geese came flying, one big flock following another. Just so it's not my geese that are going away without bidding me farewell, he thought. He wanted so much to tell them how everything had turned out and to show them that he was no longer an elf but a human being. There came a flock that flew faster and cackled louder than the others, and something told him this must be the flock. But now he was not quite so sure about it as he would have been the day before. The flock slackened its flight and circled up and down along the coast. The boy knew it was the right one, but he could not understand why the geese did not come straight down to him. They could not avoid seeing him where he stood. He tried to give a call that would bring them down to him, but only think, his tongue would not obey him. He could not make the right sound. He heard Akka's calls, but did not understand what she said. What can this mean? Have the wild geese changed their language? He wondered. He waved his cap to them and ran along the shore, calling, Here I am. Where are you? But this seemed only to frighten the geese. They rose and flew farther out to sea. At last he understood. They did not know that he was human, had not recognised him. He could not call to them because human beings cannot speak the language of birds. He could not speak their language and nor could he understand it. Although the boy was very glad to be released from the enchantment, still he thought it hard that because of this he should be parted from his old comrades. He sat down on the sands and buried his face in his hands. What was the use of his gazing after them any more? Presently he heard the rustle of wings. Old Mother Acker had found it hard to fly away from Thumbietot and turned back. And now that the boy sat quite still, she ventured to fly nearer to him. Suddenly, something must have told her who he was, for she lit close behind him. Nils gave a cry of joy and took old Akka in his arms. The other wild geese crowded round him and stroked him with their bills. They cackled and chattered and wished him all kinds of good luck, and he, too, talked to them and thanked them for the wonderful journey which he had been privileged to make in their company. All at once, the wild geese became strangely quiet and withdrew from him, as if to say, Alas, he is a man. He does not understand us. We do not understand him. Then the boy rose and went over to Akka. He stroked her and patted her. He did the same to Ixi and Kaxi, Kom and Nelia, Visi and Kusi, the old birds who had been his companions from the very start. After that, he walked farther up the strand. He knew perfectly well that the sorrows of the birds do not last long and he wanted to part with them while they were still sad at losing him. As he crossed the shore meadows, he turned and watched the many flocks of birds that were flying over the sea. All were shrieking their coaxing calls. Only one goose flock flew silently on as long as he could follow it with his eyes, and the wedge was perfect, the speed good, and the wing strokes strong and certain. The boy felt such a yearning for his departing comrades that he almost wished he were Thumbietot again and could travel over land and sea with a flock of wild geese.